to the extent that you care about your kids or your wife and maybe your mom, there's no better formula. You don't need any fucking money. I don't know any game in town that you don't need, other than being a hooker. You don't need any money and you need no product knowledge. And even though some of you still don't believe that you don't need any product knowledge, the webinars that you're having access to starting, I think, tomorrow, you're going to see they don't know LOI, they call it LOA. Josh Kim calls it after-tax profits when it's cash flow. Nobody knows what the fuck they're talking about, but they're still rich. If you put the same effort in getting here into QLA, everybody in this room would have already done deals. No except. So why is that, Dan? Since I seem to have all the answers. Why is that, Dan? Other than for 27 and a half years, it's been pretty much the same. Other than in the 90s and the early 2000s when we uh, apparently had a different kind of man, testosterone levels, et cetera, et cetera, which is all true. Some would tell the Dan Locks and the Bruce Whipples of this world would say, because we give you too much material and it's a crutch. Because the guys in the 90s and the early 2000s got fuck all. Nothing. And when Dan Locke, uh, just a couple years ago, and uh, Bruce the Whipple a few years ago, came back to the seminar, they both said the same thing, almost instantaneously. Of course, this is pre-corona, so we're talking, having drinks, etc. You know. And they said, Dan, the only thing you fucking don't do is do a deal for them. Because we didn't have webinars. We didn't have templates. We didn't have fuck all. Yet now it takes the kids longer. And as you know, uh, middle of last year or thereabouts, I did away with the mentor program because after doing, studying the data and the info and all the bullshit, although my gut, my instincts told me so, is that, um, that uh, having a mentor program for 12 months, 9 months, 6 months, 3 months, 1 month, any was a crutch. Not dissimilar to some of the kids that asked me to be their chairman, because that's a crutch. We'll talk about it in some detail tomorrow, but everything I predicted in March has come true in spades. Every fucking thing. I said we were going to have a second wave. I said it was going to be war. I said we were going to lock the fucking country down, and where are we now? The fucking country is locked down, isn't it? But you didn't listen. You didn't listen to me, even though you paid ostensibly a lot of money. I don't think it's, it's chump change. Any more than you listen to your parents. In fact, you listen to your parents more. That's why you're fucked up. And I'm here to tell you, kids, it's going to get a lot fucking worse. You, have, you would not have spent the money to come to this fucking hardcore if you knew what I knew. You wouldn't have spent the money. Some of you are trapped here because you can't get home. Again, Winston... If you knew what I knew, you wouldn't be here. You'd be asking for a motherfucking refund. I told you in March. I told the world in March, but nobody listened, did they? I told you we were going to have negative price for oil, didn't I? You ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to get a lot worse. And for those of you that implement what you've already been taught, you're going to be benefit geometrically. You're going to benefit geometrically. But I've been saying for six, seven months, this is our time, this is our time. I'm so fucking tired of saying it, you know, until I'm blue in the face. But what has happened, I said it's easier. In, in, in the last four or five seminars, the guys that have watched the webinars have heard all the, the current kids that are doing deals in the trenches right now, in Corona. They've all said, God, it's like uh, Gerard says, it's e I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easy. And uh, Thomas says, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easy. And they all say the same thing. And so what have you... You in this room and the fucking meatheads on YouTube done, you've taken your foot off the accelerator instead of pressing it down through the fucking floorboard. Well, it's easier. Well, I don't have to work as hard because you don't want to work hard anyway. All your you're lazy cunts anyway. And that's exactly what's happened now. Everybody's taking their foot off the accelerator and time's just passing by. You're just go going down the runway. And at the end of the runway, you finally run out of tarmac, don't you? You're just coasting down the runway and then pretty soon it's the end. Now, I've almost fallen off this fucking thing at least 10 times since we got it put in. The first, I, I was looking at some old videos preparing for this. The old one was flat on the ground. It wasn't raised up. That was safer for me. But I've almost fallen off at least 10 times. But somehow, I, I back back away and I, I don't fall. We're going to go through some 40-some cases this week. 40-some cases. Uh, depending on um, your, not your smarts or any of that stuff, but just, you know... Um, the team leader that we're going to uh, put in charge uh, uh, of each team. Uh, and there's four or five guys that aren't here because uh, they were in London. Uh, we pretty much told everybody to quarantine up here. But anyway, they're gone. Or they're stuck in London with their thumbs up their ass because they can't leave the country and they can't come up here. It's not, it's, it's not dissimilar to the instructions I gave. Just, just as I gave the kids that came in March and the thing got closed down and 
I said, please don't. I'm going to give you the thumb and drive, even though I know I shouldn't do it uh, because you're going to get started. And of course, everybody got started and did it all fucked up. But now they're taking the foot off the accelerator because it's easier. That means you, 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 you've uh, formed a gap in the timeline continuum where the meatheads can get through. And I get emails almost every day from kids that have done deals that didn't come to the seminar. Remember, it's still 99.9% .9 of all the kids that have uh, benefited from QLA I've never met. It's no different. It hasn't changed in over 20 years. But now, instead of putting your foot down on the accelerator, almost everybody's taking their foot off, with a few exceptions. And we're going to talk about the eight or nine exceptions tomorrow. Uh, they're all guys. We've got women, but the, the ones I'm going to talk about are all guys, because you're all guys, that have taken this opportunity to uh, put the pedal to the metal, I think is the, how they uh, phrase it. And we've got some, I mean, guys doing seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 deals in, in Corona, in Corona. And uh, two of the 11 we're gonna talk about, only two, I'm chairman of two of them. Nine of them I have nothing to do with. They did it on, on their own. They just took the, the material, same materials that you have received already. But it's, it's easier. The, you kids aren't making it easier, but that's your decision. And we all know why you, right? We all know. It's hard to say I've got no balls. It's hard to say I've got no self-esteem. Two or three of you pretend to have self-esteem and you don't. You don't. But in your circle that you're in, you get away with it. In this room, you wouldn't live past 15, 16 years old where I come from. You know, it's like uh, the New York Yankees at their peak playing a uh, high school baseball team. Uh, an analogy here, Manchester United at its peak playing a uh, girls uh, uh, soccer team from uh, Bristol. That's the difference. And again, the guys that take the best notes uh, uh, heretofore uh, have, have done the best. Because remember, I'm not here for you to call me. For the, uh, Two or three of you have tried to call me and I, I just kind of giggle and I don't, I don't return the call or Kim doesn't even tell me. Because that's not the deal. There's no reason that um, anybody that's com is coming through the, uh, this hardcore, and this is our first hardcore, Corona hardcore, and, um, the, um, and the lockdowns are going to get worse around the world. Four or five countries have already, not, not, not that the, the UK is a benchmark, four or five countries have already, you know, shut, shut off the UK. And it's going to get worse. And as I said in March, now, then they were, they were hoping for a vaccine in two, three months, remember? No, they said they'd have one. Then they're going, they're hoping for one. Now they're hoping to have one and we can only go, uh, put vaccine out for one or two million uh, people at a time. There's 70 or 80 million people that need it in this country alone. You know how long at one or two million at a time it's going to take? 35 to 40 months in the UK. And it's much worse than the US. I told you at all your seminars and you, you kind of scoffed and laughed. It's going to get down to where they pay you to take the businesses off their hands. Only one or two of you looked at me like you believe me. We've already had some people do it in the last four or five months where they pay you to take the health company or health uh, assisted living, whatever, off of you. But if you don't ask, you don't get. In the infamous words of Bruce the Whip, and unfortunately, you know, uh, not that uh, I shed any tears when our daughter told me uh, she was going to be uh, alone with her dog for Christmas. Shit happens, honey. Shit happens. She's a big girl. She's 34 years old. She ought to be able to. And when uh, she just moved into her new apartment today in Chicago, and the movers hadn't got there yet, but she did a film. You know, you take your camera and you take a film of the whole, fuck, big apartment, big, fuck. I and mean, when is she getting all that fucking money? And she shows her dog asleep and she goes through the kitchen. And as she pans, you see a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of wine, and then a half glass full of white wine next to a bag of chips. And uh, the, so I assume that's her first dinner, which sounds like something I would do. Uh, guys, it's, it's hard for me to express. And, and I said this in the opening of the final day of the last seminar a few weeks ago, because I got emotional. I was so exasperated. Uh, for those of you that watched it, you will kill yourself for not taking advantage of this, literally. And I said it much more emotionally the uh, last day of the last seminar. What are you going to tell your grandkids when they say, hey, grandpa, what the fuck did you do during the greatest dislocation of wealth in the history of the 14 billion year old planet. I just sat with my thumb up my ass and did not a goddamn thing. And some of you in this room have started wrongfully. We'll get more into it, but I mean, this model does not pay retainers. This model does not pay income to board members. This model is based on one moving part, a motivated seller and free founders equity. That's it. There is no, there is no also ran. That's it. And the banks, uh, uh, we have kids that have gone, not in this group, we have uh, uh, banks that are asking for um, cross collateralization on all the assets the person has. Their existing business of 25 years, plus 25% down equity. This is SBA. The federal motherfucking statute says no down. It's 100% government guaranteed. How many times did I say that during the fucking seminar? And yet somebody, not in this room, luckily, or I'd pound the fuck out of you the whole week. Somebody, more than one, are entertaining this bullshit 
from the fucking bankers. So I had this, this moron call the SBA, call the cocksuckers and see what they say. And they read from the statute, well, you're correct, there is no, I mean, blah, 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 blah. but it's up to the bank. If they don't feel comfortable, they can ask you for any fucking thing they want. So obviously the you didn't sell the motherfucker, did you? And they're on Reddit saying QLA doesn't work. I can't give you the gumption, the temerity, the grit, the balls to fight for yourself. That's not my job. That's not what the motherfucking model's about. Everybody in this room is pretty much in the same boat. Now, a rising tide should make all boats go higher, right? Well, I, I mean, be the uh, geometrically uh, uh, only example of showing how it doesn't because if you don't believe well you shouldn't be here but if you don't believe but you got to believe not just in the model because you know that works you got to believe in yourself you got to believe in yourself and if you don't believe in yourself <sighs> you spend Christmas with an old man screaming and yelling at you it's pretty simple I told you last night that um, one of the youths out there fighting in the trenches uh, was getting jerked around by the SBA didn't I say that well this morning I and I don't take emergency email but I made a point with this particular kid that I was going to intervene to make sure the SBA didn't fuck him over. So we have prevailed, but you got to go to the head of the SBA. Now that's not right. Because you, my meathead, see, there's not a, uh, there's not a, a dick liquor in this room that would go to the head of the SBA. Contrary to what you say, there's not a, a guy in this room, to the extent that you have boards, none of your boards would recommend you go to the head of the SBA. But that's how we got it done. All those other, all but one of the other uh, constraints were dropped for the kid. And the deal is closing Friday. Let's, let's, uh, before I trip and fall, let's just spend a moment asking ourselves legitimately, no bullshit, why you wouldn't go to the head of the SBA. And don't tell me you would. Because two or three of you, I know how you, you well, I would. <laughs> You wouldn't be here. Why wouldn't you go to the head of the SBA to carry your banner, to run towards the gunfire? Why wouldn't you call them? Why? No ball. There's a slide. Uh, I forget the, uh, the exact words, but it's, it's tough when you don't even have enough balls to admit to yourself you have no ball. Or something like that, if you recall. This. And that may not, matter. for those of you that went to the seminar earlier in this year, I might not have had that, that slide. But one of you, in your infinite wisdom, during a, an epiphany, during the seminar said, you know, you don't, we don't have enough balls to admit to ourselves. And I had an epiphany myself, so I got to remember that and, and write it down. Because, again, I don't understand why the webinars work. I think they're a waste of fucking time, but they work. Because I didn't think apps would work. And at Oxford six years ago, I still get emails uh, from the kids, the meatheads. You said that apps were bullshit, and I did. I don't have to go back and re-listen to the tape. I, I just don't understand. I still don't understand why apps you know, work. I don't. And I was surprised. Surprised isn't even the word when PayPal uh, legitimized uh, crypto fuck Bitcoin. I mean, I still believe with all my heart that in 10, 20 years from now or whenever it is, 10, 20 months from now, that uh, they'll, all these people that have legitimatized its platform will be sorry. Because I, I just don't understand why anybody would consider that. I also didn't believe that uh, as stupid as the governments are, I didn't know 21% of every dollar that we printed this year was going to, it's, oh, the money we printed this year is going to be 21% of all the money we've ever printed in the history of the United States. And that's one of the reasons uh, Buck has got legitimacy because they're uh, debasing our currency. I don't know how much more it can be debased, not worth shit. Why do they have to, do I have to intercede? Save the, and that's where we are. And that's where we are. It's a she. She's as happy as Larry. She's having a, like her permanent multiple orgasm. It's just, it's just, it's a sad fucking, con it just is. I, it, is, even after almost 28 years, I still can't believe it. I don't believe it. And when I talk to other people, and, I, and some of you have heard this story before, the last time I saw Donald Trump was in, uh, I think it was uh, 1993, uh, at the grand opening of the MGL Hotel in Las Vegas. The elevator to the executive suites parted, and I was with Danny and Derek, and he steps in, and I step in, and he said something to the effect, I hear you're trying to teach uh, stupid people how to be rich, or... Words to that effect. Those guys don't understand why you pay me money. Fucking, I, sometimes I don't understand it either. They don't understand why you pay me money to do the obvious. And that's the last time I talked to the now president. Warren Buffett doesn't understand. None of them understand. And I've been doing it 28 years and I don't understand. It's like paying uh, uh, me to teach you how to wipe your ass. But we are where we are. And the, uh, later on, <sighs> I have um, my, my, uh, what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to split up into groups later on. Uh, I'm going to appoint a captain. Uh, oh, I got my prayer list. Oh, you're not on my prayer list, so don't worry about it. Um, what's the other thing I'm going to do today? Oh, it's up to me to do, right? Right, cat? And 
almost nobody gets it. This is where we are. I said it in March. I said it in every fucking seminar, and every almost every single thing I said has come to fruition. Exactly like I said it. Exactly like I said it. What's the first rule of crisis management? Lie to the people because they can't take the truth. Did the Brits tell the people here on this great island they were losing the war from 1939 to 1942, beginning in 43? No! Churchill just went around with a cigar in his mouth, half drunk, going like this. Yet we have people on the news picking apart the governments because they weren't as accurate about this. It's because they're just guessing. That's why they're not accurate. We're at war, and it's only going to get worse. And this is the best fucking system. I mean, God couldn't have made a better system. We're taking advantage legally, morally, ethically, and again, ethics and morals swing in the wind, where there's a rule of law, how to make a ton of money. I said in the closing um, remarks of the seminar just a few weeks ago that uh, the webinars that the kids saw, 80% <clears throat> of what they heard was only true because 20% wasn't true because the ones that are even closing deals don't know what they're doing. And they're not doing it 100% to... Uh, to the rules of QLA. And I said, I pounded on my chest, yeah, even you, you want rather, even though the ones, uh, a few of you think you're tough guys, you'd rather be liked than if. And if, you, if that's not the truth, and you've been so un ineffective so far, and you pretend to, to say that you don't care about being liked, well, then you're a fucking retard. You're brain dead. For the three or four of you in this room that think that you don't want to be liked, as opposed to being effective, then something's not right with you. Because if you've lived your life not caring about being liked, you should have a lot of fucking money now. So you are retarded. This system is not about the why, how. And I'm not going to entertain any questions this week about why. I'm only going to entertain questions about how. For example, how do you relate to the strengths of the guy last night as opposed to you? Well, there's not a reasonable facsimile in this room to that fucking old fart. Uh, but I, comments on yourself. How do you relate? How do the, his strengths relate to your weaknesses? Yeah, in the back in the corner. Um, I think it's probably obvious, but he doesn't have anyone that he relies on, or he doesn't wait for someone to save him. He doesn't have uh, a Dan Pena or anyone else that an issue comes to his desk, he sorts it out himself, um, and the buck stops with him. He doesn't wait for anyone else to help him ever. Um, and that's why he died the richest man in the world. Correct. And we're talking about Cornelius Vanderbilt, which is often left off the ruthless tyrants uh, of the planet. Another hand was up. Yes, in the back. He bet multiple times on himself and went all in. Just like you. So uh, remember, so these are, these are things that aren't you. I mean, you can start from A and go to Z. There are very, well, the, the, there are very few things. When I look at them, and I, I reviewed all these as Cat and EJ, because this is a new um, hardcore based towards Corona. And when I went through all the material again, and we added about 25 slides, because we only had about 20 slides, so now we got 40 slides for the whole, this whole seminar. And I went through <clears throat> all the webinars, took some out, added some, and I went through the, uh, these guys that we're gonna uh, hear the next few nights, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis my, own, my own self. And uh, with one or two exceptions in the personality, in the persona, I'm 100% they are. But they are. But as I told you in the seminar, being told by one of the ma magnets back in the 80s, Dan, if you were as tough as we were, you'd be the first trillionaire on the planet because they didn't deem me tough enough. And uh, meaning, uh, you know, I'm, uh, what, what I have, uh, in Carnegie's case, what I've, I've hired the Pinkertons and gunned people down. I don't know. It's not likely. But there's three or four exceptions, but those are the only exceptions. Hence, they say I'm not as tough as they are. And in that, in that regard, Using that as a benchmark, they're absolutely right. What else? Yes, sir. When I watched uh, especially Vanderbilt and saw at 16 he was fighting men and then at the same time like, buying a boat that turned into his big business. I, I compared it to myself at his age, realised I was n not even in the ballpark where his mindset was. And I, again, I've had this realisation over and over, but I compared to my uh, Yeah, and, and, uh, and these guys, and, and before this generation, you had duels, you know. Instead of talking shit on Facebook, you had a duel, uh, either with swords or with um, pistols. You, you guys wouldn't, not, nobody in this room would be here. You would have died in a fucking duel. You're lucky you didn't live 200 years ago. You'd be fucking dead. Or if you were in caveman days, which I wish I would have lived in, 
40,000 years ago, you would have been beaten to death. Your wife and your daughters taken away from you and then raped. When you look at these things through not your rose-colored glasses, well, how am I different than this guy? Or what does he do different than I do? And um, I don't have to give you a benchmark of 100 things. You know what they are. You know what they are. Yet, with your personality, you can still use QLA. 98% of all the high-performance people on the planet are, are, are introverts. Gates, Zuckerberg, Buffett. I've gone through all that. We're not going to repeat that. We're not going to beat, beat that dead horse. Um, they're, but they're introverts. Now, certain professionals, certain professions, I should say, have more extroverts than introverts. But even when they, they're extroverted, rarely do you find, uh, find an alpha male. For one reason, the last 40 or 50 years, the alpha male has been beaten out of uh, the male on the planet. It's, uh, it's not considered a, a positive trait uh, to be an alpha male. And that's why uh, Brian Rose says, I'm probably the last living you know, Neanderthal. And of course, I point out, because I've done research, Neanderthal had a brain 20% bigger than Homo sapiens. 20% bigger. So, uh, what else about uh, the traits that they have that you don't? Yes, in the back. He did not care, Vanderbilt. He did not care if anyone liked him. And to that point, he got even. And he got back, just like Trump, just like yourself. He used, he was flush with cash, he didn't have lenders or wasn't over leveraged, and he suffocated the competition. And so even though he might have been tricked once or twice, he always got even. And it was because he focused on the cash, and it's, and it's the difference between, I guess, a person like himself or myself or maybe some other people, yeah, we make a mistake, but he could make a mistake and then get back, whilst we might just get angry and sit in our fucking room. The... Um we're getting ready to post uh, a couple of uh, recent uh, court hearings where I prevailed against guys stealing my stuff and guys stealing the logo, etc. cetera. And uh, the, uh, the only thing right now is do we have to redact their name out? Because uh, it's not slander because it's the truth. Um, I just soon leave their name and I hope they sue me. And I'm telling everybody that I kicked their ass in court. And uh, we got a, f a favorable ruling in a country that, in my humble opinion, has no rule of law, which I was flat fucking flabbergasted. Fucking flabbergasted. Um, that and maybe, you know, and, and maybe things are changing. Speaking of changing, I, I have to make a public apology about a comment I made um, which was altogether untrue, unbeknownst to me. Uh, at the end of the last seminar, I was talking about the kid, 26 years old, that has a head this big and a body this big, and he's still alive. Or he was last time. He's now 30, and he's still alive, and he's talking and walking. He was a fucking vegetable. He couldn't roll. So I checked, unlike for um, our contact at St. Teresa uh, <clears throat> in the Philippines, and they said, oh, yeah, he had an operation, a special operation, um, and uh, his head is not as big as it was. <clears throat> but this is for inflammation. Um, and uh, he's going to a special needs school. And I read that, I thought I was... Reading, well, we spent, he can't, he's a vegetable. <clears throat> and he's talking and walking a little. So, and when I said that there's one guy, I was giving an example of somebody that shouldn't have been born. Should have rolled down, you all should have rolled down the, your mama's leg. And he's alive and well. And they call him, and if they call him this at St. Teresa's, the miracle kid. So there are miracles, and you still have hope, guys. Not much, and I don't think it's funny. There's a slide coming up. I'm not going to waste the few years I have left in coaching. 
with fucking bums. That's one of the reasons I did away for the uh, mentor program. The other reason was it wasn't as effective as I had thought it would be. It was effective. But the ones, and we're going to talk about the ones that have survived and prospered during corona and the ones that didn't. And there's some really blatant characteristics. Anything else about um, uh, Mr. Vanderbilt from last night? A few, um, last seminar, I, I made an announcement that uh, 12 weeks late, the airlines announced a uh, person died from corona on the tarmac. Three days ago, this was, now I'm, I must be the only one that sees this shit in the news. Three days ago, a new video of a United passenger receiving CPR. Then they thought it was probable COVID related. Now it was probable, it was COVID and he died while they were giving him CPR on the fucking plane. Now, 180 people on that motherfucking plane. 180. Now, what are we doing? Not we, I don't give a fuck, you know. What are they doing to trace and track? Isn't that what they call it? Probably nothing. All those people have got Corona Rona now. You don't know, and this is why it's going to last forever. There's a reason why Warren the Buffett and Dan Pena said airlines are through for fucking ever. How are they going to deal with it? Now some of the airlines are saying, well, we're going to make you take a test for $240. Well, nobody's going to take the fucking test. The average Pollyanna meathead has not thought this through at all. They don't want to think it through. We're done. We're toast. All those people trying to help that poor fucker that died. We had a doctor, uh, a doctor here last seminar. His wife's a doctor. When something happens and they ask for doctors, he makes his wife keep her hand down and they don't raise their hands. Not necessarily because of this, but because then if I'm a doctor and I help you and you die, then you sue me for malpractice. Unless you're a real goody two-shoes, why would you raise your hand? I told you about the person that, um, uh, in fact, a year ago, the last uh, um, hardcore, the guy collapsed foam coming out of his mouth and fell over on Brian Rose on his new suit during the corona. Three doctors in the room, one nurse, not the doctors, went to try to save him, and then a paramedic. And one of the doctors, Australian doctor, he went over and pushed the guy with his foot and said, make sure he didn't swallow his tongue and walked away. <laughs> That's where we are now. That's where we are. No good deed goes unpunished. How many have heard about this? It happened three days ago. Two. This is the hardcore corona number one. And the entire seminar is, dev is devoted towards taking advantage of the circumstances, social and economic, in a uh, legal, ethical way, the whole seminar. And what it basically is, is QLA on steroids. The guys and the gals that have uh, done a lot of deals, the, um, that's the housekeeping I had from the last, I'll go back over that. Um, said that. Okay. The things that were very, very noticeable between the guys who were able to do a lot of deals during Corona and the guys that didn't is because there's still an incompatible value system. In other words, your value systems still aren't compatible um, with uh, QLA emotionally. 
except for the guys that just went through the seminar. There's no reason everybody in this room shouldn't have done a deal. There's no reason. Uh, well, there is a reason, but there's no legitimate reason. I said that. Another, uh, this is housekeeping for me. It never comes up about climate change has ended other civilizations, i.e. the pharaohs. When climate change and it got very, very uh, cold and the Nile didn't spread out for them to be able to plant and uh, cyclically, the civilization died off. And there's four or five other civilizations that have died off because of climate change. Just like this one's going to die off. It took um, 1,100 years for the pharaohs to die off. Call it 1,000. Why do you think Adolf fucking Hitler got, I want the Third Reich to last 1,000 years? Where do you think he got that? You think he just, eh, like you pulled it out of his ass? He had some people that did some work to find out that no dynasty had lasted more than 1,000 years. And the closest was the pharaohs. And then there's you. Boy, doesn't humanity have something to be proud of? You. Axiomatic truth. If you can't embrace the possibility, the reality of total annihilation, you will fail. Ross Perot told me 40 years ago that success was on the razor's edge of failure. Most people don't want to experience that. Again, success is on the razor's edge of failure. And you got to do your work to overcome that, or you're going to fold, meaning fail. The people we're going to talk about this week, and we're only going to see two webinars. We're going to see a guy that just did a deal three weeks ago. Because most of you will have been through the seminar to see the other guys that have operated in Corona. Because the only ones that wouldn't have seen those webinars are the people that came in uh, February. Um, but instead of showing you 10, we're only going to show you one, the most recent one, a little guy from uh, Belgium. Uh, he's my new mouse, uh, like Peter uh, from Hungary. So far, here to four, everybody in this room has, uh, irrespective of all the reasons you've got, uh, you've uh, operated under denial is easier than confrontation. Because just like I, we call the SBA, we had to get confrontation. Otherwise, that fucking deal wouldn't be closing. We had to get aggressive. You had to be willing to walk away. And there's nobody in this room that has exhibited the walk away feeling. Nobody. Or maybe Sean Casey was right <clears throat> when he came to one of the first seminars in the 90s. QLA is a system to piss off people and make money at the same time. I didn't like it at the time because I was trying to sell the seminar and nobody was coming. But maybe Sean was right. Because the guys that we're going to talk show examples of that have done 17 deals on the high side and four deals on the low side during Corona have pissed some people off. I'm sure the gal that uh, was fighting it out with the SPA the last three or four days, uh, they can't wait to see the back of her, meaning she'd be gone. Remember Jason Nagy. The banks don't like him anymore in Australia because he's too fucking aggressive. I told Jason he's at the top of his game. Me. They called Sally, this is 10, 15 years ago, they called Sally Head and says, you know, we don't really need Mr. Pena at the meeting. You know, his time is too valuable. And they love to see you. They can't fucking wait to see your fucking sad, sorry asses. They can't, they can't wait. They jump for joy. 
you got, I told you, you got to make a decision. Do you, would you rather be liked or effective? You can't be both. The slide, uh, let's back up a second. When I was interviewed in 2014 by Brian Rose, he said, uh, well, who, uh, uh, to describe you, how would you describe yourself? And I said, I'm the cross between Freud, Patton, and Jack Welsh. And if he had drilled down further, I would have said that I'm more Patton than I am Freud, and I'm more Freud than I am Jack Welsh. Because Jack Welsh, although he invented uh, Rank and Yank, how to get rid of 40% of your employees without trying, that, that's my part of the book. His, his title is uh, Rank and Yank. Um, the, um, I'm more Patton than anything else. And as I told you, 1993 and again 1997 at the Harvard Club when I was giving a speech, one of the smart asses there uh, said, Mr. Pena, what would you attribute your success to, uh, vis-a-vis -vis brains or balls? And I snapped back 50-50 brains and balls that I was wrong, because now I know it's 90% balls and 10% brains. Now, that's easy for me to say because I have a very high IQ. But I, I, you don't need to have a high IQ. You don't have to have brains. All you got to do is follow the fucking steps. Get back where we were. Now, yeah, these are two charts of the guys that are in the streets, pistolaries, gunning it right now, shooting it out with the banks and financial institutions. These are Corona guys. I only, uh, even though there are gals, the pictures you're about to see are only guys. Healthcare Germany, Veterinary Clinics USA, Insurance Mexico, Property Scotland, Healthcare USA, <clears throat> Telecom and Healthcare uh, Belgium, Holland, uh, Healthcare South America, Healthcare Australia, IT Canada, Conglomerate South Africa, Healthcare USA, Tech USA, Healthcare USA, Healthcare USA, Healthcare Hungary, <clears throat> Property Austria, Property Germany, and Healthcare and IT Australia. And the, the number of deals are wor working from the bottom up, 6, 11, 17, 7, 5, 4, 11, 4, 7, working down, 8, 7, 2, 5, 5, 6, 3, 3, 9. During Corona Rona. And another one of your, okay, well, Dan, you must be chairman of all these, because I know how you pea brains think. On this sheet, I am chairman of three. And on this, I'm uh, chairman of none. So that's one of your excuses. I'm readdressing it after New Year because I'm going to be resigning from companies that I'm chairman of that haven't done anything or aren't moving fast enough. Most of you that have used me in the past use me as a crutch and don't do shit. Like that other slide said, I'm too fucking old to waste my time with fucking bums. And by God, I am. There should be one there. Ah, South America. Did I say South? I think I said South America. I normally say that he's from South Africa for some reason, but he's not. That pretty much covers the gamut, doesn't it? The next question you're going to say, well, I, uh, those guys must be all uh, rich. Right? I'm going through the excuses you use. 
On this list, uh, nobody. The closest is a property guy from Scotland. Closest. Marcus Bauer and uh, Anelli had money before Corona. So what's the next reason that they did it and you didn't? Not just you, but what's it? Okay, chairman, they've got money. What's the next excuse you use? It's got to be a reason, right? Yeah, and it's hanging between your legs. And it's hanging between your legs. Remember, Dan Locke, who I've known since he was a baby almost, and I've, uh, Bruce Whipple, who I've known since he looked like a baby, both say they're not the only ones, but they're the ones that you would know their names. Dan, the only thing you don't do is do the fucking deal for them. Success leaves clues. How many times have you heard me say that? Now, that's one of the recent guys, and I'm not saying that that's a key to success, but we have a lot of people that put tattoos on their body. I am tattoo-free. I will die tattoo-free. And at the last seminar, I showed what tattoos look like with age. Some of the young kids that had tats in the audience were stunned. Do you think they look crispy, clear like that all your life? No. Now, here's a guy that doesn't want to be liked. It's obvious. The New York Post wrote an article that I'm a scumbag. Stern said Tuesday, scoffing at the piece, I swear to you, I don't spend a, mi a minute worrying about it. I couldn't give a fuck what people think about me, he continued. You don't like me? You don't want to work for me? Go fuck yourself. I don't care. I, at the end of the uh, night, sleep fine. Howard Stern, one of the highest paid guys on the planet. Now, he articulates it, but almost all the other guys think this way, but now they're trying to build a legacy. Elon wants you to like him because he wants you to buy an electric car or go on his rocket ship or whatever. Everybody's got a, some sort of reason. The people on the two lists, the two slides that I showed you, most of the guys got it done just the sheer force of will. And when you see the one webinar of the guy that just the more re most recent uh, corona success story, you'll see that when he talks to you about uh, throwing up every time before he got on the phone, he was so scared, crying. How big do you want to be? How big do you want to dream? How, but more importantly, how hard are you willing to work? All those guys on that list are workaholics. Marcus Bauer, which we're going to look at a uh, video from when he addressed the last hardcore. Uh, oh, another uh, question is, uh, how many of them attended hardcore? Yeah, we didn't do that. That was the other one I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All on that page attended hardcore. One, two, three, four, five on that page attended hardcore. Jan the last hardcore we had, we had. Um, Twenty-seven deals come out of the hardcore. And it's not because you learn anything new. 
I think it's shame. You're not going to get any special sauce. So how hard do you want to work? Now, some of the people on that list that I just showed you, one of which is buying an $8 million house in Toronto right now as we speak. Eight million, which isn't no big fucking deal to me. Another one is buying, uh, not on that list, but we have another wannabe that's buying a castle not too far from here. And that, those were certainly not on their uh, wish list before. And all of them, I think the, the, the least hardworking of those lists of the people that have done corona is about 80 or 85 hours a week, the least hardworking. The most hardworking on that list is 120 hours a week. Almost sent himself to the hospital from working so hard. How hard did I want to work? Well, it's not a coincidence, as I said in the last seminar, that Skibo Castle, my virtual mentor, Andrew Carnegie, I have two, I have Winston Churchill and himself, um, and um, Guthrie Castle look similar. Having spent my 75th birthday at Skibo, actually this place is nicer, but uh, I'm biased. The, um, but this was my goal long, long before I ever decided to coach and mentor, a long time ago. And even though it only took me 15 months to get Guthrie Castle from the time I set it up as a goal, I certainly worked hard enough, I certainly, but I, didn't, I obviously didn't dream big enough because I fulfilled it. Most of my goals are already history, and we've had to revamp our goals. Sally's in mind. What's also been proven by that list of people that did deals during Corona, they can't serve two masters. In other words, a, I, I'm not going through the list of who has no wife now. But we did break the record of husband-wife com combos. Uh, the, uh, Graham and Leanne um, Carlene from Scotland have uh, stayed together and been successful. They're um, the first ones in about 25 years, a couple stayed together, and successful. We've got uh, several couples that stayed together for no good reason, but I mean, and successful. Uh, so they, they, they broke the uh, divorce stigma. And they pivoted, I think, three times, three. Now they have a TV show on Sky Television. For property, I was the first person on their show. Played, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Um, but all they do is work. But you can't serve two masters, meaning you can't, the same as you can't fight two different fronts in war. And we're at war. And another thing that they all had in common, they said it different ways, we follow the word of Dan like it was the word of God. We followed the word of Dan like if it was the word of God. Yes, sir. On this topic of um, partners or splitting up from partners, um, I don't know if anyone's asked, but uh, what are some of the qualities? Let's just say... Are we talking about a, a, a partner you're fucking or a, a business partner? <laughs> Uh, let's say both. Uh, oh, well, that's that. Well, uh, I can tell you right now, the odds are ninety percent against you. What would the qualities be? Well, I mean, you know, in a perfect world, and the world's not perfect, right? And uh, if all the T's were crossed and all the I's were dotted, and uh, puppies didn't piss on the carpet in your house when you're potty training them, uh, you want them smarter than you, which is no big fucking shakes in this group, believe me. Um, the, but not, not intellectually smarter, street smarter. And when you normally get a female that's street smarter, that means she's fucked four or five hundred people. And you don't want that. 
But the best piece of ass I ever had was somebody that fucked 5,000 people. That's just, the, you know, that's just the way it is. So you want them street smart. You want them presentable. Um, in my case, I want a blonde, buxom adornment to wear on my arm. A big set of tits with blonde hair to walk into rooms with. Shorter than me, which isn't so hard for me. In some of your cases, it'd be hard. I'm not like some of the guys that the, uh, can, although I've gone out with a couple of girls that were taller than me, played basketball, but anyway, uh, tall, 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 they should be shorter than you. And they should know how to keep their fucking mouth shut. Remember, you praise in person, you criticize in private. And too many of your partners, some of you even mentioned it in your uh, paperwork, uh, your partners uh, can't keep their fucking mouth shut. Meaning they don't, they're not supportive. And all that, all that wears on you. Yeah, but when you buy 40, that's just the point. When you buy big numbers, you buy big multiples. Those 40, no, 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 no. We those, 40 one at a time. They, those 40 parks that they bought, I haven't looked at the deal. I guarantee you that's three or four guys that sold them eight, ten parks each. No, it's one company, one, like, big mobile home company that owns 40 parks. It's called S Mobile Home Company. Oh, well, I've been in business since I was in the business, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of big guys. There's a lot of competition in the business. You know, it's not just, uh, we're buying smaller parks that private equity and the big guys don't look at. Correct. 50 pads, whatever. So we want to buy 100 parks. We can buy a million dollar park and turn it into two, three million very quickly. Okay, well, uh, and what do you classify as a million dollar park? Well, based on income. No, no, you mean a million dollars revenue. Correct. No, no, no. A uh, million dollars selling price, I guess. That's what I mean. Okay, so the three or four hundred thousand uh, dollars, well, at uh, your multiples, uh, two hundred thousand dollars. No, one hundred thousand dollars. That would be a 10 cap. But even at a 10 cap, right? Let's say I'm buying it at a 10 cap, a million dollars, it makes a hundred thousand dollars. We buy a hundred parks for a hundred million. Okay, we've turned the parks around. They're worth 300 million now. We can compress the cap rate to a five cap. I mean, we're doubling, tripling, and multiple. Okay, fine. fine. You try and do that, and you let me know when, when you actually. I'm just doing what everybody else has done. Well, well, fine. You do it. Okay, I'm asking and you. No, How I'm can I buy you wrong. 100 I'm parks? telling you categorically 100% wrong. I've been doing this 50 fucking years, and I was 10 years one of the leading mobile home park purchasers in the country. Sam Zell beat me out of the business, basically, because I got tired of uh, slamming my bald head against his bald head. Yeah, but when you have a Sam Zell buying parks at a four cap, at a 20 time multiple, buying them, sometimes they're buying at a fucking one cap. It's retarded, like, you know, and obviously we're buying the smaller parks, mama pop doesn't know what the fuck is going on, but we want to set it up to be that, you know, but... We're not the only players in town. It's just well, I know, well oh, now. Well, uh, well I, I told you when uh, I, I I mentioned mobile home park. Although I've got a half a dozen or ten guys that are doing it, they're not doing it your way. Uh, yeah, but how many are, are they trying to buy? Like, what's their goal? Are they trying uh, to just buy a couple? Probably the smallest guy is thirty pads. The largest is um, eighty, ninety, a hundred. That's it. Yeah, that's small. Oh, I know it is. <laughs> I didn't say it was big. We want to do volume. I want to buy 100 fucking far. Well, then you go do volume and you let me know when you're done. I already know the results, but just surprise me. I will. I will. Surprise me. I will. We had a guy here two seminars ago that said he was going to, it wasn't you that was going to do a deal in 45 days. No, we had another big mouth. Yeah, yeah. The guy that sat over there. You're not the guy that fell over the table and broke no, everything. And, oh, no. Another guy. It looks like you. You all look alike to me. He said over there, he was going to do it in 45 days. I had on my calendar, 41, 42, 43, 45, 66, 60, 89, 93. Talk cheap. Yeah, I mean, we all want to do, I wanted to do a fucking deal like yesterday, you know. Correct. But deals fall through, did. shit happens, blah, 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 you know. Life whatever. happens. Exactly. But the point is, every time one of these deals doesn't happen for one of you guys, you, unbeknownst to you, your subconscious lets loose a little. Let's loose. You're shaking your head, no, but yes. Let loose of your goal. 
let's lose of your goal. I and actually and I believe tough, in myself. It's tough, you know? it's tough to stay focused longest. It's not easy. But now, my bigger fear is contrary to what Jay Powell says in the Federal Reserve, that even though we're not thinking about ever thinking about ever thinking about raising interest rates, inflation is going to raise its ugly head. Inflation. And we're going to go from less than 2% to 3 4% to 5%. Because you can't print all this fucking money without it causing inflation. 21% of all the money since the beginning of time was printed this year. I mean, if the average little guy that owns a fucking coffee shop or a fucking uh, Starbucks, they would shit. It's got to have, it's got and it's just a matter of, and the new president, the, the 600 bucks that the, the president is handing out is insulting. Uh, the, um, and Mike, the, they're just passing other stimulus. Wait a minute, my $1,200 check is up there in a, uh, 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 I didn't cash it, but they sent me, and now they're saying they should give them $2,000 or $3,000. But I, I'm so distant, uh, how $600 can help a family of four? I, I don't know. But it can. I don't believe it can. But 2000 is better than 600 for sure. But I know the kids that are getting uh, these checks that are going and uh, buying options and buying derivatives, and they're not, it's not going to anybody that, that uh, really needs it. And rich people, I'm the only rich guy I know, and I know a lot of rich guys, that, is not, that didn't collect any government money, or I, I got that check, which I didn't cash, but we could have made everybody redundant and got put them on the uh, government paycheck. We didn't do that. They didn't have to work, and we paid them full, full tilt. And that's what it's supposed to be. It wasn't for the Lakers to get $12 million. It wasn't for De Niro to get $7 million for his restaurants. That's not what it was for. It was for the guys that own the restaurants that can't afford. But as usual, the government fucked it up. But you don't have to worry about that because Corona's not going away and there's going to be motivated sellers. You're not, you're not, you know, if you, if you made all those calls, uh, and I believe you, then the only alternative, assuming you made those calls, you're doing something wrong on the phone. They, they range. You know, like I said, I've, I found deals from a one-time multiple that the guys went to sell up. You okay, know? well. But again, if we want to do volume, it's going to take me. Okay, forever. fine. You want, but we got to start with something. Yeah, I agree. And we're closing the, the cheaper one, the cheapest one, low hanging fruit, uh, at the end of the year. I mean, the okay, good. Guy. And then we'll just keep rolling. Okay. Them up, you know? That's fine. But it's, it, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's easy, but it's not that easy. It's easy. But some of the guys, I mean, uh, Thomas has an 80% track record of closing deals this year. 80%. 15 million in EBITDA. Finding deals has not been hard. You know, I can pick up the phone, I'll call 100 people, and I'll get a couple people that are motivated sellers. Uh, it's, you know, it was a little difficult finding the right bank, building that relationship. Nobody wants to do mobile home parks. But we got a good relationship with Wells Fargo. Apparently, they have a mobile home park division. They can take us to a billion dollars. You know, uh, my chairman helped. He was the um, head of acquisition for J.P. Morgan for 25 years. Great. All these little things, you know. So, um, like my chairman says, all the stars are aligned. Just got to pull the fucking trigger. Oh, he's right about that. All the stars are aligned. And it's probably the only the second time in his career, long career, that he's seen all the stars aligned. Same as me. This is the 80s on steroids. Literally, the 80s on steroids. I was glad to get away in the 80s and not go to jail. <laughs> but they, I mean, because a lot of people did a lot of sh funky shit with all savings and loans and all the banking, and I dodged that bullet because I came from financial services. I knew there was too many ways to get in trouble. And it's who represents you. If you believe the lawsuit, and I read through the lawsuit, and, and Sussman Godfrey does not make mistakes. He is dead to rights for securities fraud. Dead to fucking rights. 
You think he's committing fraud? Like, you think he's just... I know. He, no, I don't think. I know he committed fraud. He promised 12 to 15 percent and paid 2 percent in the document. 12 to 15 and he paid 2. Black and white. And they're using his YouTubes as evidence, because I remember Correct. watching his videos, him saying, we'll give you 10 to 14 Correct. Correct. after 14. Oh, well, he, should, he shouldn't have done that. Yeah. <laughs> and the lawyers, and, 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 and in the document, Stike, oh, not Stike Elliot, that's my Canadian firm, uh, Sussman Godfrey, has produced the letters that the lawyers sent him covering their ass, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this, and he did it anyway. So if you send me a letter and you're my lawyer and you shouldn't do this, Dan, because it's, it's probably violation of securities law, blah, 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 blah. And then I go and do it anyway. Well, what's the difference between the multiples of food, commodities, biscuits and so on, and tobacco? Tobacco was $6.3 billion in sales. Well, what's the multiples of tobacco somebody selling for? 20 times earnings, 10 times earnings, 5 times earnings? As opposed to the food companies, which I historically sell at low multiples. All right, so let's go. Okay, all right, so we've got the, the multiples of, of five, five times, all right? And then we'll say tobacco is 20 times, right? So we've got uh, Boston, we've got KKR, they've got, they want to cut up this conglomerate, right? It's bloated, it's, uh, it's, it's somewhat mismanaged. Uh, but it's got a moat around it. Now, if we were to, as, as we, what we got to um, earlier on, mm -hmm. if we were to cut it up, uh, tobacco and the food, what was the percentage yeah, of... So what, we, what we said was, in terms of the profits relative to the revenues, um, thirty, yeah. 30, um, 30 of, 60% of the revenues only produces what did we say? 10% of the profits what did we say? From, from the food side. 60% of the revenues only produces 10% of the profit. Um, 30% of the profit. Right. Ah, here we are. Okay. You mean forty percent of the revenue is generated by tobacco, and that actually accounts for two thirds of the revenue and of the profit. So you have six point five billion in in tobacco and nine point five billion in food. It's about sixty forty. Yeah. Yeah, sixty forty. So. Food accounts for sixty percent of the revenue, right? But only ten percent of the profits. So the food is selling at a thin margin by definition. Right. So if we were to say, if we're plugging ourselves into this deal, the one uh, strategy would be to tag on to food, right? Because they're chasing. Tobacco, right? They're hunting elephants and we're QLA, we're starting out as an investment firm. We want to tag in if we were to insert ourselves into into the steel. Um, why would we do that? I'm guessing because there's security there and also because I believe there's a lot of R and R or research and development in tobacco at the time. There's the late seventies, there's still a lot of uh, tobacco being grown in the south. Um, and um, they were testing out cigarettes, um, trying to come out with new products without the framing. Mm -hmm. And so, whilst they're all hunting tobacco, and we were to hunt, but hunt this part, this smaller sort of part that is undervalued or keeping RJR down, how would we strike up a deal with, say, with Boston? Let's say. Boston interested in tobacco. They're interested in tobacco, are they? Yeah, everyone is interested in tobacco. Except us. Except that's the screwed. That's, 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 so if we were to plug ourselves into it, this is, this is a strategy that, that, that would work. But the, the question is, 
the the question is how what would be our pitch? How much we offer? No. What on, on what leg would we put forward first to entice them to be interested in any offer that we would come up with? Is what he's asking in a, in a different way. Now, one of the things that <clears throat> that played a role in that acquisition back in the day were that ta- uh, tobacco was taxed so highly. And now it's even taxed more highly than it was then. But we're not looking at today, we're looking at back then. But it was still, uh, I, uh, I didn't smoke, but uh, I remember uh, now a pack of cigarettes is like 10 pounds or $10 or 10 euros or even more. Back then it was only five or six. But of that, 75% of it was taxed. So the, uh, the tobacco company didn't get the, the full six euros or six pounds. They got two thirds of it because two thir- uh, one third of it because two thirds of it went to tax. Well, if you think that they can make all that fucking money on a third, it's because it's you know it's the, the old saying, uh, not the old saying, but why do sixty percent of the people that have lung cancer continue to smoke? Because it's addictive, for sure. Uh, and the uh, so I mean, but. The, in, in that particular acquisition, not then, which was a 2005, what year was it? Yeah, Andre Allen the Biscuit. Yeah. Um, wasn't it? Um, it should be up on your screen. 80s. Back in the 80s. Okay, even more so. Yeah. And in the 80s, yeah. okay, uh, 30 years ago, yeah. uh, the uh, human resource uh, PC aspect of it didn't hardly exist. Nobody gave a shit. You guys aren't old enough to remember in the 80s, but I mean, they, they didn't give a shit. Nobody cared. That's why people accuse me of being a throwback from the 80s, because I don't give a shit. But no. the, the taxes don't play a role in the operating profit. No, I understand that. But what I'm saying is, when you, you talk, I, I heard the gross revenue, and gross revenue taxes are part of gross revenue, because taxes go on top of whatever uh, the cost of goods sold were. Who's going to be taxed much less? Yeah, so yeah. The, 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 the social menus that exist today didn't exist then. So you, you can't think along with that. You have to, you know, pretend you're 30 years older, which is hard, I understand. The, uh, but this was a pure fee driven transaction. What was the total price of the final deal? Well, what did KKR, um, yeah, let's go, let's ramp up through through the office. The first offer that KKR made was? It was 17. So, 70 billion. 17, 17, 17, 17, right? That's, but that's from the management group. From the management group. Okay, that's what, so that was the first one. Okay, so that. What was the second one? Then KKR came in. 20.3 billion. 20.3. And then. What did it close at? Now, during, during that time, I think what's important is that um, there was a, they were pulling all-nighters and uh, they were in the office until, until 1 a.m. and uh, they tried to kick out, there was a lot of bad blood between Kravis, Henry Kravis, and um, Roberts, Andrew Roberts, George Roberts, um, his business partner and kissing cousin, um, was, uh, the, it was, it was famous because there was no. There was. It was already overpriced. The 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 offer was already overpriced, and then for them to go on and, and then add another three billion was. But that wasn't the final price. Twenty point something. What was the final price? The, the price that it actually sold for. KKR bid was for ninety dollars a share, about twenty point three billion in total. Okay, but is that what it closed? What it, Committee consider a proposal to purchase the company for seventeen billion. By that's the management group. Yeah. Okay. But what? What? The, what, the deal that it actually closed at? What? <clears throat> what's the price? Hundred nine. As a share. Yeah. So it went from 90 to 109. 25 billion. 
25 billion. The difference between the 17 billion, management had the right price. They actually had a 10 or 15% premium on what it was really worth. And management would. They're running it, right? So let's say the real price should have been 15 billion. They bid 17. They thought they were going to get it. The difference between 17 and 25 was speed driven. That's a lot of fate. You fucking hear right here. So the deal was bought. The, the deal was shite. It was shite. Yeah, I, I, I think so. It, it, it was one of the biggest fiascos. Another big fiasco was the AOL deal, which is in, some, in somebody's group. Where, remember how I told you I've never lost a deal in success fees since I've been doing success fees? This was success fees. So you would have? I would, I would have been at the 30. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> because it's not their money. What happened to the stock price after the purchase? Ah, good. With, with my, go look back and look at the historical chart. What you can do, all you guys, all you wizards, come on. It was a, so we're at $40, which is always undervalued. Then what happened? So it was, uh, uh, let's see, the $90 was KTR. So the management bid must have been about 85 or $80. So management bid 50 or 70 or 80 percent more than the share price was on the stock exchange, and they thought normally you get the deal then. But what was it six months later, a year later, share price? Uh, I think I'm faster than you wizards finding this shit out. Did they and did they successfully um, move sectors or industry? No, this is a, what, yeah. what was the share price in the aftermarket? In, in nineteen eighty nine, what was the share price? Seventy five. It tanked. They paid 119 or 109, right? Yes. 75? Even you wizards ought to be able to figure out it fucking tanked 30%. It tanked about back to what the offer was by management. You can always, a good rule of thumb, a tie of red tip is what is management worth? Do they know? Because they know where the skeletons are buried, yada, yada, yada. And I mean, there, there was uh, investigations and all kinds of things. They accused everybody of everything. The only person they didn't accuse was the devil. And it's one of the great smoke and mirror deals of the 80s. And that's why the 80s, along with me and a few other people that are still alive, most of those guys are dead, <clears throat> uh, the um, you know we we ripped the belly out of the the world, mm -hmm. but the favorite trick in those days was I would have taken the Biscos overfunded pension plan, and I don't know how much it was overfunded, but we used to take overfunded. We buy a company with a uh, overfunded pension plan. We ripped the excess money from the pension plan out to use to either. Pay down the debt that we associated with our purchase of this company, or buy another company. So kill the pension plan. Yeah. Well, you're not supposed to kill it, but in many cases it did kill it because the assets underperformed, and then they were fucked, unfortunately. Fortunately, 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 I wasn't involved in any of those. <laughs> Touch wood. But I mean, it happened all the time. But now you can't take overfunded pension plans. There's a, there's a pension pool. It's not the pension pool. It's like you can't take options public anymore because of the pension pool. But you can't do that now. You can't. It's illegal now. Correct. Correct. There may be still uh, legal in Passau or uh, some of the uh, Bavaria or some places. Um, so in eventuality, the, the, the buyers, the successful bidders, uh, split up to to sell it um, to Japan to, to Japan tobacco. Um, they looks like they 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 sold they sold the tobacco part off, but it's not doesn't say when exactly that happened. 
Uh, it was broken up. Foreign tobacco business sold to Japan Tobacco, uh, and the food business winding up um, being owned by Kraft. Um, and that was 15, 15 years later, and it's just, yeah, lo- well, it's just lost. So, it. so the share just price in the 70s means yeah. that they tanked. Yeah. They tanked. Yeah. And did the share price tank because the investors knew what the true value was? Well, well because it became obvious when, based on the earnings that then came out, Subsequent to the acquisition, the earnings didn't support a much higher multiple that they paid. It went back to the industry averages. How did they finance the deal? Well, they all, uh, it was almost exclusively a dip, if I remember correctly. I mean, this is the, this is the, tw- this is the 2019. So they're saying that in the first six months of 2020, they made, they made 600K. Yeah. And then in 2019, for the entire year, they made 60. That's what they're claiming is net from the PL. They claim that on the tax return, one thirty eight, negative one thirty eight. We want we want to see the as I said, seventeen seventeen uh hold on, sorry. No, I'm, I'm playing catch up here. So you don't have the last three year tax returns. I don't have no, just P L's. You mean the PL they put together yeah. on a quick fuck or something? Yeah. Yes, yeah. which means nothing. Yep. We have twenty nineteen tax returns, but that's every uh, twenty nineteen says they lost hundred and thirty thousand. I have dollars. A couple thousand dollars, just... Yeah. 130 dollars? Yeah. So they broke even. Yeah. yeah. But it looks like, uh, sir, they're, they're cooking the books and, because... And, and what business is this? Home health. What kind of home health? Uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and a couple of state contracts. How much of it, uh, their revenue is state contracts? Or contractual? 70% Medicaid, 20% VA, 10% Medicare. That's a bad combo. Yeah, I said because all those pay late uh, between three to four months. No, no, one hundred twenty to uh, one hundred eighty days. Was it Medicaid and VA? Yeah, Medicare is the best. Yeah. Okay. But Mr. Payne, yeah, but it still pays late. And uh, during uh, Corona Rona, with the employees, uh, it, it's impossible. Because with Corona, the first six months of 2020 said they made 600 grand. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, and during Corona, those entities were six to nine months late in paying. So they couldn't collect any money. So, so uh, uh, as our uh, former gas station guy that used to cheat on the uh, on the price of the pumps, okay, okay. I know that. Game. Pull my balls. Okay, hey, I know that. Uh, he is right. <laughs> Somebody is, is, is not only selling. They, they are cooking these babies. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to get. No, no, I understand, but yeah. I mean, but but just based on, and this is the United States, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, the Medicaid, that kind of thing, were all five to six months late because employees were coming to work. They were, you know, I remember when the government was shutting down and it didn't shut down and nobody was getting paid. So none of this shit got done. So they couldn't. They, it, it couldn't possibly have made six hundred k. In the first six months. I mean, they went from declining revenue to suddenly double. Negative, negative, positive, you know, it's all over the place. Okay, and, and why don't you have tax returns? I haven't gotten them yet. Oh, have you asked for them? Yeah, I've asked for them. You have just 2019. Just from the broker, I keep asking. And uh, Okay, well, I mean, so. he's a lying piece of shit yeah. anyway, so. Forget about it. $400,000 now. Yeah, there's too, there's too many there's too many ifs. Yeah, I'm trying to get an accurate <laughs> breakdown of the of the yeah. um, expenses to see where's where's it all going. So I- even if all of that is correct, the numbers are on the board. Would you ever be able to finance that? No, with the bank? no, no way. It's all over the place. No. Yeah. So that was without your personal guarantee, and you asked me. Remember, you didn't understand the difference between. Um, a non recourse, remember? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and, and the, you didn't call it a, a, a personal guarantee. How can I have non recourse money and have the personal guarantee? Was, was the question as I understood, right? Yeah, why would it? Because that's just the way it is. There's no rhyme or reason. The banks can ask you to do anything they fucking want. Just like this, uh, the, the lady that called the, had the SBA out. They wanted 25% equity on an SBA loan, okay. which is absolutely unheard of. They wanted uh, cross-collateralization or other four deals, which the SBA 
in certain uh, states, you can't even cross collateral line. They won't take any other collateral than the deal. They wanted a worldwide income sweep because she gets uh, income on other stuff. And um, and she, she kicked the SBA, she choked the SBA and the SBA and the bank acquiesced finally. Um, but uh, she still has to give a personal guarantee. SBA loans, the one thing you can be rest assured, no matter uh, how the money comes into you, you're going to have to personally guarantee it. That is federal statute. The only part they were lying about federal statute. That does say in the federal statute, the uh, recipient of the, or the benefit, actually, the main beneficiary of the money has a personal guarantee. Now, I'm in a deal, SBA deal, and that's why I have 90% when I'm in a deal. Because at 20%, that's the cutoff. And then that means the 20% guy has to guarantee it. So that's why in all my deals that I'm in the SBA are all 19%. Because I learned the hard way over the years. So just personal guarantee, that's it. No, uh, no, no. Yeah, the, the, the youth. So you I don't understand. No recourse, you don't have to pay it back. No, but you still have to guarantee yeah. it to the bank. So the bank can go after you. Correct. Okay. Okay. I was, okay. okay. If you can't pay anymore, then they go to the bank. What? No, if you can't pay anymore, uh, the bank can go after you. Because you personally guaranteed it. Even though know, they don't yeah, pay that's it. correct. Pay that. Correct. Okay. So I, I sent this to my interest expert. She said purchase price. Oh, my question is like, would this be able to get through a bank with them doing this tax return yeah. negative thirty eight? You know, no, that? no, so, no. So without the caveat is, it couldn't get through the bank without somebody having a serious equity injection. Okay, and you don't want that. Yeah. Okay. So I did a worst, so the asking price for this for a million, so I just did a 100% seller finance worst case at a million. Um, with the, with the 2019 revenue. Plus, plus, plus 2020, last three months of the COVID. Prior I mean, that's COVID. like, that's, the numbers don't make any sense. Yeah, they don't make any sense. So I use 2019. And I just used a, 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 a number of 15%. And, um. Okay, now what do you mean by 15%? 1.5. I, no, no, I understand, but I mean, you explain to me what you, what, because he, he and I obviously are different wavelengths. What do you mean by 15%? So free cash flow of 15%. Which equates to what? Which, which, uh, Fifteen percent of a million six. That you mean fifteen percent of a million six? Yeah, but that's his estimate. I know, I know. There's no reality. Okay, so the free cash flow two forty. Two forty. Okay, and if you pay three times that, you're paying seven fifty. Yeah, but I used a million as a. Okay, so now you're paying four times. Yeah. Four four times the number you got out of a fig newton of your head. Yeah. And I I used. Um, now see, now, because he, he's trying to, one, he's trying to understand it, two, he's trying to make it work, okay? Yeah. Right? But let me tell you, he could have done three, five, um, exaggerating now, other deals while he's finger fucking with this. Because you didn't make all these wise decisions overnight, did you? It, Which one? It, you did not go through this mental masturbation about this one deal, in five minutes, did you? Oh, yeah. I, I, I just made this shit up. Just No, 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 no. But I'm saying, even the made this shit up, you didn't do it in five minutes, did you? I sent my extra shit. Okay, okay. That's about it. Okay, but that takes time. You wait for a response, right? Yeah, she, I mean, we spent half an hour going for... Well, it's a half an hour waste of time. Yeah. Because just looking at it, I mean, just... Fucking guy. And, and when you tell... <clears throat> when you tell the broker, um, if I don't have the tax returns by Friday, don't pop, contact me anymore. But, again, why don't you do that? We don't want to. They are paying, they are paying their rent even, $12,850 rent expense. To themselves. To themselves. Yeah, they're just taking all kinds of fees out. Yeah, well, but it is next. Yeah, it's fine, yeah. Mm. Next.
Next. You want to do the next one? I mean, that's even, that's basically the same, basically the same thing. It's all over the place. And, um, you know, I just made up kind of three scenarios using. Well, if you've got to make up scenarios, kids, these are not motivated selves. <clears throat> so basically, it looks like if the numbers look confusing, don't even bother. We got, we got a black Einstein over here. That's correct, son. That's correct. Well, wouldn't that be part of the due diligence as he goes? Wouldn't that be... No, well, now they're buying deals without going. My point. Because Corona Rona, he's, he's in one of the most locked down areas in America. He can't get on a plane. Wow. And we have young kids closing deals without looking at the... It's like a marriage without getting a blowjob first. I mean, they just... Exactly. I mean, I don't understand. Exactly. And... It, we have dozens of deals closing weekly. Weekly! That the kids never saw the assets. And banks giving loans on assets they never saw either. That's a recipe for disaster. You don't understand why it's a recipe for disaster? Which banks are there, Mr. <laughs> uh, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, uh, Citibank. Really? Yeah. 2.2 hectares, without upkeep, it gets overgrown. And when we took the, the estate over 35 years ago, it was way overgrown and in shambles. Uh, because nobody, you know, nobody wanted to, one, take the responsibility of the financial commitment to keep, you know, the estate manicured like we, we've done the last three plus decades. So inflation, you know, we haven't had, had serious inflation in a long time. And nobody wants hyperinflation like they had in Germany and they've got in Venezuela now and Argentina, etc. cetera. Um, but you can't just keep printing money. That's why we got off the gold standard in the, in the 70s. Because there was no rhyme, there was no rationale between the value of, and this is the U.S. dollar, the value of the dollar in, in gold, there was no ratio anymore. And that's why Bitcoin is, is taken off, even though I don't believe it's going to be the standard to back currencies. But they're looking for a, a real something um, that's got a tangible value. But now, you know, at twenty-three dollars or $25,000 a coin, fra you're going to have fractured coins. Or, I mean, it's, it's a whole other series of uh, challenges. But that's one of the reasons it's... Uh, the, the cryptocurrencies have finally uh, been accepted against my better judgment, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I have a few questions. A question. First of all, what do you think about the President Trump presidency? What's going to be happening? Second, don't you think that the, by the printing the U.S. by the printing the uh, dollar? Out of it, they want to kind of President Trump have a plan to take, take the, get rid of the Federal Reserve. No, nah, no, nah. that's all too esoteric for me. That's all too fancy. I don't know. I, I, I'm not part of that uh, uh, the uh, World Economic uh, Deal at Davos. I'm not. I'm so far away from that. It's not even funny. Uh, I don't know. I'm not privy to anything uh, Trump is going to do. But I do know Trump is vindictive. He's, he's gone on record about being vindictive, so I don't know what he's going to do. I have no inside knowledge about that other than if he's going to be vindictive like he's been before, some, <laughs> some strange things are going to occur. Uh, well, I hear that they have a, they doubled the size of the Guantanamo and they have a one secret prison in the Iceland. I don't know. I don't know about that. The... Uh, I don't know. I, 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 plus, it doesn't matter to us. See, I'm focused. If it, if, if it does, the only thing that, if the banking system collapses, that will affect us for the good. And it's, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm a doomsdayer, you know, uh, where I uh, built shelter in my backyard and canned food and that kind of shit. Uh, but, I mean, it's all these bad things are, are better for us. They're just flat ass better for us, and the um, it's 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 it, it's sad when you're the um, 
the beneficiary of bad things. But we're not causing the bad things. Not all, you know. And a lot of you guys that are, have the tree-hugging disposition and you know, empathy and sympathy, they're selling this as, we're the saviors. I'm not selling like this, so don't get me wrong. I'm not selling QLA as the savior of humanity like some people are. But there are people that are selling it like that. I'm not. So when you said it's beneficial for us, if the banking, you know, kind of... Because then everything's going to be seller finance. Ooh. Ooh. I didn't think about that. You did. Well, you haven't thought about a lot of things, old timer, but it's all right. But I know the gas pump business. I've been in that business, too. What a license. I don't, well, this is a slight exaggeration. I don't know an honest man that owns a gas station. I don't know. I'm sure there is, Lord, but I never met him. And one of the reasons Great Western Resources was in every form of, except retail distribution. That means gas stations. And why? For the reason I just said. I never met, you know, just like I never met a uh, guy uh, in the oil business. I, I never met a man uh, uh, if he, uh, that doesn't drink, I don't trust him. Well, it's, a, it's along those same lines. But I never, uh, you know, and, and now with the environmental and you've got to have all this bullshit, I mean, it's a pain in the ass. But, I mean, that's why of all from A to Z in petroleum, mining, uh, refining, construction pipeline, drilling, offshore, onshore, we were in all of those except for gas stations. And there's a reason why we didn't go into gas stations. I rest my case. Uh, uh, no, I, re I rest my case. I mean, the... Uh, now, in the old days, they used to stick a, a, a pole. To, uh, they still do that? Yeah. Oh, fuck. What a joke that is. You, you, I get all excited thinking about this. Um, the, uh, you stick a pole down, and it has these uh, markers, oh, yeah. and it tells you how many gallons you got left, etc. Well, uh, we used to be in the gathering business. We had uh, pipelines from uh, sites of tanks that would gather oil. And so once or twice a week, depending on the production, or mostly depending on weather, We'd go around and we'd gather the oil out of these big uh, round tanks, you see, yeah, yeah. And you, you measure it by putting the pole down. So, and like all the other businesses, just like the drilling rigs, I've been on top of drilling rigs and I'd go out there and try to learn the business the best I can. And I'm sitting there with a the guy, the trucker, and they look like in the movies and, you know, the, uh, they're smoking around the fucking thing. Yeah, all the things you're not supposed to do, right? And he, he puts the pole down the thing, and he says, he measures it. This is on a Tuesday. They picked up the oil. They gathered the oil Tuesday and Fridays. So I had an inkling of something. I was out there living in a, 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 a $11 a night uh, a motel that had cockroaches this big. Okay. I'm going to go out one more time to, to, to measure. Or watch them measure. You know, I've got a half a day. I don't have to be to the... Uh, uh, Abilene, uh, uh, not, uh, yeah, Abilene, Texas uh, airport. No, uh, yeah, Abilene. And so I go out there and they measure it again. So I'm on a plane from Abilene to um, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and then from Phoenix to Los Angeles. And on the way to Phoenix, um, you know, toned up pretty good, I had a vision of them putting the, the uh, pole down. It's actually a square thing. And I said, and I've got almost photographic memory, and how come I'm seeing the same numbers as I saw on Tuesday on Friday on the pole? There should be three days of production oil that would mean that there's three, three days more oil. And so then it dawned on me. They're skimming us. I got off the plane in uh, Tucson or, or uh, Phoenix, I got on another plane right back to Abilene, <laughs> and I went, and uh, we measured it ourselves, and we've been losing three feet high of oil times a hundred different tanks a week. Oh, oh yeah, oh, no, 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 it was, it was like in the hundreds of barrels. 
and the, because um, each one of the things we were measuring is about this. In fact, this, make this round, this room round, about the same height, okay, and three feet, or three feet of the oil, not three foot of your six inch dick, Wellington, three feet, that's a lot of fucking oil. And so we, uh, and there's nothing like when you get the uh, Texas Rangers, them boys. We never met a man we trusted uh, doing anything, especially Mexicans like you, Pina. And we uh, set him up and we uh, arrested him and had some fun. And of course the Texas Rangers whipped the shit out of him just like you should, you know, caved in their heads. Just like in the good old days. It never happened again. And um, the, uh, but when I think of that, and then it dawned on me, I know I ran, jump on another plane, and I was right, because it should be different measurement three days later. It should be three feet more of oil. So I, 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 I put it up to a Persian deal. It was a Persian conspiracy. And the truck drivers uh, spoke Farsi and so we, we crucified him right then. We didn't, we, we, buy, we, went, we didn't go through the trial or any of that shit. We just killed him right on the spot, just like in the good old days. Just, I mean, just like they do in Persia. That's exactly right. So they, they were familiar with the Persian law. We're going to kill you right on the spot. You mean just like the Ayatollah? Yeah, I just like him. That's all a, a joke, so don't give me a bunch of bullshit from YouTube. Okay, who's next? By the way, uh, I want uh, to... Uh, I just came from the ones that were in my uh, dining room. That group? Yes. Okay. The deals that I poked fun at, I want you to show them. Yep, there he is. The little, yeah. Now, we're making it, I'm using this as an example of why you guys are where you are and why you take so long and haven't done any deals. Not to just make fun of the kid. Although it's easy to make fun of the kid, but that's not what we're doing that. We're doing it because this is not the way to do the deals. How many times have I told, okay, I asked you so you answer them. You've asked for three years tax returns, right? And speak into a mic so they can hear you when you give the answer. But the business broker told you, or whoever told you. I just haven't gotten a, uh, they, they say they keep asking the seller, but the seller doesn't respond. Next, I told them to uh, text or email the broker. If I don't have the tax returns by Sunday or Friday, now I'd say stick them up your ass, but we'll make it easier for him. Uh, uh, there is no deal. Don't bother me ever again. Pardon? There's no seller. No, but none of your sellers are motivated. A motivated seller sends you the fucking tax returns. Even if they, re uh, even if they don't respond or uh, match up to their bogus financials, they're not even going through the, uh, the drill the act of trying to be uh, comply by giving you the tax returns, then they can try to bullshit you why they don't match the numbers. They're not even going through that step because they think you're stupid. They're disrespecting you. It's not even disrespect. They have no respect for you. And I mean, and how does your board react to this? Uh, this is one of the first, I have, I only sent it to one industry expert, this is one of the first deals I'm looking at. Okay, well, I mean, I told you, as soon as you get the numbers, you give them to your board. See, that's the, the next part. So the board hasn't seen them. Just one person. And what did the one person say? She said it was worth about half. No, 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 that you don't have the tax returns. She went through all the information, and she did, she spent a lot of, little time on it. Um, she just said, request a oh. document. Okay, she, she tried to do uh, as best she could with what you gave her. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, fine. But that, 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 that and $5 won't buy you a coffee latte at Starbucks, will it? Guys, 
Do you understand when you're, uh, I'm going to let you go. I'm not let you go. I want you to talk in a minute. Do you understand why you let him treat you this way? Low self-esteem. No self-confidence. Lack of self-worth. Now, I mean, seriously, without me yelling, do you understand that? Does anybody have another reason why you'd allow these people to professionally shit on you? Give me another reason. There isn't any, is there? Then why do you do it? We know why you do it. And until you can get over that speed bump that you are making like Mount Everest, those little speed bumps, you're never going to be able to make QLA work. You have to get over it. But, I mean, they are, they're not even disrespecting, because disrespecting implies they had some respect for you. They're showing you no respect. And the deals won't get done, whether you're in Germany, uh, the United States, Switzerland, it doesn't matter. Okay, continue with the show. Yes, yes, I want you to go through the... And um, I have one year tax return 2019, um, but the rest of the years I have just P&L. A P&L that they put together the numbers, no professional did. And what's the difference between the tax return that you have, just the, the, just the bottom number, the $38? Uh... So in 2019, the P&L was showing a a net of net income of 60k, tax return was negative 138. Does everybody understand? Negative 60k, tax return says positive 130 or 38 or 138. Negative 138. Negative 138. Does everybody understand that? That would have been adios, motherfucker. Go fuck yourself. Now you're all shaking your head, but you you're doing the same thing back there, shaking your head. I mean, your deal's no better. Go ahead. So, like the first year was negative, you know, 4,500 on the P&L, 2.3 million top line, and then the next year, 2.1 million, and um, P&L income was like 150, and then 60, but suddenly in 2020, magically, revenue jumped up to 2.6 million, million, and um, the first, this is based on the first six months on the P&L, uh, 1.3, so double that. And then the uh, net income uh, on the P&L for the first six months was 600. So they went from minus 138, right? Yeah, they went from minus 130 on the tax return to 2.6 uh, income and 1.2 net for 2020. And what did you think when this happened? I mean, it's, a, it's just a mess. I mean, it's a next. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's just a mess. It's, they're, they're just, they're gouging all the... No, it doesn't matter what they're gouging. I mean, it's, the numbers are impossible. I'm pretty creative. And without fraud, these numbers are impossible. Does anybody not understand why they're not, these numbers are impossible? Just, 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 and he calls it, you know, when he, you give them more credit when you say P&L, you call them P&L, right? These are net book or net whatever, you know, one of the deals. And no, whatever the numbers you put in is the results you get out. So the numbers mean nothing. That coupled with the fact that there's such a gross disparity between the numbers and the tax returns, and the first six months of um, Corona Rona, and you're in assisted living, right? Home health is, although some home health did benefit, and it's Medicaid, Medicare, and something else. VA. VA. Now, the real clincher is during Corona Rona. Remember, 
one, everything was late because the employees uh, weren't coming to work because of corona. Two, the government went to lockdown one time during corona, and they weren't paying anybody, so the Treasury Department, all these, weren't getting paid, okay? And yet, their Medicare, Medicaid, and the vet, which a lot, and I have vets, buddies that are vets that were, didn't get their vet checks because of the reasons I've just alluded to. Somehow, they made 600 grand during the six worst months in the history of fucking the business. It just, dog doesn't hunt. And see, if, if I were there, whether it was better in person, but I, you know, I would, I mean, why, why? You know, what you I'd say, you know, what you're doing is, this is malfeasance, this is fraud. I have a good mind to report you to Medicaid, Medicare, and the VA. You should. Not anonymously. This is malfeasance. And some dipshit that listens to me on YouTube will buy the deal. And get fucked and then blame it on QLA. And he should have had more input than just the one board member. And I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt that he didn't show it to the other board members, although he, he alluded that it was his first deal, because uh, you know he didn't, better to only look like a fool to one of your board members than all your board members. And that's why you do it like that. I understand. But unless you can get over that, you, 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 you know, even QLA can't save you. It can't. And Medicaid, Medicare, and the vets pay between, just in regular good times, pay between 90 and 180 days late. Did you hear what I said? 90 and 180 days late. And now they're saying a miracle happened, an anomaly of accounting. It just... And I would hope that if he showed it to the rest of the board, they would say that. But maybe they didn't. But we're never going to know because they didn't see it. And if, you know, uh, Bruce Whipple tells me, Bruce the Whipple, he sent me a statistic. A 25-year-old man procrastinates one hour a day, and he lives to 70. He is wasted two years of his life. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the number. One hour a day for 25 to 70, two years of your life. But what Whipple says when he talks to some of you guys, he says the biggest uh, uh, down, uh, or the biggest mistake the kids make is they don't utilize their board boards for insight uh, because they're ashamed to show the board how incredibly stupid you are. they are. And that's my experience as well. And one of the other things that um, in, in the recent corona uh, um, acquisitions, and you heard it from the one kid um, from Belgium, he knew nothing about his industry. And uh, none of the kids that are making these acquisitions during corona know nothing about their industry. Nothing. Okay, um, do you understand the, the, where this breaks down or how it has broken down? And if you remember the role play that Josh had with the motivated seller, uh, he said, uh, I, I'll need three years of your tax returns and I'm sure your accountant can get them to me quickly and I'll need three years of your financials. Sometimes they haven't filed the last year or they filed for an extension. That's a legitimate reason. But then, okay, I, if I can't have the last year, then I went to three subsequent years. So you're, and you're waiting on the fourth year. So you'll take the three subsequent years or prior years, and then when they get, when they, if you're still trying to close the deal or consummate the transaction, they can get you the, um, 
the year that they file for an extension. Everybody understand that process? Okay, what was the other thing we said about yours? So, uh, when you do 100% seller finance. Oh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Ask me. So, when you go 100% seller finance, so I did a, just a made up scenario, seller so finance, and then you go put financing on it. How do you frame it back? Okay, so then you, you bought the deal, let's say it's a million euro, a million something, 100% seller finance. Now, three months later, six months later, whatever the time frame, you want to finance it, right? That's the question. Uh, and you go to the bank, and this is not a refinance because you haven't financed it once yet. And, you, and when, you, when you talk to the banks, if you refer to it as a refinance, they're going to ask you, how long have you been in business? If you tell them, I'm financing it for the first time, it's a different set of questions. Because you're not, re, you're not refinancing it. Because it's never been financed. Does everybody understand that concept? Okay, so now you've gone to the bank and you've asked, you want to ask for 120% of finance. You want to overfinance it. And so your question, even though I didn't allow you to finish the question, part of the question is, do I have to pay off the seller that I have the seller's note for, right? Yeah, do they take the note into consideration? Well, no, of course they take it into consideration because you've got to disclose it. If you don't disclose it, you're committing bank fraud. Everything's full disclosure. So let's say you've got a, a note, a million dollar note, seller's, equ seller's note, it's seller's equity, and you're going to finance the deal for a million too. So depending on how your purchase agreement and your management agreement are written, will depend on whether you've got to pay off the whole fucking note, with or without a prepayment penalty, or none of the note. And it depends how your, your lawyer writes it. But you can't finance it and then not tell the seller. That's bank fraud. We have kids doing it every week. Every single week kids do it. I'm not saying that's right. And I'm not saying it's a practice you should duplicate. But we have kids doing it. So you tell, depending on, let's say, uh, uh, that your deal is that if you uh, finance it within three years, you've got to pay 100% of the note off. If it's over three years, which is going to be less than three years. But that's not the only way to pay and get money out and pay the accountants and the lawyers. We've got guys that have done 100% seller finance. They're on their fifth, sixth, and seventh deals. So that means... The accountants haven't been paid in five, six, seven deals. The lawyers haven't been paid in five, six, seven deals. You have no bank finance. The board, more importantly, hasn't been paid in five or six or seven deals. And at the top of the list, you haven't been paid in five or six or seven deals. So what do you do? Well, these, this group, could, well, some of you could last five or six or seven deals. What you do is, as I said in the seminar, that there's, you can... Uh, have them draw down their working capital loan. You can have them draw down their uh, uh, line of credit overdraft and leave it as cash in the account and you pay for the deal, seller's note, including the drawdown of those two uh, entities and then you pay the fees out of them. It's not, not likely you're going to get a deal past a business broker that's 100% seller finance. It's not in their interest, is it? So what did I say in the seminar, how you get around that? Yes, sir. You pay them. And what normally happens, wrongfully, they also collect from the seller. They're not supposed to, but you can't keep them. You cannot keep the seller from paying them. But you, oh, you disclose everything. This is not, you're not home. This is not a petroleum station butt fuck. And we have a lot of kids that get in trouble because they don't disclose, because they're so partially through their ethnicity, they're so used to doing shit under the table, brown envelope, backhander, they get in trouble. I understand that. I don't condone it at all, but I understand it. 
Nine times out of ten, when you get in trouble, it's based on your ethnic background because that's the way you learned to do business growing up. Nine times out of ten. For the Dutch, they just have a black heart. They invented the first scam, the tulips, 1535 to 1537. One of the great scams of all time. Some people are equating Bitcoin to that. I'm not, but some people are. The greatest scam of all time. They started the first stock exchange, first burst. It's genius, really. That's why when I went there to take an option public, I mean, they loved it. They asked less questions than the Bank of England did when I was here with it. They thought it was, are you Dutch, Mr. Pena? Does Pena sound Dutch to you? We'd like to take credit for this. The president of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange said, I'd like to take credit for this in some way. When I, as I walked out the door, I said, well, you'll figure out some way. I know whether it's true or not. It doesn't make any difference, does it? He just laughed, just like he's laughing right now. OK. Did I answer your question? So you can do 100% seller finance deals and get them, get them through. You can get them through the broker. There's, 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 there's no shortage. But several of the kids in the recent months, what they do is the seller, they have figured this out. They draw down their work, whatever is left of their working capital loan. They drain their line of credit, and they write themselves a check as a dividend. And you're fucked. And you're fucked. There's nothing you can do about it, unless it's already addressed in the uh, purchase agreement. You're fucked. And that's why, you know, a lot of times you close a deal on Friday. And you guys, because you're stupid, don't show up till Monday. I can, I can introduce you to people that bought uh, uh, dental clinics, uh, that bought uh, 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 hair grooming, uh, uh, dog hair grooming, uh, veterinary hospitals. They show up on Monday, there's not a pill, comb, knife left in the building. because you wanted to have the weekend off. I'm, I can tell you in this room who would want the weekend off. You, the, when it closes, you're changing the passwords on the shit as you're sitting at the table to make sure there's no, nothing's been drawn out. And I sleep at the place over the weekend. Nothing's missing. We got a guy in Montana. I mean, they took the toilet paper. Now, how can people be so stupid? They're not, they're not naive. Because uh, if you haven't been fucked, you haven't been fucked. And remember, I told you, the real job, the real task at hand doesn't start until you own the fucking thing. You've got to run it. And you've got employees. They took the toilet paper. I remember I laughed my ass off. And he was on, and it was 40 below zero in Montana, and he was driving uh, his old pickup truck to a Walmart. This is pre-corona. Uh, the truck broke down. There's nothing like losing, using cold leaves to wipe your ass with. It's a different, you know, warm leaves, cold leaves with uh, uh, icicles on them. That's a whole, which I, unfortunately I've experienced, that's a whole different feeling. I might as well be, uh, you know, uh, in New Zealand living in a hut. What do they wipe their ass for uh, when you're living in the huts? They got toilet paper? Huh? You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe sheep. No, they got, they got toilet paper there, don't they? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, yes, sir. Question as far as the purchase agreement. Uh, what do you put in there to stop them from withdrawing? 
That's what you got lawyers from for. Although, yeah, that's what you got lawyers for. I'll leave it at that. The uh, in most of the most lawyers that have been in practice just a few years have know all these how, to, how you got fucked because they got fucked, and that's why in the big law firms you got a couple of junior guys and then a senior guy and then a manager and then a partner or one or two partners got to sign off on it, and there's a reason for that. Yes, sir. Just going off, uh, I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about Gerard Moroni uh, and the dental, uh, the um, the grooming uh, deal. How, how's he faring? Uh, how's he faring now? Terrific. He's bought, uh, he's closed his eighth, seventh or eighth last week. This one was 100% uh, uh, commercial debt. Um, the, um, he's still using the grooming centers as a funnel for his veterinary practice is, which are a funnel to his veterinary hospital. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you don't remember, he, uh, he can't spell veterinary. Uh, slight exaggeration. And if you remember, he started off wrong. He went back and got his Goomba cousin and his Goomba brother-in-law and his Goomba this and his Goomba that to form his board, his first board. And he tried to get in uh, garbage, which is highly... I mean, if, it's, it's the most criminalized, especially in Manhattan, it's the most criminalized uh, uh, endeavor, gangster-ridden endeavor in Manhattan, garbage. Yeah, well, he knows them all because he represents them. Yeah, he's a criminal lawyer. Uh, and then uh, that didn't work out. I don't know. I never asked him why, how it didn't work out, but probably they wanted too big a cut, I guess. I don't know. That's just conjecture on my part. Then he went into... Um, uh, Man, uh, windows, window frames on big, big construction projects. And that's all unionized, and that didn't work out. And then I forget what the third one was, and then he quit. And then he saw a Zoom call with one, uh, uh, some, some dipshit, and uh, the dipshit had done two deals, and he was so embarrassed. And he says this on the webinar, I, I was shamed that this little cunt. And so then he started over again, and uh, veterinary, um, and he's doing terrific. He's doing terrific. He knows nothing. But that's a, that's a, class, a criminal lawyer, defense lawyer, doing uh, veterinary roll-ups. But, you know, and even though all these guys tell you the same thing, you still don't believe it. You think that maybe he's a fucking, I don't know what you think he is. You know? Just a dipshit lawyer. I mean, God almighty who's getting rich off of grooming dogs now. And he's allergic to dogs and cats. That's, that, that's the best part of it. He gets hives. He can't even go to his, his stores. He gets hives from it. That's that, I mean, that's karma. You know, that's karma coming back. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Manhattan. I think he lives in the Bronx. I, I don't know that for a fact, but I know these are in Manhattan. But we've got other guys doing them um, in Kansas, and people will spend, uh, uh, veterinary bills didn't go down during corona. They maintained their level or went up, because people will take better care of their animals, which I, 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 I tend to uh, err on, on that side. You know what a new, a, a new pu puppy a uh, coming out of champion stock uh, cost five years ago and what they cost today? Five to 25,000 pounds. That little shit better live a long fucking time to get, make me happy. Otherwise, I'll forever blame this Winston. The... Uh, He's doubled in size in a month. He's doubled in size. In a week, he grew... No, 10 days, he grew 16 centimeters in the length of his... his from the tip of his toes to up his leg. He's grown 16 centimeters in uh, 10 days in length of his... 
uncoordinated as shit. Makes me feel thin when I look at him, though. He's got so much fat on him. And he's the perfect dog. Doesn't like exercise. And he watches TV. He watches TV. And the um, certain commercials he likes better. Or certain programs he likes better. He's just, you know, I mean, it looks like Winston, actually. I mean, you know. Okay. Um, I wanted, I want the, um, who was the other uh, case that I uh, made shambles of? Was it your case? What? Okay, well, somebody else's case that I went in and looked at. Was it with you, Ed? Oh, Nabisco. Now, but yeah, but you, you didn't do it in here for the group, did you? Am I dreaming? Do I have early onset dementia? You didn't give that. You didn't. What's going on? No, we had this, this, we had this guy who came into the other seminar. We had the presenter. Okay. Get up there. Right. Fuck. You notice how everybody's in such a hurry to come up and present? Is it my imagination, Ed, or. It's my imagination. That's right, Pixar. And, uh, How many of you um, gave your uh, personal um, deal yesterday to the group? How many? I don't know. I mean, to the group up here, not to your little chicken shit. Just raise your hands again, please. Okay, how, okay, put them down. How many still have your personal deal to give? Okay. Now, I didn't pick the three or four worst on purpose. It just happened that way. But the reason why we, you bring deals, and you don't have to have deals to come here, but bring deals is to go over the deals to see um, where the shortfall is. Well, in the examples that you guys gave me yesterday, you can't even compare because it's not even remotely close to a deal. Does everybody understand that? I'm not doing it to poke fun, although I get a chuckle out of it, how you can be so fucking ignorant. But anyway, that's personally, because but I'm a lot smarter than you. And see, and I'm not afraid to say it, how you can get it so fucked up. But there's method in my madness. And then we had one uh, deal, the Pixar deal, and then we got the Dabisco deal uh, thrown in at the same time, just to, uh, not, not to illustrate how different those deals are other than not just uh, because they're multi-billion dollar deals, but the thought process. Because there is a thought process when you do a Pixar deal. You know, no plan goes past the first bullet, you know. When they first started that deal a long, long time ago, they had other ideas. I'm sure Steve Jobs had other ideas, and then it turned out to be whatever it was. The same with Nabisco, and I told you that the Nabisco deal was driven by fees. The difference between 20.3 billion and 24 billion, more or less, were fees. Most of, not everything, but mostly fees. And I told you in my 50-year career uh, that I've never not had a deal completed when I had uh, success fees. Somehow we get a, somehow the professionals figure out a way to get the fucking thing done. Um, but there's a section that we normally wait till later on in the week, but we're going to do it today instead. The, uh, uh, after reading emails from some of the, uh, uh, mentees out in the, in the field, and my emails uh, seem to accelerate during the seminars. I don't know why they think I'm going to answer them, because I don't answer them. And that's the truth. It's like the Dutch, uh, Dutch kid uh, from the last seminar from two and a half weeks ago, 20-year-old. He said, well, how, you know, when we have problems, how do we get a hold of you? And it's, it's on YouTube. I said, you don't. This is it, kid. Just like Pontius Pilate did to Christ, I'm washing my fucking hands of you, fat little piece of shit. He happens to be a fat piece of shit.
Some of you in this room tried to contact me since the seminar. Even though I told you I wouldn't, in this country they don't say would not, I wouldn't be answering. You have all the materials. The meatheads have all the materials. And again, 99.9% .9 of all the deals that are done on the planet since May of 1993, I've never met. And as I said in the last seminar, uh, I got a little nostalgic, if that's the right word, uh, because uh, since the uh, major uh, article is, gonna, is coming out after the first of the year about me, and a major a metropolitan newspaper, and a documentary about me. And so I had a, uh, I don't know if reflect is the right word. I don't know if that's the right word, but I reflected upon a lot of things and going through albums and looking at pictures and um, in preparation for this seminar. And uh, it um, became obvious to me uh, because they asked um, who, uh, they didn't ask it this way, but what they were really asking, are there mentees over these, this long period of time uh, that we could interview. They didn't ask it that way. Uh, because most of them don't want to talk. Um, they're, um, they want the money, but not the notoriety. And I've said this before, and I believe, and Sally believes even more firmly than I do, that it's because they're not paying taxes, and they don't want to come out in a Chicago Tribune or, or NBC or whatever, and then all of a sudden, they're on you. Because the IRS looks at that shit in America. The Inland Revenue in this country, and whatever they call them in Australia, they look at those films for loudmouth fucking punks. Mostly they're e-commerce loudmouth punks or rappers that think they don't have to pay taxes. Um, and you might have noticed that one of the last things that's come up, uh, I don't think it's going to get approved before Trump's out, is the tax, um, uh, the internet. If I was still in that business, I would have gotten diarrhea. Now, I pay all my taxes, but 99% of the people that are on Amazon and all those things don't pay any taxes. And if those big companies, those big platforms are going to be obligated to give the information to the taxing authorities, most of the people that come to this seminar are fucked because you pay no taxes and now you're going to be chased. But that's, that, that's an, an aside. Um, so when the... Um, in preparation for this, and then looking back, thank you, Edward, in looking back uh, upon my uh, long, in, in some cases, illustrious career, uh, certain things popped out. And I alluded to one of them yesterday when I talked about the 16 or 17 guys, and uh, the of two of which I'm chairman, the other I'm not chairman, that have done very, very well, exceptionally well, during the corona period, doing as many as 11 deals during corona alone. And of course, uh, uh, Andreas uh, and uh, Thomas done seven or eight and nine, uh, and Gerard doing seven or eight. Um, the, uh, but they all believed. They believed in, well, they say me, but they believed in the system first. And as Thomas, the, the young French kid, Chinese French kid uh, in uh, Canada said, I believed in Dan because the system worked and he showed me people that made it work, so why can't I make it work? And words of that effect. Uh, the, uh, I think therefore I am kind of thing. And, but they started with faith, they believed. And then slowly but surely, they started believing in themselves. Because you can believe in me all day long. If you don't believe in yourself to get this done, you won't get it done. Now how could the examples that we've seen, your individual deals, be so fucked up beyond recognition. Like, you almost didn't hear what you taught, learned in the first seminar. I mean, i.e., you don't have tax returns. And remember I told you, the cases that are presented here, your own personal cases, are what do I need to buy the business, sell the business, or merge the business, right? And one of those things is tax returns. Uh, or 
I haven't got that information back because the, the broker tells you he's asking the prospective seller for the information, but he's not getting it. That's normally what the case is, right? How do you know that the, the broker is even asking the prospective seller? Can you prove it? Would you stake your life on it? Probably not. Because it's part of his sales mechanism to give you as least amount of information to make a commission for himself, this is the broker, as possible. Because any broker worth his salt knows that if you get 100% of the information, you're probably not going to buy. Because 100% of the information are all the skeletons. And you realize, and I said it many times during the seminar, <clears throat> the broker is, you can make him your friend, but for the most part, they're not your friend. Because as, as Marcus Bauer pointed out uh, qu quite eloquently, and you're going to hear him in a webinar in a couple of days, is that a broker is there to make a sale, just not necessarily your sale. He's there just to make a sale, to make a commission. Yeah, you act like he's your brother. Or he's, you know, he's, he's blood. And I told you at the beginning of the regular seminar and ad nauseum through the seminar that the brokers aren't your friends. Yet most of the deals that I heard yesterday, the year deals, um, they may have started with a cold call, but they end up with a broker. And I told you, I went through two or three examples. How you can get the information where, the, where, where these, um, these guys are, even if uh, um, off a, um, a broker's web page, and then you go to them and you, when, when, when does your, deal, when does your, uh, your uh, agreement with the broker expire? And fine, I said, give me a call when your, your deal with the broker expires. But I don't think anybody in this room did that. And the deals, your individual deals, uh, the, um, while it's good for you to understand how the Nabisco and the AOLs of this world uh, do deals, they are here and you are here. It's like, I made the example, uh, uh, it's like uh, they are the uh, New York Yankees under Steinbrenner when they were winning all the world championships and you're a high school baseball team. And when I asked the individuals that presented their own cases, how long, I didn't say wasted, I said, how long were you working on this? All of you said, in different ways, too long. And I told you that it takes me, a microsecond is an exaggeration, but uh, 10 seconds is not an exaggeration for me to ascertain whether it's worth even bothering with, right? Yet you took, not hours, not days, not weeks even, but months to bring a transaction here that's really not worth going over. Now, in two seminars ago, we had a guy um, from Mexico, and another guy, in one seminar ago, we had another guy from someplace else, and I said, when I hit my foot on the ground like this, he said, self-sabotaging, right? That's all you've done since you left the seminar. From Ed, who is a sophisticated businessman, great career, in the real world, to down to the uh, Persian meathead who says he's made 72,000 cold calls and he's just waiting for the money to come in. And we engage in self-sabotaging because we don't believe we deserve to win. You can go all through all the fucking steps half ass. We all know we've worked with people that are half ass, right? You, we got to go fix whatever they did or whatever, right? We've all worked with people that didn't go the extra mile. Forget the extra mile like Bruce Whipple says. Forget that fuck. That extra mile, Brucey, 
That extra mile is so motherfucking dead, you, you should take it out of your vocabulary. I don't know anybody that goes there other than me and Whipple and a few others and those 16 guys that did deals during Corona. Because you didn't get those deals done during Corona not going the extra mile. Because for whatever reason, I was more successful in instilling into those kids that this is where we are today. And normally I make this impassioned speech the last day. But I'm going to make it today. Make it today. And because you and most people, as I said, have taken your foot off the accelerator because you, not consciously. Remember when we were talking about affirmations and goals, I said, your subconscious doesn't know you're full of shit. Some of us are more full of shit than others just because of your ethnicity. This, naturally, the Dutch are full of shit. Since they came off with the greatest scam, tulip bulbs, in 1535-ish, I mean, they invented the, the scam. They invented it. Okay, but the, there's a few ethnicities that just are full of more shit. You're going to come out of here. From today, you can still get a deal done between now and the year end. From today. From the last day of the seminar to the end of the year, there's three days, I think. You can still get a deal done between that and the end of the year. The last, this is a bit of a Trump exaggeration. The last day of the seminar, I could get a done, deal done before the end of the year. I'm not saying build a, a dream team and all that in one day, but I, you certainly can, because we have at our disposal the, the, big, the greatest, the uh, most useful error in our quiver is 100% seller finance. 100% seller finance. One of, um, um, one of the kids has got a, uh, uh, his, uh, his first meeting at the seller's request is, is, is today, Christmas Eve. Now, when a seller says, I'm in a hurry and I can meet Christmas Eve, even you, that can get a deal done. They didn't ask him over there on Christmas fucking Eve. He seems reasonably serious. Now, the, the meathead in the deal, which, I've got to take a deep breath. Uh, that's the closest I come to, uh, you know, uh, yeah, meditation, um, could get the deal done, but you know, maybe he thinks he's going over there for a coffee. I, I have no idea what the young kids think anymore. But I would be on that motherfucker's doorstep the day before Christmas Eve from yesterday, and I would be on him like a cheap suit. So we'll see. We should know something by tomorrow. And I hope that I come in here pounding my chest and, and not the universal head down. Um, the, um, by the way, Winston, Winston got through the night. He didn't pee or poo in the, in the house. I just, I, just, I just wanted to tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't pee or poo. I, I can't speak for yourself. But uh, the, um, so it, it all went well, um, which I'm happy to say. And he, um, as I told you, he continues to grow. Um, last night, um, um, you saw my namesake, and having spent um, my birthday at his house, um, and I've said this several times, but it's, uh, now he, other than he was, if they say he was five foot one, he was probably four foot eight, okay? Uh, other than a weird dude, but it's, it's quite ironic for all the money he's given in the 2,500 libraries that he's founded and all the, and the universities that he has not got an award uh, from the Queen of England. Even I got an award from the Queen of England, and I say, fuck, shit, cunt. There's a reason why he's not knighted. And, um, and after seeing what he did, 
Uh, I mean, he was a vicious guy. And his speciality was throwing his best mates under the bus. And remember, they tell me 35 years ago, Dan, you're not tough enough. Otherwise, you would have been the first shitting there on the planet. And if I'm not tough enough, gentlemen, I don't know what we can call you. Um, but you read a, um, an email that I got, and we're going to start with that. Because that's today, or yesterday, or four days ago. What are some of the... And by the way, I'm reading your homework. Uh, the, um, those of you that volunteered information yesterday, based on the homework, how did you relate to Vanderbilt? The, uh, the, the real scary examples or comparisons, you guys didn't volunteer, because now that I've read them, the, uh, the real you, I'm just a measly cunt with no balls. I've never had any balls. I've never been in a schoolyard fight. I've never, none of those guys volunteered. I'm just a mealy mouth pussy. My vagina lips flap. No, none of you guys volunteered your information. I wonder why. But we'll get around to that when we're not on camera. Uh, when we ask for the homework. But the one thing that I do want to talk about on camera is that email that uh, I gave you to read and uh, what, uh, some volunteer information on what you thought. Now, just imagine, the question I should have had you answer, but I didn't, is how close are you to being able to relate to that email? And I'm asking it now. Now, you are you looking at the email? Okay. Okay. Volunteers. Yes, sir. Uh, the whole thing was looks like uh, she had to do a lot better uh, due diligence, and she had to... Okay, stop there. We're going to uh, pick it apart one, one piece at a time. A lot of you are going to be told by your boards, if you haven't already been told by your boards, let, oh, well, this is so small, we can do the due diligence ourselves. We don't have to go to our big-time accountants and spend money. Nine times out of ten, and that's wrong. Not the part that you're going to save money. One, you shouldn't be worried about saving the money because it's not your fucking money. Okay. But number two, you miss shit. Because the guy from KPMG who was 35 years in, in charge of the healthcare practice for KPMG for the southeastern United States hasn't been on a due diligence venture in 20, 25 years. That's number one. Number two, GAP, General Accepted Accounting Procedures, although they're roughly the same the last 40 or 50 years, there have been changes. And the guy that hasn't been in the field in 20, 25 years may or may not know them because he's got juniors that have been reporting to him, you know, first a, a regular uh, accountant and then a couple of assistant managers and a manager and a junior partner by the time he got to see it. because So it was pretty much... He was reside in himself that you would have caught all the mistakes, but now it's up to him to catch the mistakes. He may miss them. So you're right. They didn't do the proper due diligence. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that probably that team hasn't been in the field in a long time. And when you don't have the hammer of a KPMG or a Deloitte over your head, I'm not saying they don't take it seriously. They should take it seriously because they're getting free founder's equity, right? But they make mistakes. And the real thing is there is no penalty if they make a mistake. So go ahead. Broker, stop. We're going to piece it on. How many times have I said... Nine times out of ten, a broker's going to fuck you. Almost everybody in this room is using a broker. I'm going to say it again. Nine times out of ten, they're going to fuck you. And almost everybody in this room and everybody in me, Headville, are using brokers. Why? Because it's easier, ostensibly. Because they have all the, all the information in one source. That's what you think. 
Most of the deals that I see that are getting done are without a broker. But you're still going to use a broker. Why? Self-stop activities. Next, go ahead. Thank you. She didn't check with us. I can go. And he'd be singing self sabotaging activity all fucking day long. How many times did I tell you? In the healthcare, assisted living, home care, licensing transfers are hard. They vary from state to state and even sometimes county to county, province to province. And when you don't get the, li well, first of all, that's why with licenses are involved, 99 times out of 100, you're going to have to do a, uh, a company purchase because the company already has a license. So when you buy the company, the license transfers with it. Some of you, not in this room, some of you spent four, five, six months and then decide, oh, fuck, I'm better off. I can't do an asset purchase. <sighs> I guess I'm going to have to do a, a stock purchase. Now, five months have passed. You should be able to ascertain that in one phone call in 30 seconds. But you don't. We used to have mentees, because one of my partners at the Guthrie Group was an ex-McKinsey guy. And um, he used to uh, work with the guys on their first deal. And he, they, they have a grading system at McKinsey. There's five different testing things that used to be. And you, you grade them one to 10. And after about five or six months, Jeremy Knight is his name. Oh, he passed away now. And he said, I wouldn't rate any of these guys higher than two or two and a half on a McKenzie deal. Two, two and a half is your, your Down syndrome. Because of the lack of attention to detail. Remember I said, how many times I said, somebody's got to cross the T's. Somebody's got to dot the motherfucking I's, right? It's probably not going to be you. In fact, I don't want it to be you, but it's somebody on the fucking board. That's why these boards are in transition. The board you have on the first few deals is probably not going to be the same board you have on the next few deals. And then, oh, you get panicked. Your knickers in a twist because, oh, I gave them stock already. I know how you think. So you gave them stock. So what? That's the pay price to action for doing your first few deals. Continue, sir. And also, they don't have a flaw on the when they bring the monthly monthly expenses. Correct, correct. Uh, I'm not so sure that was attention to or um, self sabotaging activity. There's this sloppiness. When you, when you have to get a deal done overnight, you make mistakes. And when you want to do a deal, a deal bad enough, you do a bad deal because of you don't think it's self-sabotaging activities, but it is. Remember one of the things, the uh, trace of the losers, they're afraid of winning stroke losing. So you win. So now... Uh, so now what? Forget you have to run the fuckers. So now what? What are you going to do for your encore, asshole? Duh. And all this permeates your little half a uh, uh, cell brain. It's like when I said, I can't remember the last time I lost. And you can't remember the last time you won. And your subconscious knows that. Anything else? Okay, okay. Any other comments about, yes, sir? I actually think the seller was bullshitting, and I think she knew it because the way she just dropped her price, dropped her price, dropped her price, then asked for a meeting without an attorney. For me, that just settled. Yeah, uh, there's another case. Um, uh, it started at 800 grand, and uh, she bought it for 50. <laughs> now, you know, I. I I didn't inv invent uh, embarrassing offers. Oh, that was in the Middle East, a guy on a flying carpet invented embarrassing offers, uh, you know, uh, several thousand years ago. 
but um, the uh, but especially during Corona times, they understand their subconscious is telling them this is the seller. It's telling them we got an asshole that looks like he's a hot one. You, I mean, I'm gonna. I'm, Instead of, remember I told you, I've been in kitchen tables where the sun goes down and the sun goes up, and I'm still at the same kitchen table closing. And I don't leave until I sold somebody. Well, now they're the pushy insurance salesman, and they realize, contrary to what they tell you, that the private equity is chasing them, and they got four of them, uh, you're the only game in town. So they're going to stay with you until you say yes. So they start at 800, and they give it up for 50. That's where the market is. And a meathead over here tells me, and I did some checking, up. you're full of shit in the market you're in. You're either lying or stupid or both, because that is not the market. I made a few phone calls last night just to, I knew I was right. I said, and then they said, where is the kid? Introduce him to us. Where is the kid? Introduce I could do a hundred pad deal. 300 pad deals last night. I know what the market is and almost everything. You can buy all day long, three to five times EBITDA, except for some of the high tech shit. And yours is certainly not a high tech shit. Yours is the lowest tech, the lowest of the lowest, no teeth, a patch over their eye, and an uh, unloaded gun on their hip. Three to five. And they've been buying companies three to five for over 100 years. And you want to pay eight. You want to pay 10. You want to pay, t what the fuck? When I do double check and they say, hey, hey, can you send them our way, Dan? For old time's sake, I'll fuck them up the ass good. For old time's sake, Dan, I remember when I, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, but that's not the business I'm in anymore. It's our market, and anybody that tells you anything, and first of all, your board is going to, because they're not used to this market. One, where's the money coming from? Where's the equity? Was the first question, right? You, I'm not going to go through all that again. We beat that to death. They're not used to it. You've got, it's called leadership. In the, in, the, um, in the corona webinars that we've had, not the last one that we saw, we're only going to see that one, um, they all said, uh, how, do, uh, you know, how do you keep your board in line? How do you? Leadership. And most of you don't have any leadership experience. And being in business 20, 25 years doesn't mean you have any leadership. All that means is you have uh, one year, 20, 25 times experience. And remember what leadership is. It's me getting you and you and you to do what I want you to do when I want you to do it. That's leadership. You saw we, the three webinars from uh, Josh Kim. The longest webinar was seven minutes. The shortest webinar was four minutes. One with a banker, one with a chairman, and one with a prospective seller. Remember? Three, four minutes on the short side, seven minutes on the long side. And you're spending weeks. And I know I'm not having uh, early onset dementia. The difference between, let's just call it average five minutes. Five minutes and weeks, I don't compute. Five weeks and months, I compute less. Five weeks and days, maybe. Five minutes and hours, I can relate. Of course, he's Michelangelo, remember? He's a child prodigy, remember? Well, he's not either of those. But he wanted it more than life itself. And when he called his mom from the, uh, uh, close your phones off, please, uh, the uh, uh, airport in Washington, D.C., and say, hey, mom, I didn't want to be there and cause a scene, but I'll be back when I'm rich. Click. 17 years old. And he flew to San Francisco with no job. He taught himself to program 
over a long weekend and got a job at Google or Microsoft or somebody. Of course, programmers are full of shit. They're the highest order of dipshits. Any other comments about the, the woman? But all the comments you made are correct. That, but that's today. And she's done other deals, she, but she's done deals. The irony, that wasn't her first deal. That was her third or fourth deal, and she still got it done. But it was expensive, not expensive in money, expensive in uh, time and pride. She had to go back and you know, say that we did this wrong, we did that wrong, blah, 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 blah. Remember, I told you, one of the characteristics of the high-performance person, he can engage in self-deprecation. He can say, yeah, I made a mistake. He doesn't apologize or say he's sorry or explain. Yeah, I made a mistake, let's go back and do this. But him making a mistake is like water off a duck's back. You'll do anything humanly possible to avoid it. When I say you, I mean everybody. You'll do anything humanly possible to not be subjected to a mistake in front of people. Why? And because you have no self-esteem. Guys, you got to get over that. Otherwise, you're going to be five, six, seven, eight years. Five, six, seven, eight years. And I, you know, although I'm, ha I'm happy for you in five, six, seven, eight years, but I'm, I, don't, I don't give a shit. You know, I'm, I'm way by, past you. You had a question in the back. It's also suspicious. Suspicious? Yes. Well, you saying it's suspicious. That, 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 well, only you and I know about you, but I mean, you, you saying it's suspicious is fuck. That, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that, 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 that's rich. Go ahead. Um, that it's not a small part of the revenue they missed, but it's a sizable chunk of 21%. Correct. I mean, that must have come Thank up you. somewhere. Sounds like one of your old deals, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. But when you're in a hurry, and when you have a board, like the accountant, in-house accountant will think, well, the CFO must have covered that. And the CFO will think, well, oh, the in-house accountant must have covered that. And then the lawyer will say, well, and, uh, and then it's like this. And you make errors. And I've been there. I uh, Believe me, I've been there. In the 22 deals I did many years ago, which Marcus Bauer has broken uh, last year with uh, 23 deals, um, there was a couple deals that I've accused of being self-serving, just so I could keep, not the record going, because I didn't know it was a record then, self-serving just to keep uh, in, the, in the papers, et cetera, et cetera, when it wasn't, it wasn't self-serving. Uh, maybe they weren't as good as the other 20 deals we did. I mean, that's easy to see by the numbers. But when you use what I love is a blended rate, when you use a blended rate, then they all look terrific because the two are uh, massaged into uh, the 20 great ones. Correct. That's exactly what he did. Uh, his third, his second or third acquisition was, well, he's in the grooming business, pun intended, dog shit. <laughs> and, uh, but he just kept making acquisitions because he, he believed, uh, not because he's a criminal attorney, but he believed if he just keep, it's harder to hit a moving target. If he kept moving, he'd get to it. And he did. And now that second or third acquisition in the string of seven or eight that he's he completed, I mean, pales in complexion. Nobody, you know, nobody cares about it. And, but if you sit there and worry about, oh, I fucked this one up, and you, and, and, and you stew on it, it will be meaningful because it may be the only deal you'll ever do. But I remember the first day I made $2,000, which was a big fucking deal to me. 1971, I think. Fuck, that was a lot. I, I was living large. And then that's, and I was going to graduate school. Went to go to law school, and then I made ten thousand dollars in a day. And I thought, well, that fucking two thousand dollars was chicken shit, you know, it was jump change. And I went out, I bought a new car, and I bought five new suits. And I mean, I just, um, and I can still, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. But once you start to be successful, and you use, you use those. Because again, your subconscious doesn't know you're full of shit. 
And uh, now, now I, I don't use those anymore. Once in a while, I think back upon the hundred million dollar day because that was a pretty good day. But um, it's it's like the best sex you ever had times a thousand or a million, and it lasts several days. The feeling it does that I mean the uh, when when uh, Roberto bought Sally and I a drink about a year ago at the Loa Hotel and. and uh, uh, just after we made 70 million. And uh, Sally uh, couldn't remember what Roberto looked like. And when he, uh, my back was to the door, and Sally's sitting here and says, There's a guy with a smile about that wide <laughs> walking in the door. And she's got dark skin. Yes. I said, That's Roberto. That's my half breed boy. And I mean, he had a smile like this for six months, literally. But the guys, his employees, his four key employees, he gave 10 million bucks to. Two and a half, two and a half, two and a half, two and a half, which is unheard of. And he, those guys, but that, that's why he was able to do 11 deals during Corona. His, those four guys never went home from about April 1 till November 1. They never went home. But they did 11 deals. He says it was, uh, but I mean, uh, oh yeah. When you say he made 70 million, like he pulled out 70 million? No, he didn't pull out. He had 70 million. He could have pulled, he could have wrote a check, but he didn't. Um, yeah, I mean, he just, he, um, and I mean, and, and, and again, poorness rubs off, but so does uh, w richness. That's not, a, I don't know if that's a word. But I mean, he, he now belongs to, to two or three clubs in London. He can't, not London, I mean in New York, he can't join the Harvard Club or the Princeton Yale Club because he didn't, go, he didn't go to any school. He went through about, he got, a, got kicked out of school when he was 15-ish. Um, but he, the, the, the clubs that cost big money, that have big waiting lists, he's a member of all of them now. No waiting lists, I mean, and the... Um, he bought another car. He bought a place in the Hamptons uh, for about, uh, that was on the market for, I think, $14 million. He paid nine. Uh, Hamptons is a place you go to in New York where rich people go on the weekend. Um, he's, you know, but he's the only guy that's ever asked me, how many times am I going to get my 20 grand back? And then, how many does 20 go into 70 million? But he, I'm proud as shit of these guys. Okay, go ahead. Hey, this is uh, this is a deal I did. Is this is a is this a building thieving deal or? Yes. Okay, I will understand it better then. So this is a this is a assisted living center. Um, the list price on it was eight hundred ninety nine thousand. Um, I made him an offer of seven hundred thousand. We settled it seven hundred twenty five thousand. Um. These are the gross revenues for the This is the one you bought right after? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Now, these are the gross revenues that they had for the last three, uh, four, well, three years and then a year to date. <coughs> Corona brought it down quite a bit. But this, this couple was 70, in their 70s, mid-70s. They were, they were just done. And so they, they, had, they had financials from before that. Actually, the highest year they had was 650000 And they just let it decline. They, they, uh, everything was still on paper. They have, they have no software, um, in their systems. And so it just declined year after year. Um, th these were their EBITDAs. Um, and what we did, uh, the county assessed the property at 699,000. And so, which is usually in our area about 20% less. We didn't, we didn't have it professionally appraised, but that, that's what it usually ends up at. So we gave it a property value of 850,000. We did a uh, bank loan of uh, 600000 and then we, uh, we seller financed um, 125 So it looks like 80-20? Something like that, yeah. Yep. And um, Bank had no problem loaning on it because it was way under the value of the property. Um, the, the margin is usually that low in this business. No. So I, another thing I should say is is this amount of money. The, the, 
they had two properties. The 20 acre piece, they lived on it, uh, 10 acres with a house, and then the assisted living was set on 10 acres. And so we purchased the 10 acres, somebody else pushed, purchased their house and their property, actually before we did. And um, this amount of money serviced the debt on the entire property. So over $62,000 a year is what it was servicing. So that, that already made the property payment before the, the finances. Um, the, the net. They, they lived off this property, is what they did. All their gas, their food, their everything came out of, of yes, but we still ran it on the, the low end of the numbers. This is at a, this, these numbers, um, the last year, they had, this, so this is a 16 bed facility. It actually has 17, but it only has a license for 16. So we, we have another bed that we can bring, we can bring temporary uh, residents in. Short term, I think we, we gotta keep it under a month. And then they have to discharge and then come back in, but it's another revenue source that we have. And then, um, this was at, these numbers were at a 77% occupancy. Uh, when we, when I first looked at this deal, they had, I think 13 residents out of 16. And then, um, when we finally closed the deal, they had 11. And then one week later, one died. So <laughs> we're at 10 right now. So we've got, a, but we have a list of eight residents ready to move in right now. So it's, it's not an issue filling it. it. They they just they weren't aggressive enough to fill it. Um, are we filled them up right now? We are. We have. We we're, we're having a nurse issue. We got we have fire nurse. For every resident that comes in, you have to get them assessed. Our nurse isn't showing up doing the assessment so that we can actually bring them in. Um, so we 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 fired her. We can't necessarily fire her until we have another one in place because it's the only way we can administer medication underneath her license. So, so it's, it's the nurse's license. It's the nurse's license that you administer the medication under. So, we're, in the next week, we should be getting a new nurse. Which we have three in every in my state. We have we went in and we remodeled um, three of the units and the entire so are these like uh, a fourplex or a house or it's, one, a it's just one what's one big building it's a big long building um with about four units on one side and five on the other and uh, one is a suite um it's got a kitchen and a, and a bed and, and a uh, kitchen its own bathroom its own uh, bedroom every other one is two beds to a room they share one bathroom uh, it was built in 2002. It's, it's in really nice shape. We just went in, repainted it, new fixtures, uh, flooring, uh, got it up to to par. Um, and we've got three residents ready to move in. They have to they have to quarantine individually in each room for 14 days, and then we can move them into population. So it, it's it's going to take a little bit to get completely filled. But we have we have eight. We have three ready to go right now, and a list of eight wanting to move in. And this is that the other thing that they were doing is they had their average per bed is 3100 per bed that's what that's what these numbers are run off of the state average i'm running out of room the state average is 3800 and all three that we are bringing in are at the higher price we're not necessarily going to kick the people out that aren't paying that price we'll slowly attrition them out but um Every time we mention 3,800 to 4,200, it's not even an issue. So, you might have like about 10 times a year. Right? No. You guys actually- well, that's, that's if you include this price, though. The way, the way that I made the deal is I broke it off of. I, basically, I bought the business for 125000 I bought the property for 600000 is the way that I kind of made the deal. So, uh, I bought it based off this number, which was three times EBITDA for the for the revenue, and then. Would you expect that number to service both? This 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 number is already being serviced because out of this number, they were servicing a sixty-two thousand dollar a year, a one point two million dollar loan that they had on the whole property was being serviced out of this number that doesn't include in this number. This is strictly net revenue. Well, this is EBITDA. It's not net, but. It's one point five times your net. That's income from the actual, like the, the business. This is this the, is this is the final net. That that's the gross revenue. Is there a property value? This this real estate. What's that? This is a real estate price for the building. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 when we broke it up, basically we paid six hundred thousand for the real estate, one hundred twenty-five thousand for the business. And the bank kind of like combined them together. No, the bank the bank gave me six hundred thousand for the business, and then the seller financed the, the revenue, one hundred twenty-five thousand. The bank wanted, you know, same thing, 10, 20 percent. So the way that I fixed that is I had the seller hold that much, basically. So that was our that was our first deal. Um, any questions? Any questions? Like, what was the big business you think when you put this in market? What's that? Yeah, and for the for the market, what was the big business that you think when you put this? It does have a forty percent margin. If you if you actually like I say, this is a it's been a declining business over the over the years. If you if uh because they just weren't up to speed. If you punch in this number, okay, if you can if you can get up to a ninety percent occupancy at this rate, it brings it up to a uh I think it's a seven hundred thousand dollar a uh a year, which um is damn near. 30, 16 times 16 times 12. 615. 615, you said. Yeah, 16 beds. We have 16 beds. We have 17 beds with a license for 16. It's a 16 times 30 times 12. 700,000. Would you like the max? Right. Like I say, we have an extra bed that we facilitate. We bring pages in and out. That alone, and that brings in. If you keep it occupied, it brings in almost six thousand dollars a month because you can charge more for the intermittent. Uh, people going on vacation, they want to drop their their, grand, their mom or dad off. That's uh, you can charge a premium for that. So it ends up turning about seven hundred thousand uh, with that included. So we have a EBITDA at that at seven hundred twenty percent. Well, it, if so, if uh, I'm having do seven hundred thousand. Uh, What's your money? In 2019, the expenses were uh, 360,000. Yeah, but your expenses go up as you bring in uh, more people, right? Or it's going to stay the same. You just keep so we're increasing. Back. We're going to increase the cost up to 3,800. But your expenses stay the same. Expenses stay the same. Besides food, yeah. I mean, literally the only expense that goes up is food. So expenses uh, like stay the same. Let's just stay the same. Uh, staff stays the same. You might have to put an extra person on it at 16. Right now we're running, we're, we're, we're running 40 hours a day to keep it, uh, staffed. Um, you said expenses were how much annually? Uh, what, three, what is it, 300? Well, like I say, you, you don't see here is the. Right. If it's 300,000, then you'd be netting 400 net if you're running at 700. If you're running at 700. It would jump that much because if you double it, it, because and that's why see it was at that point at one time these if you if you only stare at this number it doesn't look that great but if you realize what it is and what it can be they just let it decline to a certain point but the building was in great shape. Okay, this is the opposite of a QLA deal because we don't buy we don't want to buy property. It's interesting because they don't just do funerals, uh, and this is the interesting. Thing we liked about this one is that they also transport bodies all around the country. So someone for medical research. So someone dies here, and they're giving themselves to medical research. Um, this business will come and collect them, store them, and whatever, take them to the university hospital that they're looking at. Uh, and interestingly, they changed the laws in the UK. Um, that you used to have to sign up to give your body for medical research. Now you need to sign up so that you don't get used. Your body doesn't get used for medical oh, research. Oh shit! I was the first. As soon as I found out, when did that change? It was quiet, wasn't it? The yeah. first thing I did was get online and put my sign my wife and me up to not get. Used. So you have to opt out. The person's yeah. opt in. Yeah, which means oh, there's going to be a lot more. That's, 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 that's net scum trick marketing. That's marketing. I do that business, all the time. That's the UK. <laughs> That's the UK. So um, there's going to be a lot more happening in that area. So a lot of bodies to transport and store. Um, so there's potential in this. In this. So the, the last year was 514,000 
revenue. And the, the owner's using it as his, basically his piggyback. Well, we took the book, you know, the, the book number for the EBITDA, which is 50, pretty much. Um, and it's not, um, we need to rent back the freehold, the, the premises off him. He owns the premises and he's paying himself the rent. But that's after all the costs and everything. And after, you know, we need to employ somebody to take over from what he's doing. So that's not the EBITDA now, but that's the EBITDA it would be post acquisition. Um, he's got two branches, as I said. Um, there's two, in, two entrenched funeral operators in this town, in mean, this county really. One's a national, um, very, very high priced. One's a, a very strong independent with 30 branches, also very high priced. This, the price point is, is maybe um, the average funeral for these guys is maybe two and a half thousand. For the other, the two big guys, it's probably four and a half thousand. So this so that suits the nuts. That's all inclusive. Yeah, you have one get hearse, one round? limousine, a okay, few one limousine, one hearse, coffin, the funeral, you know, storage, transport from your home. Not flowers. Not flowers. Cremation. Crem 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 all your costs, all your bait. So, they, so they reuse the coffin? Yep. Yeah, no, are they burning them in the coffin? Yeah. Oh. 100 pounds. Oh, yeah, they, okay, they're like plywood or cheap. Yeah, okay, okay. cheap. But um, you can pay for a better coffee. Oh, wait, well, I, I understand it, but I mean, some of the crematoriums don't use coffins. They burn them in, I, I want to say, say gunny sacks, but I mean... <clears throat> yeah, they like to they like to use the coffins here. Well, well, okay. So. No eternal light. <laughs> oh, I eternal light. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, the eternal light. Talk about that. It's not take. It's not okay. Take well, I mean, uh, you have satin, and the, the coffin is all you know, twenty grand coffin. I mean, it's uh, not gold, but you know, it looks gold, and I mean, uh, mahogany, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> um, and you ask the family and. They're easy sales when they're I'm not suggesting this. You do this, you do. But they're easy sales because they're grieving and all that shit. And you say, uh, 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 no, you probably wouldn't want it. And so then the husband will say, well, we didn't want what? The eternal light. And so then uh, Margaret, R.B. Margaret, Margaret says, well, my, wife, my mother, she would like an eternal light. And then Margaret says, well, uh, at what price? And then the, 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 the salesman is making a quick calculation is this an 8,000 pound eternal light couple or an 800 pound eternal light couple? So he makes the decision. The same light. Okay, same, it's exactly the same light. 2,000 pound, it's a, your, your mother will have an eternal light in your coffin forever. And then my, uh, the, my uh, the daughter, the daughter always caves. And uh, well, I like that. And then the, the, the RV, 2,000 quid for that old fucking bitch? <laughs> Fucker. Uh, but it's the same light, and it's not eternal. Yeah, it la it battery powered. Correct. Yeah. It lasts. But I mean, I used to be in this business. And of course, we would never recommend that our salesmen use this. Never. But I could just see Wellington in there selling eternal lights from now until Christmas. <laughs> not the Christmas that's happening tomorrow, but now until next Christmas. But, but I mean, have you found out in the crematorium that uh, then you're producing the ashes for them afterwards? Yeah, well, yeah. Okay, we'll well, 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 okay. There's a, what's, what else is the crematorium used for? Um, well, there's a range of... This is, they, these don't own the cre crematorium. They, they use local ones. They're okay, local. so they don't own the crematorium. Yeah. So, but the crematorium, animals, humans, if you think you're getting your granny's ashes back, what are you smoking? I mean, I, I've been down this road. I've had the wrong ashes delivered, and then DNA, when they sue the crematorium, it's Spido's ashes, not Granny's. It's a great business. I can believe that. That's a great business. Yeah. And uh, these guys all look like out of a, uh, a fucking uh, uh, Jack the Ripper horse uh, movie. Uh, pasty skin, you know, uh, the shirt's too big, 
like this. You fit, you fit right in. Yeah. You fit right in. Since <laughs> you fill out my shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So that's it. So um, agreed price is two hundred thirty-six thousand. Um. So you're paying uh, five times. Just under less. Okay. Just under two hundred thousand on day one. Uh, Thirty-six. Two years later. Um, that's it. So that's basically our price. We've got 165,000 uh, from the bank or the lender, not really a bank. Um, we're paying nothing for the debt in the first year. So no repayment, no interest. First year's interest paid by the government is some regional thing. So we shouldn't really have got this. But uh, yeah, um, that's it. Because we're keeping we're keeping the um, the business going. We you know we managed to get this support. Um, but over the first two years, um, the average of the debt service is twenty seven thousand. Yeah. So. It's about one point seven. Right. Is this from a couple or a? It's a guy, seventy-four years old, needs to retire to get tired, and um, he's got some staff. He's got the, you know some younger staff who do a lot of it. We just we need someone to replace him in the office. So uh, do some of it's, not, it's not like an undertaker. We're gonna have to make the body look pretty and yeah, we do all that. So but they're still cremating them. And, oh, and, and, the, and a lot when, when we were in the business, it's if you if you viewed the body, open casket, okay, we pretty pretting them up as much as we could. Yeah. Okay, like yeah. it's a much that's, that's what you do, yeah. Okay. But if they're not, if it's a closed casket, it's just a burn job. Yeah, you have to the most common thing now is viewing well. Corona aside, viewing, make them look nice. The family comes and looks as a, as a uh, says their final farewells. Then, then At, uh, you know, like a little prayer thing in the, yeah, in the then, chapel. Yeah. yeah, no, no, before the before the funeral, like a few days before, before okay. make the body look viewable. Yeah, viewable, viewing. Yeah, the family <clears> come <throat> view the body, and then then you have the funeral a few days later. Most common here now is cremation uh, or burial. Um, with corona, there's no viewings. If it's a corona death, then no viewings. So what about this uh, organ farming issue? Uh, yeah, so this is another part of the business. So this is, they, they do, you know, a certain number of funerals, regular funerals. If it's a, if it's a collection um, for research, they'll drive to Edinburgh or South Coast or wherever, get the body store it, deliver it to the hospital or the university where they're doing the research. And that's quite a, that's quite a big job. There's ambulances basically just traveling around the country collecting and delivering bodies. Um, so that's a big part of the business as well. So we that's kind of but now we still have a gap between the purchase price and what you get. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's a 35k missing. Um, we've got... Twin, got um, Twenty five thousand from a like a business startup loan. Um, so let's put that in here. Let's see, twenty five thousand startup loan. Um, six percent. Yeah, that's average for the first two years. Oh, well, how many years do you have to pay it off? That's five years. Okay. But um, basically, we're paying nothing the first year at all. So okay, so it's, it's quite a high, yeah, it's quite a high rate of interest, but we think we could obviously you could refinance within the first two years. Um, that's six percent, and then we can, you know, I can put in ten ten thousand of my own. Um, 
um, there's 50,000 in the bank in the business. In the, uh, so you're buying the corporation. Yeah, but because all these contracts, all these medical contracts, hospital contracts, they've got a lot of prepaid funeral plans, maybe about £700,000 in prepaid plans that people paid in advance at the time. So we can get all those really quite easily if we buy the limited company. Is there any licensing in what? Not in this country, nothing, okay. nothing required. But there's, there's these contracts and they're government related, so well, they're they would be insured. National <laughs> Yeah, so you, they've already been paid for it, but you're going to have to perform the services for them. Yeah. They already collect the money. Uh, no, no, they, <clears> the, <throat> the money's held in trust. Okay. Prepaid and stuff. So it's, we show the death certificate, then they release the funds. Yeah. How much is in the trust? Um, I could tell you it's about seven hundred thousand. And how quickly is the old old fellow moving on? We think we're going to do this next month in January. Post deal? Is he going to stay on for? Oh yeah, a month? he can stay on. He doesn't do an awful lot. He's, he lives very very locally. Um, he's still motivated to help, help us because he's got this deferred thing. And there's no time. We're not paying this monthly. We're paying it all in lump sum at the end of two years. So... Why didn't you offer him just 165k? Um, I don't know. We, we went back and forth. Not too, not, too, not too long. But we sort of went back and forth over the price. Then we also negotiated the, the rent. He wanted to keep, you know, get some rent, and we I sort of balanced it out basically what was his rent, and then we wanted more rent, so I reduced the price. And, and In a perfect world, what would you, what, what would you do? No ball or what? Um, yeah, I think 190 or something like that. Probably not <laughs> low ball enough. Yeah, but effectively you're buying it for 150k because it's like 50k in the bank. Um, I? Yeah, there's 50 in the bank. There's 50 in the bank. So for fees, we can... I, can I mean, so really you're buying it for three times the EBITDA? Yeah, we can pay ourselves back with this. Uh, pay, uh, pay the back this and get the, the, the fees, the legal fees paid from the, from the cat. We talk to the lawyers. They're going to bill us once the deal's done. Okay. So we can use the cash in the bank. Um, how long has it been in operation? Uh, it's only five years, five, six years. And based on the research that's done by the investors, $40 million is only going to get them past the year. I mean, after 2005, they're out of money, basically, mm -hmm. which is not enough. So they're, they're an operating deficit. And so they'll need future investment from 2006 and beyond. So we were just looking at the different exhibits and trying to figure out what the differences were. But the first exit exhibit tells us that they will need an addition half a billion dollars of investments before they can, 500 million. Yeah. Before they can actually turn money out of the company in eight years into the future. If it all works to plan. Yes. And they never always work to plan. Business plan doesn't work. I mean that's why there's the uh, A round, B round, C round, D round of, of finance. And normally the guys that put up the money initially uh, are taken out in the, the, uh, the subsequent rounds of uh, raising because they've got their ROI that they were looking for and then they leave the, the big pop to the sixth, seventh, or 20th investor. So and Sierra are some of the smartest guys on the street. They're really super bright uh, and they've made a lot of money. So if they're in there on the first, um, they, it's because it's, they've got a, and they've got their own biotech team, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so they're potential, potential. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, the numbers never are even remotely close to what they think they are. But that's a shitty deal, isn't it? Hmm? A shitty deal. Well, well, it's a shitty deal based on what we're looking for. But I mean, the, the return, uh, uh, and I, I haven't tracked it back, but I'm sure if, uh, if uh, Sierra's still in the deal today, I'd be surprised. They will have gotten out, and they will have gotten 
two to five to six more rounds of investment. To, and it's a greater fool theory. They, you know, the Sierra sells to uh, KKR, and then KKR sells to uh, uh, First Boston, and then Boston sell, and, and that's how these, uh, the private equity uh, funds work. Chris, Chris's question was, if they're selling already 60% to Sierra, how are they going to raise another 500 million if they only have X percentage left? And then what you're saying is that you keep reselling the same amount, the same Well, no, 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 they're going to sell the 60 to somebody else. When they, when, when they have a, the second round, after this round, they're going to have 100% either Sierra will or won't sell all or part of the 60, but that's for them to get a return. And Arcadian has got 40 left, so they can sell all or part of the 40. But that 60, unless, is gone. And so it's a shitty deal based on they don't have enough to sell anymore to raise additional money, unless one of their patents or one of the things come to fruition and the thing's worth, you know, tens of billions. Um, but on the face of it, they don't have enough uh, extra to, um, to fund their idea, unless they're, they're, they were so positive <clears throat> that at the end of the first year or at the end of two years, whenever they run out of money, um, and th th to talk to these high-tech guys, these inventor types, they're always positive, but they hardly ever come to fruition. But some of the ideas, like cold fusion, <clears throat> which still hasn't been solved, Cold Fusion has been raising money, big money, from very, very smart people. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive Sierra's invested in Cold Fusion for 40 years. I mean, there's been billions and billions and billions because when <clears throat> they ultimately, and they're always riding on the shoulders of somebody else's uh, uh, idea, but when Cold Fusion happens or a similar derivative of Cold Fusion happens, it's going to be worth a trillion dollars, trillions. And that's why they keep on playing. But until that happens, it's a greater fool theory. But the the first uh, the value the first projection uh, uh, of muted future investments is by the management of Arcadia itself, and they are saying we're going to need five hundred million dollars in eight years, and we are willing to sell you sixty percent for forty. So. So they're trying to do the valuation if 60% for 40, instead of paying 60% for 800 million would be, no, I mean 60% of 800 million is what, four, six, eight, 480 million. So they're saying you're getting a 10th of Exactly. That's the, that's the sale, that's, that's the pitch. But what their pitch is, or their hope is at Sierra, and two years from now, when they're going to run out of money in a year, to sell for a lot more than a sixty percent, for a lot more than forty million. And but I mean, it's it's still a greater fool theory. It's you know, but eventually, <clears throat> it's like Facebook. Um, they um, their idea. They must have had six or seven rounds of funding in Facebook. I think Google the same. And it was because all the funds have different criteria. Uh, Sierra is looking for a 25% IRR, which they don't get, but they, that's, what they're, that's their benchmark. They're looking to invest in this and get 25% IRR for two years. So they put in 60 million, 25%, one year is 30, 30, so roughly they're going to double their money in two years. Right. So the thing, this thing is still going to be going in two years to be able to sell it for a little bit more. Correct. And when, um, and these inventions, these ideas rarely stay on the same plane. They, they morph, they morph, they morph in this, and they sometimes they pivot all, all together. They're going to find it like a, uh, the, the guys that funded the DNA experiments from the early 50s, when the, the, uh, the three PhDs, two from Oxford, one from someplace else, were getting funded uh, to, to, to discover DNA. They weren't looking for DNA in their search. 
they discovered the DNA chain, okay? And the money back in the 50s didn't go to the professors, it went to the school. It's changed now. Now, the professors will have left Cambridge and set up an office across the street and got rich, but back in those days, they were, you know, it was science for the pure science of it. Now it's not, or I should say, it's a lot less than it used to be. I mean, we had real guys. If anybody could have raised money, it was Einstein and shit like that. I mean, he never raised a penny. I mean, he, he died uh, destitute. So this could be a good deal if we think that these guys will still be, not necessarily solve the problem, but still showing promise for the next couple of years. And the longer it is, the smaller the promise has to be, but the payload has to be greater. The payload, so it's, 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 in, it's not in proportion to what you'd think. So they may be able to sell 40% for a billion dollars next time around. It's depend. Well, it it, de it depends on what the the the, um, the results they're they're producing. And then there's a whole game that uh, and unfortunately one of my kids, Chris uh, Josafowitz, who left here, he went to Silicon Valley, raised several hundred million dollars on a deal that already failed at Cambridge. It had failed. They put it away in the dustbin. Not once, not twice, but three fucking times. It's, you, Three deals that failed at Cambridge, he sold to Silicon Valley. And then when he got caught, the castle man taught me. Oh, oh they all. I mean, you're not going to come back and tell anybody you made a lot of money, you lying Persian piece of shit. You're going to say, when you go to jail, when you go to jail and your little nephew is fucking you in the ass, oh, the castle man, the ca that's the only time I ever hear about from anybody is when they get in trouble. The castle man. And, and, the, um, the, uh, and that same Christian Safovich kid, um, he, he put it on YouTube. Just what I'm saying, the castle man taught me. Uh, and then he went to uh, 1990 uh, Desert Storm. He bid for the security contract. This is all over the internet. He bid for the security contract for uh, the green zone. The green zone is the, the safe zone, supposedly. Um, around, for, the, yeah, around, the, around the ambassador and all the bullshit. He, he bid on a three-year contract, he, uh, and he got the three-year contract uh, for 740-some million dollars. He was 500 million lower than the next bid. Or the next bid above, yeah, he was, five, the, the, he was the lowest bid by 500 million. <clears throat> He got the contract, Congress, uh, whoever uh, issued the con contract, I'm sure it's the U.S. government. And then he went and hired G4, the largest security firm in the world. It's now called something else, G4. And he paid G4 350 million bucks and kept 400 million. And then there was a congressional investigation, a scandal that was leak leaked and all this shit. And then the contract came up again. He bid on it again. And the federal government was so embarrassed, they gave him the contract again. But th this was legal, right? What? This was legal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely legal. And, uh, uh, he, uh, and this time when he won the contract, he went back to G4, tried to hire him again. G4 told him to fuck off, took the contract away from him, uh, maybe physically, and they gave him $50 million, and they said, here, go on your way. Yeah, yeah, and, and he didn't file suit. He now runs a hedge fund in Boston, and he's changed his name to Chris, Chris Conley. And I told him when he was here, J Josephowitz, that dog won't hunt. Well, in fact, a lot of your names don't hunt. You don't think it makes any difference anymore, but you're so wrong. They, have people, they go down the list, I'm not, who, 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 ah, fuck him, he's a Chinaman. I mean, I'm telling you. They go down the, next, next, next. And he, but he, he, he got the government contract and the name of Christopher Connolly, which is the name I gave him, and his mother and father hate me. Oh, uh, why? Did he give him a new name? No, because, I mean, he's a, his dad's a lawyer. He's a millionaire now. Uh, and his mom is an engineer. And they're of Polish descent, Chisofowicz. And they're proud Polacks that fought in the 866 war and all. I mean, eh. And now he's Christopher Conley. 
And he won the contract twice. The guys, the dog of war guys. That movie, The Dog of War? Yeah. My boys. I can teach you how to make billions tomorrow. But you always, not always, almost always, you, you, oh, I, get, I really need that extra 300 million. And then that's the 300 million you go to jail. We got plenty. We got tons and tons of these guys that have made billions. After the wall came down in 90, Estonia, Lithuania, Romania, Czechoslovakia, almost all those countries, the guys came here in the early 90s at the seminar in cash, in suitcases. The number two, three, five, and seventh richest guys in Hungary are my boys. In Romania, the three richest guys are my boys. In Lithuania, the top four guys are my boys. In Estonia, three out of the top seven guys are my boys. In Ukraine, all five of the top richest guys are my boys. Russia, five of the top 15 guys are my boys, Putin's boys. Why do you think the Medell cartel from Colombia sent their top two, the number two and three guy here in the 90s? They try to, because they, corruption, everybody knows everybody, and they try to convince me, they try to pay me a million dollars a day to go to Colombia to fix their, um, uh, their cash flow problem. And I, I, I was going to give them money to the Catholic Church, the Vatican, blah, 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 long story. And uh, the, uh, finally, we couldn't do it anyway legally, where I wasn't going to be uh, uh, considered uh, involved in money laundering, so I didn't do it. But they give me credit taking their business from a $5 billion a year business to a $30 billion a year business, the Medina Drug Cartel. Five to 30. And they sat in this room, uh, uh, his name was Roberto as well. He sat next to Sally, right? Let's see, Sally normally sit about here. He sat there. And then they came back again when I said no, because you don't normally tell them no. He came with another guy, who I guess was the muscle guy, but I didn't think so. I said, I'm, I'm not going. I'm not going. But he learned some extra shit. And... Some secrets? No, no, nothing that you don't know. Now, but, but they did it. When I say pull the trigger, they, I mean they literally pulled the trigger. <laughs> My model is the mafia model. Mine's no different than the, um, the Gotti model, the, the lawyer, the guy that's doing veterinary clinics. He says, this, uh, this is the John Gotti model. That's, I mean, there's no question it works. There's none whatsoever, except most of the guys don't have the balls to do it. And literally the balls. Balls or brains, 90-10. But all those, uh, Lithuania, all those guys, they all know me. Well, they sent another guy here uh, last year who was, uh, you know, not in the, the gangster part of Hungary, but he heard what uh, Peter did. And then he asked one, oh, God, and then they said, oh, yeah, yeah, he went, he went to the castle man. That's what I used to be called. The castle man. He says, you know, and Peter didn't, you know, didn't pay a bribe, which he didn't. But all those guys know who the fuck I am. Because it works. It happens. And some of the sellers will even be stupid enough um, to say that they'll have the reverse clawback. Remember I told you about the clawback? They'll have a reverse clawback. And they'll guarantee you 15, 20% ROI. Jump on that because it never happens. Because in 50 years, I've never seen a, a reverse clawback work past the first claw. Because he's got his whole team working like a ball buster to make that first clawback of 6% or 7% equity for him. And he burns them out, and they never make the second, third, or fourth, or fifth clawback. It does never happen. I've only seen the, the first claw bag get maybe twice in my 50-year career. You know, how, you know how, long, how hard it is to keep... It's, it's like, okay, Super Bowl. Has Super Bowl already been... No, when's Super Bowl? I know, but when is it, the Super Bowl? Okay, Super Bowl. Or playoffs. They had playoffs already? Okay, in the playoffs, why are the scores in the playoffs, and they seem to score at will, the football teams, at will. 
They march up and down the field like it's no fucking problem. And why do they, in the Super Bowl, when they get down to the last game of this, uh, the, the, maybe the last game of their career, why do they seem to score at will? Because they're going 110% out. And you can't play a 22-game season or a 19-game season, whatever it is, 100% out, all out. Your body falls to shit. And they score at will during the Super Bowl. They have a two-minute drill. And they go up and down the field like uh, they got Vaseline up their ass. Boom, boom, boom. And the two-minute drill. Because they've been trained to score in two minutes, no matter what. Because they're going all out. They can't run a football team or any kind of athletic team 100% all out the whole season. The seasons are too long. They fall to shit now. Well, when the clawback, you'll see him operate maybe three, four months 100% all out. And then they fall to shit. Because human nature, they just, you know, the body can't, and in their case, it's not the physical body normally, it's the emotional body. They can't hold it, hold out. I mean, hold up, excuse me. And that's why for 10 years, I was 100% focused for 10 whole years. 10 whole years. And I'm, you know, so far, some of you have been out three months, two months, five months, ten months since the seminar, right? You haven't been able to do 100% all out just for those months. The, you know, the little pervert thinks he has, but he hasn't. You understand what I'm saying? It's not easy to get a gold fucking medal at the Olympics, even though these are going to be five-year Olympics. And do you realize how much that fucked up the careers of these athletes? Having trained world-class athletes, I can, I'm glad I'm not, on, I'm not training any of these guys right now. Fuck! Their whole life, for one time in summer of 2020, it's canceled. Some people have 6, 8, 12, 15 years training, and it's canceled. Fuck. Uh, you, the guys, remember I said, the guys that get focused first and stay the longest, remember? I mean, Marcus, don't listen to me. You probably don't listen to me anymore, Marcus. But he does, because I talked to him. But, I mean, he's been focused since August of 2010. August of 2010. And he's made the second most money of all the kids during that period. Second most. He should have been the first most, but anyway, the second most. When you're doing, I mean, like this year, 17 deals, last year, 20, 23 year deals. When you do 40 deals in two years, you are a humping motherfucker. Okay. Um, the, um, I want, uh, what was the case I was just listening to? You, you hadn't figured out the, your case yet. The one you were doing? Yeah. You had figured it out. Well, the, well no, no, okay, no. Uh, let's see. The deal in here was... Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, the, the, the chicken fuck deal. The, which, no, don't show them that one because it's, it's not a QLA. It's a, it's a good deal for you, but it's not a QLA. I don't want to, these guys are easily enough confused already without you showing them a deal that you made money on that wasn't QLA. Um, let's see. Um, and the second deal wasn't uh, either. Do you, you didn't, I had to listen to your second deal. Uh, it's, it's, it's an am by penis deal, another one. Okay, we, okay we'll, we'll forget that one too. Uh, you guys... Oh, I got more funeral jokes. You look like a mortician. Pasty white skin. I mean, I mean, uh, he, he looks like um, the Adams family. Okay. I got, I got more jokes about more. I used to be in there, the roll-up of crematoriums. You're getting, you're getting Fido's ashes back, not your granny's. 
For any of you that have deluded yourself into thinking you're getting granny's ashes, I got a bridge I can sell you right over here in Guthrie Lock. Because when I was asking you, you know, uh, who, who, anyway, I don't, I don't need to get into that, all that. But uh, what, the eternal light. The eternal light. I mean, you, you, now that I've given you a couple of pointers here, a couple of tiny little bit of tips, I mean, you can add uh, some, something to your repertoire to sell the eternal light to your uh, unsuspecting uh, clientele, as they say. Um, so you're going you're gonna, you're gonna to get up? Song and dance it. I like cemeteries. I like crematoriums. I like funeral parlors. Not just for the extra sex you get, uh, uh, necrophiliac. And not just for that. I can tell you a story that the, uh, the, the, the Big Ten University will go unnamed, that one of the uh, star uh, all uh, um, league linebackers used to bring his team through to get a little extra sex before the big games. That's right off dead people, kids. But they've been fucking dead people in Persia for 5,000 years. We didn't invent it over here. No, well, well it is the cradle of a lot of life. I, I, I agree with that. But the, the, uh, the, the, the jokes, uh, the... Uh, are about uh, the mummification process. Uh, I know, no, I know that. But the, the joke is, the reason why the mummification process is to take two or three months. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm surprised you guys didn't, ever, uh, you didn't ever mummified anybody in Persia, right? No, no, okay. And you were his, you're his cousin, right? No. You're his cousin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I told you that I used to live next to the uh, daughter of the doctor of, of the Shah, who came with just $20 and a T-shirt on their back. And then the brother says, well, what about the train loads of gold we took? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Okay. So, in addition to uh, funerals, this business actually uh, transports bodies uh, for medical research up and down the country. So, um, it's a funeral business and transportation business. Um, most recent turnover is 514,000. EBITDA is 50,000, and that's a conservative one. That's our EBITDA, not the seller's EBITDA. So that's after um, rent, rent back of the freehold, the property, um, and we've adjusted for replacing the owner and the, the cost of replacing the owner post sale. Um, agreed price is 236,000. 200,000 on day one, and 36,000 of that price is deferred and paid two years later. No payments in between. That's in one go. So the final, actually, was, I was asked how we got this financed, and I actually got it financed by accident. Um, I was looking at um, funding one of the other deals I'm looking at. And um, found this lender that only operated, only offered loans to this region where this is based. And I thought, oh, well, that's not good for this, but I've got this one here. So I just sent them the, the details randomly, and they said, yeah, you know, yeah. Gives 165,000. Um, so uh, the, t the type of loan it is, it's an interesting one, nothing to pay the first year. No capital, no interest. It's government supported, so um, no PG um, or anything like that. Um, we just had to give a guarantee from the holding company, which is kind of meaningless, really. 
Um, it's, a, it's it, the debt's expensive, fifteen percent a year, but the government pays the first year. So we're looking at it as seven and a half percent spread out over two years. Average of over the first two years, debt service twenty seven thousand. So it's one point seven times debt service coverage from the cash flow. Um, thirty five thousand pounds short, so there's a twenty five thousand pound startup loan. Six uh, percent a year and ten thousand my own cash, which I can get back after completion because there's fifty thousand pounds left in the bank account. We're buying the whole company, buying, buying a limited company, um, because there's a lot of national health service contracts involved, and some prepaid funeral plans, and it's just a lot easier for us there. And plus, we get control of the bank account straight away. So we can repay ourselves and get the deal fees paid. Spoke to the lawyers, they're going to bill us after completion. So we can pay, pay them out of the cash that's in the, in the account. Plus there is an overdraft available, which we haven't, we haven't used, but we could use if we need to, for working capital. We could probably also increase it once we get control of the bank account post-completion. He's already mentioned two different kinds of government quasi-guarantee or quasi-guaranteed monies. And this is in the UK. And there are, but you've got to make the calls. You've got to find out what, what government, in this country, they call them government schemes. In America, scheme is bad. But government plans that you can use, but you've got to call around. And uh, the, uh, one of them, he's no interest for the first year. Uh, the other one, uh, 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 he's lending to a, a government, not a government agency, but a, uh, indirectly a government-backed agency that is lending in this particular area. For example, they have a government agency to loan money in Angus. And uh, they, they have similar uh, uh, in, uh, in Florida. Dade County's got a fund. Uh, and but you've got to call around. You've got to call around. Quite often, and I hadn't thought of this before, quite often when you're in the United States, immigration lawyers will know where their immigration clients have gotten money to start their businesses. So if you ask immigration lawyers, I don't know if it's the same. I have never done it in any other place uh, other than the U.S. Um, but there are sources of money. Money's not the problem. Go ahead. I didn't mean to. No, I have to, I have to say you're right because I was actually funding another gig, and just while I was doing that, I just sent this, these guys this stuff, and it just sort of happened in the background. So I wasn't really focused. Actually, mm -hmm. the only people I called about this, maybe I could have gotten the finance for this deal as well. I didn't need to. Um, and it's you know, no, no guarantees, no, nothing to pay. No guarantees. And most of you, before you uh, came through the, the beginning of the QLA funnel, were used to guarantees and putting up equity, right? That's, that's the name, well, not the name of the game, really. That's the name of your end of the financial continuum is, at, where's the equity coming from? And how much collateral addition do you have? And you're going to guarantee it. Because most commercial bank loans, not just in the United States, but around the world, they're looking for three sources of repayment. Three. The deal, which should be enough, but it never is, okay? Uh, a personal guarantee. And if you have a house, another business, etc., cross-collateralization. They have three boxes to check. And we don't want to check any of them. Other than the SBA, you're going to have to give a personal guarantee in America. But you've heard plenty of people, non-recourse, no personal guarantees. Contrary to Jason Nagy thinking he invented it down there in Adelaide, but it's been around a long, long time. And he found a couple other sources by his own admission by accident. And how did you find the deal? Oh. Oh, it's music to my ears. And I have to be honest, but I... Well, don't be... Does that mean everything you said before is not... Okay, go ahead. You don't know. Okay. Um, I was... After, after a while, I started choosing, like, 
targets who I was going to cold call by edge of the seven of the owner. And I started in the August first. Because by definite, just like uh, um, Corona, I, I'm in the crosshairs for Corona at my age. Actually, I'm a little old for the crosshairs. Crosshairs are 65 to 70, and I'm 75. But, I mean, um, they're the most likely demographic. And in certain parts of the world, like the Netherlands, it has a responsible chamber of commerce. And certain countries have responsible chambers of commerce, meaning that they uh, get their numbers from the participants kind of regular, more than regular, uh, and they will list. Uh, and you can ask the Chamber of Commerce uh, on their site, uh, you want all uh, uh, that have four more employees. Uh, you want uh, um, some of the local Chambers of Commerce. I mean, California Chamber of Commerce is dog shit. But I mean, there are, pl in Texas, some of the Chambers of Commerce are really good. And uh, because the, b the better Chamber of Commerce have activities, they show you how to get money. They show you how to close deals. They have keynote speakers like Bill Gates. I mean, but most chambers of commerce don't do that. And, uh, but I mean, they have reams of information. Reams of information. Go ahead, sorry. That's pretty much it. Okay, um, and we'll, I'll tell all my funeral crematorium jokes after we get off YouTube. Um, but just to say to YouTube, there are some extra side benefits from working in funeral homes and crematoriums. A little extra benefits, as they say in Oklahoma. Uh, the, um, okay, well, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the right thing now. All you got to do is about, it's just a little deal, like, just do something to somebody. I mean, that's all, do something to somebody. And, uh, and, and you get the feel for it, you know? Uh, and um, I happen to have been in this business, as most businesses that we've discussed. And the, um, and, you know, uh, if you think you're getting Granny's ashes, I wish you did get Granny's ashes, but you're not. You're getting Fido's and God knows who else's. And that's just the way it is. Although we have all our dog's ashes in front of the fireplace, and the little puppy, when he first, first put down, down in my office, he made a beeline to all the little canisters of ashes, and he went from one to one of them, all the way down, all 11 of them, of the dogs that are there. And uh, because the dog's smell is 500 times or whatever better than ours. But then I thought, well, Winston, I hope you're not joining him anytime soon. After all the fucking money we just paid for you, you little piece of shit. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, sir. Undertaker. Yes. Oh, no. no depending on where you are in the world. Undertaker is normally when you're uh, in the rural parts of America, they have undertakers. They're not called that anymore. They're called funeral parlor directors now. Uh, morticians are licensed by the state. And he, his business, you don't have to, there's no license transferred, right? But if you, the funeral home is licensed, the mortician, the guy that fixes up the body to make it look better, he's licensed by the state. And uh, allegedly, you have to go through some kind of schooling. Uh, you know, I'm sure you do. You know, to to be able to do all that stuff. The um, the answer to your question is the same thing. Undertaker. Undertaker. And there used to be a famous uh, uh, mixed martial artist guy, cage guy named the Undertaker, about 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, the Undertaker. And we've had some mixed martial arts guys come to the seminar, and they're nothing, zero, like their persona, their acting when they're up there. They're just not even reasonably close. I mean, you go boom, and they jump. You know, you get them in the cage, they they switch. They become Jason Nagy. You know, you know the. Uh, uh, anything else? 
SPACs, IPOs, blind pools. Yes. Okay. In, in, in what? The question was, can we go over clawbacks and reverse clawbacks? Absolutely. In what context? Because there's the context, and when you buy a business, and you're taking uh, 60 per 70 or 80 percent, and you're leaving them with 20, 30, or 40 percent, this is the seller. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, they want, um, you're putting up the money. They want, how do we get from 40 back to 60 or 70 percent? And the, 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 the general accepted way, I'm not saying the only accepted way, but the generally accepted way is through a clawback, meaning, okay, um, for the next three years, you produce results that have grown at 20% ROI, return on investment per year, and for every 20% year you have, you can claw back 5% of the equity and ownership. So you can go from 40 to 45 to 50 to 55 in three years. I've only seen it work in year one. I've never seen a clawback work beyond year one because to keep a team focused, first of all, 20% ROI is fucking hard. Hard. Um, for an ongoing business. From something from scratch, it's not hard. I, I asked you the first day, how many of you have started a business? Almost everybody said yes. How many have had 50 or 100,000 100, in revenue? Almost everybody said yes. From scratch, right? That's geometric growth. That's no different than Q, except it's organic growth. And the reason why banks like buying revenue is because it's been de-risked. As I told you a thousand times, the risk is already taken out because for the first hundred grand that you spent or you got in revenue on your business, your new virgin business, nobody knows how much you fucking spent to create that hundred grand. And the banks know sometimes, like in the startup uh, that we're talking about, Arcadia uh, 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 selling to uh, Sierra, right? had no revenues, right, currently. But sometimes they got $80,000 in revenues in their fifth year or something. But they've got $6 billion invested to create 80 grand. So the risk factor has already been taken out. And the banks understand. And sometimes you've got to explain it to the bank because the banks are thicker than two short planks, as they say in this country. They're dipshits. You gotta explain it to them. You know, well, you know, I'm only gonna bring you deals that stand up on their own two feet. Yes, I understand. I'm only gonna bring you deals that have been de already delevered. And they'll look at you. Well, what do you mean? De risk. And they'll look at you. Well, I mean, uh, a guy does 100 grand. How much did it cost him to create that 100 grand in revenue? I don't know. Well, neither do I. And if the guy's got $4 million in revenue, he probably spent $6 million to create four. Very seldom do you create $4 million or $1 million or even $100,000 with no investment, right? You've got some investment, and the banks understand that. But sometimes you've got to explain it to them. But your board won't understand it either. The challenge is getting it the first speed bump, and that's why you don't talk to these. And I'm, I'm begging you. Not like when I almost cried at uh, 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 the last seminar, but you've got to use your board. And it's obvious to me that, you know, most of you don't. It just, you know, it is. But you're, and sometimes your board won't under, understand. Well, they're going to want to know, if they haven't already asked, where's the money coming from? Who's writing the check? That, so some of you have already been through that. And what's the answer? The answer is directly or indirectly through our board and professionals is where we're getting financed. I've said it. I probably said that sentence. I have said it a million times in my 50-year career for sure. It's no less true than I said it when I 50 years ago than it is today. But it's still not practiced 
just like it wasn't practiced 50 years ago, it's not practiced now. Because virtually all your, your uh, directors, both executive and non-executive, are not going to understand it readily. Because they've never done a deal with nobody writing a check. Not necessarily them, but somebody's writing a check. Or somebody's got access to money. I use the old metaphor, writing a check, and now nobody write, you know, writes checks anymore. But I guess, well, maybe they do. I don't. As you know, I don't carry money. Sally doesn't allow me to carry money or credit cards or anything like this. I get, 10, I get 20 pounds uh, when I'm in London in case I get lost, and I get uh, $20 in the UK. So I said, well, make, can I have $25? Because the dollar and the pound, I mean, shit, I should get. She goes, no. Albert Einstein used to have on his right lapel uh, scotch taped with a pin a nickel. Albert Einstein, because in those days, that's what a phone call cost in a pay phone, a nickel, so he could get home, because he didn't know how to get home when he was at Princeton. They scotch tape and pinned a nickel behind his lapel. I, I'm not that bad. I, I can get around, but I just, she, you know. I only used my ATM for the first time. This is a true story few years ago. ATM, they still have ATMs? Where you put your credit card and you punch some numbers and spits out money? First time, first time I was in Mayfair. Sally was sick. That's when we had a house there. Sally was sick and uh, she said, well, we need some cash. And she gave me a credit card and a little, drew me a little map to where the closest ATM was. And I went out and you know, and the people that are standing in line look all like, like your riffraff clientele from your fucking mobile home park. And uh, they look homeless to me. And, uh, and they're all, they're, uh, they didn't want to get too close to the person that was working the machine. And I couldn't figure out why. Why was everybody standing so fucking far away? Because I guess they steal the numbers, right? I used it once. And I, I, I said, I'll, I'll put 20 grand in. I wanted 20,000 pounds out. <laughs> reject. 15,000 pounds. Reject. 2,000 pounds, it paid me. But I, I mean, you can't get 20,000, I guess, out of an ATM. But then I was gone about five or six minutes too long. Sally's bundled herself up, comes out of the house looking for me. Like I got you know, kidnapped or some shit. In Mayfair, of all places. Okay, um, I don't want to start one of the big cases. Well, unless you have any questions, I don't want to start a new case. I'm happy, to, yes? About who? Ask. You're talking about the funeral. You know, the guy with the paley white skin. But all Brits have paley white skin. So, I mean, anybody could be a funeral director up here. You know, I don't know why the fucking Romans ever came back so many times to fucking take over Britain. In fact, Caesar Augustus said that. Why we keep fucking coming back here for us to piss rain on us all the time? But go ahead. Are you all asking about the extra benefits? Yeah, somewhat. Oh, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Okay, go ahead. The business comes with a like a trust fund of prepaid funerals. Would there be any way to leverage that fund to get additional loans off of it? Well, it de depends on the uh, on uh, on the covenants of the trust. But normally, I would imagine they're pretty tight, so you can't leverage off of. Uh, I could be wrong, but uh, that's like uh, it's not the same. It's similar to. When you put money in a trust account of a, uh, your lawyer, there's covenants that he can't commingle the money, he can't take the money, but you're asking, can he take that 700,000 pounds and leverage it to borrow more money is what your question is, right? I don't know about the covenants of the trust. Would it make sense to hire a sales troop and then have them like go out and pre-sell funerals on a commission basis? Yeah, you're talking about after you already own it. Uh, yeah, I mean, in fact, Forest Lawn, 
and this information is old, uh, who used to be the biggest funeral home per, uh, company in the United States, had a selling team. They had like a um, uh, call center to sell these uh, packages. They got a deal on TV now uh, where a guy's mail went to the wrong address and she comes up to her and says, you know, I got this and I was interested. It was uh, funerals for uh, silver-haired people, uh, old people or some bullshit. And, uh, the, um, and they go through some little story that I don't want to burden my family, bullshit, bullshit. Uh, but uh, when you call those numbers, they've got professional salespeople on the, other, on the end. Now, you're talking about the salespeople generating the first call by f following them. I don't know if they have that. I know they certainly have it in America. What about collaborating with a care home and have a salesperson go in there and... And when the people die, they refer them to you? All that's possible. No, no, or be beforehand, like... Well, no, I understand that, but I mean, the, the, the referrals, a uh, dead referral is still better than no referral. The referral meaning being dead. But, but could you also have someone go in there while they are alive and have them prepay their funeral? Uh, well, most of the old timers, I mean, uh, you can get in trouble legally. Do they have dementia? Do, are, they, uh, are, they, you know, uh, are they capable of uh, um, taking care of their own affairs? Like Sally has a power of attorney for a mom that's in a home. Uh, and uh, the, Well, they could. You could. I mean, uh, none of that sounds illegal. Um, it's tasteless. It doesn't, you know, but uh, that, it's coming from you. So I, you know, uh, I would have thought that the, the, uh, the, uh, the Persian wizard over here would have thought of that. Um, but no, I mean, it's in bad, you know, it's, it's in bad taste. You know, there's a grieving period. Well, they have, they're not grieving yet because they're not dead, but they're almost dead. So you're trying to catch them before they're dead. You know, I, I I mean, they give them a discount. Yeah, well, you give them a discount. <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 it still sounds in poor taste. But, I mean, there's a lot of things to me that are in poor taste. I mean, uh, on the commercials, the, uh, that they ram down your throat, at least here in the UK, uh, at least here in Scotland. Uh, the, um, the, uh, you, you could do that. I mean, you could, you could... You could cut deals. I would cut deals with uh, hospitals, like an ambulance chaser. You know, an ambulance chaser is a guy who's a, uh, proactively practicing law that uh, when he sees an accident, he gives you your card and call me. Well, there's guys that, um, that use uh, the obituaries as um, in their sales funnel to call to find motivated sellers. Since the 90s, when they, the obituaries that are posted, all those people are one half of a motivated selling team. You understand what I just said? But I mean, not many people do that. I mean, again, it's, it's tasteless, but profitable. I don't, uh, it doesn't look like too many of you are going to be using it either. Uh, there's some limit. There's a line that almost everybody won't go over. Whatever that line is to you personally, you have to make that choice. There weren't that many lines I wouldn't go over. And I, you live in an a, a 800-square-foot apartment, and I live here. I rest my case. And yet, the big guys that I've told you off camera said that I was a weak link. And what are you? We've got a couple of pretenders. If I'm the weak fucking link, God help you. There's certain things you won't do, including cold calling.
at the rate that's required, everybody can make one cold call a day. Two, four, eight, 200, 300, 500. You drop off, right? And you all got excuses why, right? I got a family, I got, right? Do you think I haven't heard them all, the reasons? Instead of just saying, I'm white and lazy. I'm black and lazy. I'm a Chinaman and lazy. I'm a New Zealander and lazy. I'm a fat contractor and lazy. I'm an English pasty guy that looks like a funeral and lazy. Now, you won't use the word lazy. I can't reunite the fire in my belly. Some of you never had the fire in the belly, so I mean... If you never had the fire in the belly, then it's, I'm not saying it's impossible to ignite. Some of you, I mean, in this country, you go to school, get the best education you can, go to work for a big company, and you want to be a, a mainline board director at the end of your career with a retirement of some sort, and you got a house in fucking the Midlands, and, right, and you put your kids through school, maybe they gave you a watch, probably not. That's the career in this country. If you went to one of the better schools, you go to the city, the financial district, and you end up a career there, and, you're, and now they call them senior managing directors. But that's not what this model is. This model is you go out and be fucking Adolf Hitler and sell the shit out of anything you get a hold of. But there's no limit to the amount of money you can make. Yeah. Why is the money in a trust and not with his company? Because the money has been pre for just to keep thieves like you away from it. That's exactly the reason it's in a trust. Because the people that die or pay for a funeral that's going to happen in three years want to make sure the fucking money's still there. And not squirreled away by somebody like you. That's exactly the reason it's in a trust. And you already figured out the, the paths that you're leaning towards are dictated by the questions you ask. I don't, have, I don't have to explain these two guys to you, do I? It's pretty fucking obvious, isn't it? Just don't be that obvious with the sellers. Otherwise, you won't buy shit. And, to, and even though I talk the way I talk, and I've always talked this way, I could still sell the shit. But I wouldn't take no for an answer. And what I mean, I mean, I mean it from the bottom of where my heart's supposed to be. I've showed you pictures of my heart now, because we know from about five months ago that I got one. But I wouldn't take no for an answer. You don't close 94.6%. Unless you're a hard closing motherfucker. My sales teams average 50, 60% sales. Trying to keep up. Yep. Uh, uh, <laughs> go ahead. Is it illegal to have them pay the company? <laughs> I mean, uh, because am I the only one? Am I the only one that gets this? Go ahead. <laughs> because I mean, <laughs> okay, is it illegal to what? Is it illegal for them to prepay me that, like the company that? Oh, you want them to prepay you? <laughs> uh, yeah, because I mean, you you could still take off the margin, right? There's no harm in taking off the margin. No, it's not illegal, but I mean, uh, if uh, well. If they have a choice between putting in a, tr a trust that they know is going to be there five years from now and prepaying you, I don't think that, you know. If, it, if it's cheaper? No, it, you know, it, it's, there's a certain things that are sacrosanct, and, you know, uh, burying your mom is probably one of them. You know, uh, I didn't bury my mom. I, 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 I burned her at the stake that she should have been burned at 600 years ago. You know, I cremated her. But the, um, the, um, no, I mean, I, I don't think that you're going to be able to, add, unless, unless you've got a, you know, a, a, a personal development discount over Valentine's, uh, you can uh, put a 40% discount 
over Valentine's? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would think people would be suspect. But that's just me, I, I think. And to, to look at him, I mean, nobody's going to give him any fucking money. I mean, yeah, you know, it better give it to the fucking uh, uh, young Ayatollah over here. You know, the, uh, no, I don't think so. Now, you, you want to do funeral homes, don't you? You mean just take them right out when they die, you just, just ship them? Your, your German cohort over here is, is looking at you, you know, the, uh, uh, fuck. Yeah, I, I, guess that, uh, it, I guess that's possible. It is. It is. And, but I don't know what the rules and regulations are. You're going to do this in Germany? I don't know what the rules and regulations. I mean, the Germans got a rule for everything, fucking a license for everything. You know, the, uh, so I, I would imagine that the, the, it, it would be license driven. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the, uh, but I mean, a lot of people are dying. I mean, they're, they're dying all over the place, including Germany. Yeah. I want to ask, I want to ask this question differently. Ask his question differently. Yes. So basically, uh, where I'm looking at it from is he has a company and he could potentially build an ecosystem around it. Would you recommend that? Ecosystem to, okay, just to find to me ecosystem. Like a platform almost. Kind of like, you know, Apple makes computers, but they also allow a marketplace for apps. They also sell phones. So, uh, so this ecosystem would be a death ecosystem. Yes. Like, alive, you know, we treat you, and then... There's nothing, uh, as far as I know, there's no law against that. Uh, yeah, you could. Off the top of my head, uh, you could. But when you're the first, remember, if you're not first, you've got to be different. And let's just say that there's no such a thing as a death ecosystem. And I don't know, but there's probably an app for it. Since I missed apps the first time, there's probably an app for it. But the answer is yes. You can. You can. And uh, the, uh, but that still doesn't resolve the question. You still got to buy these things. Because I can tell you, it's a lot easier to buy them that are already in business six months or 36 months or 66 months as opposed to start them from scratch. And part of that ecosystem would have to be uh, cemeteries. And you can't hardly, maybe it's different in Germany, but you can't hardly get a uh, permit for cemeteries anymore in the United States of America. You can't get them permitted. They just, nobody wants to be, I don't know exactly why, but they don't want to be reminded. And the cemeteries in America with the old headstone thing, that's dead. That's been dead for 50 years. And now they put two and three bodies in one place. I mean, so, but, um, yeah, but I, I don't see any reason, unless there's a, uh, a particular uh, law. But I, I would imagine if you can do it in Germany, you can do it any place in Europe, because Germany's got the, the toughest laws about almost everything. Not everything, but almost everything. They don't make, I mean, from driving to get a, a shooting a gun to playing golf, I mean, everything. They, they make it a fucking, uh, you know, PhD, uh, or at least a double master's degree to, to get anything done. But yeah, an ecosystem where, you know, like a pinball machine, he, he, he steals from all the different ecos, huh? That's why I, I like a crook that doesn't deny being a crook. Stand-up crook. That's, there are not many stand-up crooks left anymore. They're just not. Oh, yeah, morally. Now, nobody can say that, watch you say that with a straight face after being with a couple days, you know? E even the Persian pervert, you know? And if they then die opportunities, you can't just kill them and just help them. Sorry, <laughs> sir. <laughs> okay. And your grandfather, was that, a, that sounded like a porn deal. <laughs> Have I answered your question? Okay. If there's nothing else, I'll see you guys back here for drinks. Um, the, I believe it's at 7. Is that right? Okay, well, you can get to work on your uh, whatever you're working on.
You had some uh, technical jokes. You were gonna what? Pardon? Off the camera, uh, funeral. Oh, oh, um, oh, oh, actually benefits of fucking the... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you will. Uh, <laughs> he's trying to chick fuck me. Have you ever seen a black Santa Claus? Mm -mm. Now, maybe in Watts. I've never been in Watts during Christmas. Or uh, uh, Brownsville in New York, which are black neighborhoods. Why is that? Other than some racist shit, but I mean, why? I've never seen a Mexican Santa Claus. But how come Black Lives Matter don't complain about that? Now, one of my pet peeves, and I'm sure I'm going to take shit about this, but I don't give a fuck. Um, Black Friday, the sales day. Everybody familiar, have heard that, you know, the day after Thanksgiving and sometime after Christmas, some bullshit. Black, it's supposed to, where you go to uh, retail distribution centers or various stores, and they have sales, right? Why do they call it Black Friday? This is awful heavy. And how come the black movement's not on their ass? That sounds pretty fucking racist to me. Well, I'll tell you when we're not on YouTube. But it's just a load of shit. Most of this stuff is just a load of shit. I mean, they are about to rename the Redskins. Oh, yeah, well, no, that, uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, I go uh, bananas over that with uh, all the renaming of the um, uh, sports teams. Fuck. Um, you know, we, we, we've swung too far the other way. I mean, way, 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 we swung too far, and it started after the Korean War and then the Vietnam War, which was a very unpopular war, which I was part of. Uh, the, uh, the, just, it was the, camel, the straw that broke the camel's back. And uh, we've been sliding down that road ever since. The um, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, go fuck yourselves. Uh, we'll be working today, uh, the, and we, tonight, uh, just like usual. And the, um, I was uh, thinking about a uh, memorous uh, Christmas Eve many, many years ago where I was flying, uh, trying to get from... Uh, uh, Boston uh, to New York City to close a deal on Christmas Day. And I'd been on the road about three plus weeks, very little sleep, sleeping in airports, which I used to do all the time. Um, and this is before the security and 9-11, uh, that kind of thing. And um, the, um, I was sitting maybe um, where the curtain is, away from the, the ticket agent to get on the plane. And um, I slept through, apparently slept through it, and I missed the plane. So I come up to the ticket agent, and uh, they said, we called your name, uh, sir. And I said, um, and this was a, a Hispanic girl. Chicana, uh, well, they used to call him Chicana, but I mean a Hispanic woman. And she says, if you sit a little closer, because there's going to be another plane in 90 minutes. And uh, I slept through that one, missed the plane again. So then she had me sit right where you are. There's one more plane. And, uh, but she had gone off duty and there was another girl there, there, and I missed that plane. So now I gotta get to, from Boston to New York City, no more planes. Now they try to give me some uh, tickets, you know, for a hotel, you know how they give you when they fuck you around, they, or give you free drinks or bullshit like that. I said, I don't need any of that shit. I said, uh, these, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to find, and you can't uh, uh, rent a private, well, we couldn't rent a private plane for me at uh, quarter to uh, uh, one in the morning. And so um, I got, got a uh, car, a driver, uh, to drive me, which isn't that far from Boston, New York City. I got to uh, New York just in time uh, to, uh, to uh, take a, a sponge bath in the, in, in the men's room of the uh, investment bank and to go in and do the deal. Um, but I've, I've spent a lot of Christmases working, 
And um, the, uh, I just heard, got some emails from some of you kids that um, they tried to contact their lawyers and their accountants uh, yesterday, and they're gone for the year. That's, that's unacceptable. That's not even, and I, I don't blame it on the professionals, the accountants and the lawyers, I blame it on the U's. You didn't hire them right. And for the first time, I mean, uh, they, you may want to play the victim because they, they left town, but it's your fault. And for those of you that remember Simon Bell, uh, the guy that did the, the big deal, all the money disappeared, and uh, the, uh, he was the only one that got paid 31 million bucks. Uh, those professionals and those big accounting firms and law firms ask him permission when they can go on holiday. They ask him. They call up as one of his three assistants, or however many he's got, and they say, you know, you know, Mr. Bell is going to be blah, blah, blah. Now, see, that's so, just the look on your face, especially the Dutchman, I mean, is so anti the antithesis of how you conduct your business. You can't even fathom it. Do you think that Elon takes Christmas Day off? No. He may not sleep on the shop floor of a Tesla factory like he does once from time to time. Your whole frame of life is the antithesis of what these high performers are. Almost everything in your life. And, the, you know, my task here, if this is where you are now, and high performance is over here, is for me to, based on my experience, my expertise, at least draw you one block closer. In the old days, I was able to drink, drag them, fuck, this close. I can't do that anymore. I physically can, but the kids, the material I have to work with, can't do that. And there's a whole, I've said it before, I, I don't say it normally in the hardcore, uh, testosterone levels in men have gone down uh, 17% since uh, 1986. In uh, 1998, a woman's average handshake was 118 pounds per, no, excuse me, 80, 88, eight, no, in 1988, a woman's handshake was uh, 98 pounds squeezing, you know, when you shake, and a man's was 118. In 2008, a man's was 103, down from 108, and a woman's was up 10 pounds. And then uh, I can give you testosterone levels, and I can give you all kinds of stats, which that and $5 will not buy you a coffee latte at Starbucks, but, and I'm not one to extrapolate what it's going to be in 100 years. And there's all kinds of theories why man's testosterone level is down. And, and the greenies blame it on the atmosphere. Well, how does that affect your handshake pressure? Russian handshakes, I'll give you another stat. Women's and men's handshake in Russia have gone up 15% during that same time frame. And I can, uh, you can go on and on, but nobody talks about it because they... Some people say if you talk about it, it's going to even become more self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't believe that. We're doomed. It, well, no matter how much Dan Penny flaps his fucking mouth about it, I mean, uh, we're doomed. And the seminar has, has adjusted uh, uh, to that, uh, not to the gloom and doom, but to, you know, how do I get, because I'm a professional. You know, being a professional is doing what uh, some days uh, what you uh, don't want to do, but you're doing it professionally. That's a, and so every day, I'm up here, uh, a couple years ago, I had 105 temperature, not given the hardcore, but given the regular seminar. 
And I was, I was literally fucking dying. But I didn't, we didn't change the seminar a bit. There was one uh, chiropractor, uh, a tree hugger in the audience. The second day, he said, something's not right with you, Mr. Pena. I see the color in your eyes. So then I went and changed glasses, because I have different pairs of glasses, where it's a little darker lens, so you can't see what my eyes were. But he was right. And, oh, he, he was distressed for me. You know those drama queens that get distressed because you're distressed? Well, I, mean, I thought he was going to have a fucking stroke. Um, and if I was English, I would have taken the week off. But, you know, the, uh, this is as, uh, as tree-hugging as we get, the, uh, the change in dress. But everything else is the same. Everything else is the same. The, um, last night, uh, you saw Rockefeller, right? Edison and uh, J.P. Morgan. By the way, J.P. Morgan had a fetish. Because uh, he had, um, what's it called when your skin turns red? His nose was about as big as an apple. Uh, and it was about the same color as that red sweater. And uh, he didn't like ta getting pictures taken. And he didn't like having his profile taken because you could see how big his fucking nose was exploded. Part of that is because he drank, he used to suck up scotch with his nostrils. You know? Uh, and if you've noticed, people who drink a lot often get red noses and their veins expand on their, on their face. Well, that's another thing, allegedly, uh, that J.P. Morgan uh, suffered from. The, um, but he, he left a, a, a tremendous legacy, and J.P. Morgan's still around. Um, and um, the, um, so what are uh, them versus you? I'm not going to ask you how many of their traits you had, because don't bullshit yourself. Zero. Or so close to zero, it's not worth talking about. And again, success leaves clues. I said it during the regular seminar. Almost everybody we talked about would, on, on one, in uh, one degree or another was, would be considered an asshole. A prick. Uh, whatever the name you want to describe. In fact, some of the names that I'm currently described by, they were, you know, they were uh, the epitome of that. Strength, focus, and all those things. And they changed the world. And now you can go two or three generations closer to us, and we can see Elon Musk and those guys have similar qualities. They're not killing people in the streets and, you know, when they, uh, when they uh, picket or something like that. Um, but what are some, you know, some of the things that you saw in them, that, the qualities? And see, I call them qualities you probably don't consider them as qualities. But I consider them qualities when you can generate hundreds of millions, which would be now hundreds of billions of dollars, from scratch. I can relate to that model. OK, what, do you, uh, what are some of the comments? Yes, sir, in the back. So he wanted to consolidate all of the electric, so he Consolidate. All, and if you've noticed, and I hope you did, these are all consolidation plays. Roll-ups, 150 fucking years ago, and they're still around. Roll-ups. Excuse me, go ahead. So he needed to get Westinghouse out of the way, so he sued him. And he needed to get Edison out of the way, so he bought his shares of all the companies so, so he could create General Electric. So he just did, he did whatever it takes. He didn't think of any consequences. He did whatever it takes to get to his goal. Versus me uh, thinking about the consequences, not making decisions. Let's just stop at whatever it takes. And let's talk about you, and specifically the deal that you showed us. And you called the broker, and the broker gave you some bullshit answer, right? Vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the tax returns. And even though you contend to the small group, and I believe in the larger group, that you didn't spend that, that much time on it. Right? That's what you said. If you spend more than five minutes, you spend too much time. Now, one would argue, from your point of view, well, I learned something. I would argue you didn't, because I've been doing this almost 30 years. You didn't learn a fucking thing. 
you're bored. And normally what you guys, not just you guys, the kids, always have one or two favorites on their board that they can go to, the go-to people that don't make you feel, don't make you feel as stupid as you are. So you have a go-to CFO, a go-to something, a go-to, and they are the kinder, gentler. And your excuse, the but in your defense is, I didn't want to take the time of all the board members in such a minor matter, some bullshit like that, right? When the truth of the matter is, you don't want to look stupid in front of six, seven, eight people. If you really drill down and you're absolutely candid with yourself, and if you, if you can't engage in self-deprecation, kids, the QLA model is, a, is going to be a long road. Uh, Justin said, uh, uh, or yesterday, he says, I guess I want to kind of still uh, uh, be liked. Remember you said that? He was speaking for all of you. We've had one guy in the last three or four years who was uh, part of Mossad, the Secret Service of Israel, Israeli Secret Service. He's the only, I believe him, an assassin. I believe him when he says, I didn't give a fuck about what anybody thought. I believed him because he was very much like my dad's personality. And he sat right there. I believed him. 25 years in Mossad will harden you up. He had rhino skin. And when he said to the group, which the group was just, not because he was from that uh, ilk, when he said, I can't remember ever buying my mother a birthday card. I might have when I was young, but I can't remember it. I mean, the look on your faces, not this group, but because we've been raised, myself included, that moms are kind of sacrosanct. We know they're fucked up, but they're still our mom, or more or less that. In this model, that, that's not the case. I.e., Sally and I didn't see our, our mothers for seven and eight years, respectively. And I pushed it so hard because, you know, uh, you guys went to the regular seminar, and, and I remember you from the regular seminar. I, I reviewed your files before you got here. Uh, two, three of you, I reviewed your files again since you got here, just to make sure that I was, you know, this early onset dementia that a lot of my friends are getting, I'm not getting, and yeah, I thought so. And I thought so, and so I, I, I'm still pushing it. What else about um, the film last night? Yes, sir. Have you seen the Nuremberg rally of Adolf Hitler? You got excited, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, lot of, a lot of those things which these people do remind me of that showmanship. Like showmanship, correct? Yeah, like when he, when Edison lit up that house with the light bulbs, and then again in Manhattan. And when they electrocuted that poor bastard, yeah, and they the couldn't kill him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's not funny, is it? But you laughed. That um, created a bunch of lawsuits, which they don't talk about that. But if that was your uncle, your brother, your son. But they, the people that were suing didn't have any money. If that had been my family, we would own that state. We would own the prison. We would own the guys that threw the switch. I mean, because that's a lawsuit that they, they really can't afford to lose. If they, but nobody, oh, go, go ahead. That was it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's showmanship. They, you know, and as I said, contrary to popular belief, I, I, I firmly stand that Adolf Hitler was one of the highest performance persons that ever lived, uh, and for sure probably the most high performance person in the last hundred years. And uh, as showmanship getting back to when Carnegie put the elephant across the bridge, and the, uh, but going back or bringing it forward when, um, uh, and I wasn't there, when Steve Jobs uh, uh, announced the new uh, whatever, and it didn't work. And yet he was more fixated. He wanted to tell the guy, I want a blue shirt with pockets. Go out and find me one, if you remember. And where do I go? The you, 
the, the doofus idiot, well, where do I go? Instead of just saying, yes, sir. And they were supposed to be back in 15 minutes, I think. Well, how can I do that? Don't you see the difference? You know, you see the difference in the thought process. And so the, 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 the more you get sly towards my side, remember I said 5% of my communications goes in your billionaire. We've got billionaires that don't even have 1% of my communication skills. You don't have to have communication skills to pull the trigger. And uh, the Israeli guy from a couple seminars ago pointed that out on the one-to-one -one time with me. And I haven't really even thought about that. The snipers of uh, current fame, they communicate because I've met some of them. Their communication skills are pretty fucking lacking. But they knew how to pull the trigger. And, and even though they, they're trained to, you know, hit the target, blah, 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 and, and double tap them, that means two, two in the head, um, a lot of snipers miss. And a lot of snipers kill innocent people. And that's just collateral damage. You guys want to make an omelet without breaking any eggs. Not just you, but I mean the kids. You want to make an omelet, and I've never had an omelet, even the most expensive restaurant I've ever eaten at, that didn't have a little chip of an egg of some you know, description. But you want to make an omelet with no eggs. First, you don't want to break the eggs, let alone, God forbid, have some egg in your omelet. And that's just, that's not the real world. It's the real world where you are, it's not the real world, which I hope you aspire to be in because you're here. This is the perp, not this room, but the estate is the perfect metaphor for yesterday's dreams or today's realities. Most of you haven't been in an environment like this. You've been in a classroom environment like this. That's not what I mean. In an environment um, where, uh, you know, Sally doesn't have a budget to run this place. No, but I tell you, I don't look at the expenses because I want to be able to sleep. If I looked at the expenses, and I'm supposed to get year-end numbers because the decade ended, or it's going to end in a few days, I'm not looking forward to seeing them, to see how much this fucking hog cost me the last 10 years. I'm positive it's higher than the net worth cumulatively of this room. I'm dead fucking positive about that. Even with a gas station thief here. So I'm going to man up, though. Uh, I'm supposed to have the numbers by 15 February. I said, give them to me on 14 so I could make my Valentine's present. So I look at the numbers every 10 years whether I need to or not, because it takes me nine years to get over them. What else about um, the boys? Yes, sir. And Tesla, though, tore up his uh, royalty contract so Westinghouse could, didn't have to go out of business. Now, you don't see that very often. You don't see that very often. You know, uh, most of the inventors say, well, if I'm going down, everybody's going down. Because uh, the, uh, they live in little, their little worlds that, you know, they're, they're not aware of what's going on outside. The... Uh, yeah, but I mean, they were cutthroat sons of gun. I mean, God. Just imagine if they had iPhones back then. Fuck. 
Just imagine. But the guys today aren't doing anything, or they're doing just as bad of things, except they're not killing employees in shootouts when uh, they, uh, they're, uh, you know, they, they're uh, complaining for more money. So remember what Rockefeller said about uh, the refineries in Pittsburgh, or wherever it was, close them down. Now you guys would be spreadsheeting it today until your next birthday. Do you see? Do you see the gap? There's nothing to spreadsheet. What else? Yes, sir. Moral and ethical swings in the wind for them. They, uh, well, they use I, I told you from the beginning, from the first seminar, legal, moral, and ethical, and, and, and morals and ethics swing in the wind, but it's got to be where there's a rule of law. Although I got an adjudication here recently uh, in a place that has no rule of law that I won, which I'm still dumbfounded by. I still, I don't know what happened, um, well, how we could, and they paid me money. Yeah, but you're right, they swing in the wind. And, uh, but your morals and ethics will also swing in the wind. I use an example. How many of you have kids? That's too bad, anyway. Okay, you, you, uh, if you got more than one kid, you always have a favorite. You've heard me say this before. Irrespective of what you say, there is a favorite. You tell all the kids, we love you all the same, and you bullshit them. But the kids know. When they grow up, you know, our, our three kids know who's the favorite. And uh, they, because you treat the favorite differently. So you take your favorite, whoever it is, and, uh, the, and, you, um, and you stand her here, uh, and the, uh, I have, uh, uh, I'll get one of my guns out, and I pull it back, pull the hammer back, and it's loaded, and I say, uh, you've got till uh, the 31st to do such and such, or I'm going to splatter, we're going to have to redecorate the, uh, the hall again because there's going to be brain parts all over the wall. And it's for real. It's not one of these fucking video game things. 99.9% .9 of you will do everything humanly, humanly possible to preclude that action from happening, wouldn't you? And the women, there's no women in the room, but the, wo the moms would be more effective than the guys. I told you when you left the seminar last time, to play, it was like your last two minutes at the Super Bowl or the World Cup. And I explained to you yesterday why they score so readily, easily during the World Cups and the Super Bowls because they're going all out now. During the regular season, they're not going all out because of injuries. Well, you're not going all out either. And, 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 and you can do this job, especially during the corona era, having a slip tip, a broken arm, a twisted neck, a fractured shin. You're not worried, so you can go all out. But you don't. But you don't. What else about um, JP or, um, remember, vis-a-vis -vis you and the traits, we won't call them attributes, the traits that they have that you don't possess. Yes, sir. You're right. You're right. I mean, the few of the guys that I've met that are of that elk, um, they don't, literally, they don't know what day of the week it is. They don't know it's Christmas today. They don't know anything. They're 100% focused. I get a list from uh, one of my assistants. Uh, important dates that I should remember once a month and then the day of it. Yesterday was an important date because my mother died on, on Christmas Eve. Uh, the next one is my grandson's birthday. It's in January, I forget when. I don't do anything, but it's just for me to remember. You'd be looking for a gift for three weeks. That looks good in a movie. 
but they're all in. I mean, we, during the end of the year when we were closing deals, I mean, uh, the bankers and the lawyers and the accountants are always cognizant of what day it is. Always. And their goal is we got to finish on Boxing Day. That's the day after Christmas. So the goal is to finish by the 28th because they don't say so they have time to get home. But I got some of the greatest concessions I ever did from a seller at 11 o'clock at night, New Year's Eve. Because they want to get home. And I'm going to the whip. Like a jockey, you know, when he goes to the whip, and I'm just going to the whip. We had, uh, I have four very uh, successful uh, Mexican mentees. I used to call them the Mexican morons in the 90s. Uh, two went to Harvard, one went to Berkeley, one went to William and Mary. Terrific schools. And um, they had a uh, meeting on a Saturday morning with one of the big law firms still around. Uh, and one of the big, at that time, big eight accountants. So the weekend before, we were at my house in Palos Verdes, and we practiced. I played, on the one hand, uh, the lawyers, and on the other hand, I played the accountants, because they were, uh, wanted to, them to agree to this thing. So the first meeting was 8 o'clock in the morning. I told them to get their little suits on, uh, and they showed up, and uh, the first meeting was with the accountants. The accountants showed up in tennis stuff because they, they had a uh, 11 o'clock tennis game at L.A. Tennis Club. L.A. Los Angeles Tennis Club is one of the most exclusive tennis clubs. It's got like a 50-year waiting list. And they were there in their tennis shit. Uh, the lawyers uh, had a 1 o'clock tea time at uh, another exclusive country club. They come in their golf shit, Right? And um, the, uh, there was five main points we needed from the lawyers, and we, there was three main points we needed from the accountants. The lawyers did not leave the meeting till 1.15. They had 11 o'clock tea time. Between 11.30 and 1.15, they caved on all five points. All five. The first 30 to 45 minutes of both meetings they apologized to these Mexican kids, and they ranged in age from 24 to 26, four kids, uh, for being not dressed professionally. The accountants, where we showed up, not we, my team showed up late, um, were getting ready to leave, uh, but they stayed, and they were there till 5.15. So they never got to play golf. And they called me from Alvera Street in downtown Los Angeles, the four kids, drunk on their ass. Um, and these are the same four kids about a month before tried to take me out to dinner. And uh, I went to an inexpensive restaurant because it was their pain. And when the bill came, the, between the four of them, they didn't have enough money. On that deal, they made five minutes. And knowing that they're drunken, like drunken sailors, I, they probably went through it in the weeks. But you're acting like you're those accountants. Your actions show me that you're closer to being those lawyers and accountants than you are a uh, QLA assassin. And these kids didn't, don't know shit. They were well-educated, but they had, they had cheat notes written on their hands. Everybody know a cheat note? where you're, you're anticipating a question, so you write the answer on your hand. But their hands were perspiring so much, the, 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 the ink bled or smeared. What else about um, JP? Yes, sir, in the back. It's, uh, so money, obviously, um, with JP um, was was critical and important. Um, there's two points I have. The first is that he had a high performance father who hounded. That's him. yeah. That is that. the whole story, really. His dad was a ball busting son of a bitch. And um, secondly, therefore, it's actually not a 
they, these guys didn't have goals as such. They had their destiny. It's not a goal. It's not just a small goal. It doesn't just have a number attached. It's, it's attached to, to their, their sense of who they are and their destiny. And then that just transcends everything. And uh, just to go off um, a former point, you know, that um, they don't know anything else. And so everything's congruent. It's who they are, and, and they'll die doing it. Very much, uh, you know, I don't know about destiny for my part, but it was congruent. There was uh, the guy that killed the two people, the seminar who's successful in Florida. He said, and uh, he said, I, this, I have a slide that says, uh, the, uh, when I decided to uh, kill them, everything else fell in place. And then it said convicted murderer. And so then uh, he raises his hand. I didn't say it exactly like that, Mr. Pena. Of course, none of the kids in the, in the group knew who he was. So now they all turn around and want to know, what does he mean? And I said, it's not you. You're not the only convicted murderer I've trained. But you know, me growing up, I knew I had to pull the trigger whether it was a physical altercation or in bit which transcended in, you know, in my life and into and, and, and business. I always knew that I had to pull the trigger because that's what, before they called them alpha males, an alpha male was called a oak, oak wood, because oak was supposedly the strongest tree. That's what they were called in, you know, a couple hundred years before alpha male came up, some psychiatrist came up with the idea. Of, of an alpha male, and it's based on a study of gorillas. It's not important. The, uh, but I just knew what I had to do, and I just did it. I didn't, have, I didn't go through the thought process, what would my dad think of me? Because that was ingrained in me. I know what my dad would think of me if I didn't do it. Not if I did it. Because I, I got almost all the time I got in trouble for doing it, for the action that made me more he-man or whatever the terminology was in that, those days. But you're right, J.P. Morgan, it was his destiny. And to this day, it's the only bank that was named after a guy that still exists. That still exists, which speaks volumes. And he was prepared to pay a lot more money to uh, Carnegie. Um, uh, than he did, um, but they're all terrible people. I mean, uh, I, I, I think I told you the first day, uh, Rockefeller, Tom Watson, the founder of IBM, Tom Watson Sr., and Henry Ford um, all got the Victoria uh, Cross, not Victoria, uh, the, 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 the German Cross, the Iron Cross, from Hitler, personally. And then when uh, uh, Ford found out uh, the kind of guy, or no, Watson found out the kind of guy he was, he gave the cross back, but um, Ford and uh, Rockefeller kept it because they supported the, the Germans during World War I until we got uh, uh, in the war, and they supported Germany during World War II until we got in the war because they made the decision, money versus lives, not dissimilar to what the governments are doing now. Yeah, J.P. Morgan, it was, it, was, it was destiny. And it's very much like the Bushes have a destiny, the Clintons have a destiny, the Rockefellers, uh, the Kennedys. It's inbred. And the people, those families, all send their kids to the same schools, same schools that our kids went to, because they figured out four or 500 years ago when they founded Princeton, Yale, Harvard, that rich people, it rubs off, as opposed to where you went to school. And I went to school, too. Not just... In fact, you guys, most of you that went to school, went to a much better school. Keep the rest. And I didn't tie up the intellectual property or the copyright. He started to, like, use that public money and buy buildings for himself and his family. And then the government stepped in once they realised what he was doing. And because it was an election year and they didn't want this to hit the news, they did a behind-the-doors negotiation with him and said, look... We'll pay you out for the IP of all your programs and that. You get the hell out of the country. Don't come back. Shut your mouth. So they paid him about $120 million and he moved to Canada and took the literacy program we developed and took the IP. He left the, the program I developed because it was a Māori language and it wouldn't 
wasn't going to get him any money over in Canada. That was the first lesson I learned. Well, I thought I learned a lesson. So I made someone a millionaire. And then um, along the way, I started to invest in real estate. In 2000, I, I had no money, no house, but I had an older brother that had a freehold house. And he, was, uh, he went through the police force, customs, he ended up, you know, a detective. And our customs detectives back home, like the detectives for the police, they deal with the internal drugs. So they chase weed. The customs ex, uh, the detectives would chase the cocaine and everything that was in, um, being imported from the bikey gangs. And so he was all into that stuff. He used to kick doors in and stab. And I trusted him. So we went. It's your brother. Estate. Yes. And so we started to buy real estate together. Well, I, actually, I was the knowledge because I went to the learning. He was the equity because he stayed in his job. I said, look, stay in your job. Leave this to me. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I was supposed to set up a trust, put our houses into a trust, but I was just too busy going out and buying. And so I bought us about eight homes and was just on the brink of um, negotiating my first apartment block. And I discovered that my brother's um, gotten a shit, was heading towards bankruptcy, owned all the homes, so he sold them from under me. Brother. Brother. So, yeah. I learned back then that even your family will Let me stop you. And maybe it's because, you know, he sounds he has an easy life. But, I mean, where I come from, you're smarter than this. I mean, and the Mexicans aren't necessarily smart. But where I come from, you're smarter than, not just this, but several of the other stupid things you get, you know, myself included. And, and, the, and, I, and I, I can only attribute it to one thing, my dad. Because my dad said, who was a cop, and then the CIA, as, as we've talked about, and YouTube ad nauseum, Dan, Danny, everybody's an asshole. Sooner or later, they'll prove it to you. That was his mantra. Certain other people, Chinamen, black, that are different kind of assholes, sooner or later, they'll prove it to you. That's how I was raised. The opposite, you know, bullshit, you know. And it saved me a lot of headaches. It saved me more heartaches than headaches. But, and you kids have, for, even the worst of you had some sort of loving, nourishing, parental guidance. Some of you had less than, you know, okay. I had none from my dad, from my mom, yes. But when I look at the, pro, look, how did your program work out? Like I say, right? Being raised that everybody's an asshole, sooner or later, they'll prove it to you. Like the Ayatollah here, you know, the, uh, the fucking Persian pervert, uh, the, the black uh, wannabe uh, King Kong, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, so whose program was, wor was better? I'm standing up here, <laughs> look around, not just, the, I don't mean this room, look around, I've been here 35 years. I haven't had to work in 35 years. His brother fucked him over, right? I mean, I had told him somebody fucked him over. Somebody's currently fucking you over. I can go down the road. Ed, arguably you're the most sophisticated in the room. And that hasn't gotten you much, has it? No. But he had to think about it, didn't he? Okay? I can say no right away. Because I know more about him than he shared. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Kids, I'm going to let you finish. But I mean, when, 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 when uh, Cain and Abel, since Cain and Abel, I forget who slew Cain. Did Cain slew Abel or vice versa? Okay. I would have been the Cain. Okay? All this, uh, this nurturing shit doesn't work. 
And now it's more nurturing than it was 25, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Your parents probably were not raised like you. They had a harder life. And their parents, which are probably from the World War II, and now the, the UK is whinging about all this shit. They're going to cancel their Christmas. Who gives a fuck? We're here working on Christmas Day. And either, either you're smart enough not to whinge about it, or you don't give a shit, otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? You would rather make money in 2021. Well, what you learn here? But, I mean, it's, it's perfect. I love when, a, the best is when a mother turns on a child. I mean, I get my nuts off. I mean, when Mary Kay Cosmetic, the founder, Mary Kay, turned on her boy, I had a permanent heart on for six months. I've seen mother turn on child. I've seen children turn on mother. I've seen children t uh, turn on father, and I've seen brother turn on brother. If prayer worked, if religion worked, we wouldn't be in this motherfucking room. And who are the most religious, the poorest, And the Catholic Church has its hand so far up my ass, I'm surprised it's not coming out my mouth. They own me. And when you get out there, and when I tell you, I want you to rip their fucking heads off and shit down their neck, I mean it. And it's awful difficult to get, keep the shoulders when you got the head ripped off. It's awful difficult to keep, unless it's a little guy, like the Persian pervert, it's hard to keep it, and you gotta, and you gotta lean forward a little bit, and then the shit won't come out because your ass is puckered up. I mean, it ain't easy. It ain't easy. And I'll make sure you get all this, YouTube, you sorry cunts that are taking the fucking holiday off like the sorry pieces of shit that you are. Okay, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I had to get that off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, uh, Did you, is your brother still alive? Karma. <laughs> I, I was angry. Fuck, I was angry. It was about two years I sat there and just contemplated driving home and smashing a hammer through his head. Because so I started my business, I was sleeping in my office, doing 18 hour days. Long as I slept in my office was two and a half weeks. And my wife at the time came and asked me to come home. I'd use my Christmas holidays to go in and refurb the houses and that, you know. Christmas Day, I was pulling carpets and he was back home on the beach. <laughs> uh, but anyway, fast forward to about four years ago. He had a car accident. Pretty bad one. I was in coma for about nine months. Uh, and you pulled the plug. No, no. Well, he's got daughters. He's and, the tree. Yeah, yeah uh, he's got daughters, but I raised one of them. And now she's the one that was at his side, paying for everything, so I was financially supporting her. He's been in um, rehab for about two years now. His head, so he's like, mm -hmm, and he can't walk. No, you don't have to pull the plugs. The big man pulled the plug on him. But I was, you know, I remember I was still in my tree hugging Zen face. And so I was swallowing it, and I'd already set my club up. Remember, peace, love, mug, beans. <clears throat> Don't go home and kill your brother. But the worst thing was, was my father. My father was a wimp. And uh, his upbringing, mum's upbringing, and, and the cultural aspect, like Mr. Pena, my Māori people, it was all about forgive, forget, and all that sort of bullshit. And um, so I, you know, I had to swallow it, and I did. But again, I felt as though I was compromising myself. So... Uh, anyway, bygones be bygones. I got picked myself up, and just as I was about to, the GFC hit. So I moved out of Hamilton, moved the business. Wife and I moved to Auckland, and I, by then I was becoming. I, I cut the group. We were successful, and as we were in the height of our success, I cut it because I discovered that the more, if you're a Zen warrior, the more you do for people, the more they'll demand, and they'll fuck you over and treat you like shit. Fam familiarity. No good deed goes unpunished. No good deed goes unpunished. I learned that from the Greeks at Onassis. Smartest words ever told to me by Constantine Gratzos. But I like uh, Ed, his, his sister killed her uh, father. I like that story too. We, we, uh, we'll get into that one uh, tomorrow.
But see, now, we have just scraped the surface. When I say we're fucked up, I, I, I and this isn't on, I am not exaggerating, am I? And we still got four of the most fucked up people to talk to. And I haven't forgotten you. You know? <laughs> Believe me. I can't wait to hear the Persian pervert story. Of how his grandfather's here, you know, and all that shit. <laughs> Kids, I mean, but in spite of this, uh, all these tales of woe, I mean, it's our market. It just is. It's fucking our market. And we got the three Nazis here that are going to go and rip health care. Uh, I'm going to uh, write uh, Andreas, uh, well, he'll watch. I'm going to write Andreas an email. Uh, don't, don't worry about the three Nazis, Andreas. You know, uh, you know, you got a foothold already. Uh, but, um, it, you know, the, some of the people in the UK, is the market uh, overbought, not overbought, but too many QLA guys? The answer is no. Because even the, the melon heads on YouTube won't pull the trigger. And one of the reasons I, I stopped all the comments on my YouTube, and we got banned from, uh, uh, what's the other one? Cat? Tw no, no, not Twitter. We got banned by Twitter now? Oh, yeah. Oh, Facebook, yeah. It's because they say the same thing over and over again. Everybody's got an opinion, but no, nobody takes action. So after 10 years, of, uh, and I don't really read it, I mean, people in the staff, read, so now we have no comments. So now they say, don't you want to hear what we have to say? No! <laughs> I couldn't give a shit less. And then, then I hurt their feelings now. Because I don't want to, I don't, you know, I never read them anyway, but now they can't make them. Um, um, a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and all that shit. Tonight will be a little different dinner. Um, the... Um, we're going to finish up tomorrow with the, the, the real, uh, let's see, we have one, two, three. Okay, okay, okay. We got, we got a few left, and I hope they're real good sob stories. I want, I want you know, I haven't cried yet. I, I, I want, you know, I want a real fucking tearjerker melodrama soap opera. We're going to finish off in style with them tomorrow morning. Um, and then we're going to get back to the cases. And you've gone around and we've gotten your names, who you did the cases and who he didn't. We're going to go through every fucking case. Every fucking case. Now, any questions from anybody? Oh, your Christmas gift. Where are the Christmas gifts? Oh, in your room. No, no, we're, we're, we're back to ties. We're back to ties. No, that's, not, that's a Christmas gift. No, you can keep yours. All the rest will take back and clean. Okay. <laughs> Now, uh, the, uh, Sally's gotten you, uh, each one of you got three gifts, a couple of exceptions. <laughs> okay, the, the Persian pervert and the black guy we, we didn't get any gifts, but other than that, we treat everybody the same. Um, the, um, but uh, it's, uh, I feel good about when I'm working uh, over the holidays, but this is not dissimilar. I wasn't doing this years ago when we were doing deals, but we certainly... And believe me, when you're doing deals on Christmas Day, the professionals aren't smiling and laughing and having a good time. They're not. They look depressed because they know the shit they're going to get when they go home, get home. And who are they, they going to get their shit from? Their wives? The kids are more understanding than the wives. The kids are more understanding than the wives until the kids reach a certain age. When they're this big, oh, we love you, Daddy, we love you, Dad. Why weren't you here, Daddy? Uh, why are we celebrating? And then, then they're not there at Christmas. But I don't want to, that's a thankless job. Uh, I'm hoping that my grandkids are, are, are treat me better. Because Josh Kim is an introvert. And then Zuckerfucker is an introvert. Elon is an introvert. Bill Gates is an introvert. And what normal and, and, and so is um, Warren Buffett. But what happens is those introverts, let's say that on a scale from one to ten, they're three or fours. 
uh, one being the, uh, the most uh, weak, insignificant, insipid introvert. And when you make uh, 50, 100, or whatever million, and, and you, you have successes that you can look back on, you start going towards the other end of the introvert scale. And because Bill Gates is pretty outspoken now, Warren is pretty outspoken now, Elon is pretty out, but they're still introverts. You get them on a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I mean, uh, nobody, uh, unless you're talking, nobody's talking. Dan Locke is an introvert. You get him in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you're the only one talking. But in, when he's like an actor, when he gets on a stage and he's had a lot of success and he's made quite a bit of money, and so there are very, very, you're right, you all have it in you. But in the beginning, it's like, for those of you that have uh, been camping and you know, and you know how to start a fire when you, you do the piece of wood like this, and okay, there's a spark there, but you gotta find it, so go ahead. Yeah, so basically, I was, I was actually waiting for the YouTube to turn on so I could say this, all right? Well, they, we shut our YouTubes off. No, no, I, I want it on. I want it on. No, 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 no. Oh, oh. But our YouTubes aren't on, on YouTube right now. Oh, uh, that's fine. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be, later, but... Because they're going to they're gonna hunt because... you down like dogs. They, got, they, got, they have dogs and cops at the door, so when you leave. Yeah. Because, like, if I don't say this over YouTube, then it's, it's just me being more of a fucking cunt, all right? It's so like waiting till like all the cameras are off and then you're saying it so there's 16 people, 17 people that can hear it. That's bullshit. Like I, like I fucking sat there like yesterday with this fuckhead over here, fucking blabbing his little fucking mouth. And I still fucking sat there smiling, looking at him. I hear it and I fucking, out of all the places I, I hear it and I feel it, I feel it most here. And it's because, Mr. Penny, you don't know, like you are like my father. You are my fucking dad. It's just I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't fucking, I couldn't stand him. I want to fucking kill him. Your dad. I want to kill my fucking dad. I want to kill my fucking brother. I want to kill a fucking lot of people. You have no fucking idea. That, 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 that little hatchet over there, that little fucking, I used to carry fucking machetes to school. I used to fucking smash everyone. And then fucking over the last fucking 20 years, I went into like this corporate world. Oh, because I studied to be a lawyer, I fucking softened it down. I have fuck wits over here fucking talking my fucking ear off. Talking to me, why? Because you want him to be your fucking chairman. He's not going to be a chairman because you're a fucking idiot. You know? And then, fuck, I just knew there was down a fuck. And then, like, out of this whole fucking room, there's only one guy I fucking probably relate to the most, right? That little fucking shit over there. That fucking rage. Okay. And that's it. That's what I want. I want it on fucking record. I'm not going to fuck it. I'm not going to tolerate it no more. You know? Like, I like people. I like people because I like myself. But, like, I can't stand these fucking human beings. Like, it is fucked up what you say. The world is fucked up because I still rather have my dad be my dad because I'm fucking harder than fucking everyone here. Right? Because I've seen all the other guys in, in Sydney, in Australia. They fucking grew up like pussies. And I became a fucking pussy because I'm fucking, I'm not fucking being who I am. And that's it. Softness and pussiness rubs off. I was raised in the environment that hardly ever saw that. I've said four or five times, sometimes I said it tongue in cheek, sometimes I said it seriously, you wouldn't have gotten past 15, 16 years old where I lived, where I got raised. Because you had to be a hard ass. You had to be a hard ass, you had to be a fight. And uh, the, uh, the, I was the biggest kid growing up until I was about 13 or 14, and then other guys, got bigger than me, but not many. But if I hadn't been in that environment, because I have cousins that come from the, we have two sides of the family. We have my mother's side that came across an illegal alien that probably 10 or 20% of them are still illegal. And we got my dad's side, who was born in the United States, uh, and the uh, education uh, was their way out of the barrio, and so we have uh, some accountants, mostly teachers, uh, college professors, etc., PhD kind of people. Uh, but there's two sides. And the two sides, all these years, I'm 75 years old, the two sides have never mixed. They've never been to the same party, the same Christmas. Each side has their own Christmas parties. Each side has their own Thanksgiving parties because the snooty 
well-educated side thinks that the other side is trash. And they are. They're Mexican uneducated trash. Um, but my Mexican uneducated trash made me tough. Everybody on the other side of the family is a wuss. A wuss. They come and take your wallet and spit in your Somebody would come and take their wallet and spit in their face. They wouldn't do anything. Remember that test? What would you do if somebody came, and I forget the exact words, what would you do if somebody came and spit in your mom's face, your girlfriend's face, whatever the words were? Um, and 98 or 97 percent of the people that answered the test worldwide wouldn't do anything. Wouldn't do anything. And that's the state of the world now. A, a real example of it going back to world, before World War II is when the Prime Minister of Britain went to make a deal with uh, uh, Hitler and he came back and he got off the plane and he, he shook this piece of paper saying there will be no war in Europe and uh, Hitler's agreed not to invade all these. Four days later, Hitler <laughs> invaded Poland and all these things. And because we, the world has gotten wussy, he's gotten wussy. We all have it in us, but it's how hard you're willing to dig for it, how hard you're willing to scrape, how hard you're willing to, not everybody can start a fire that way. Your hands get raw, you know, how hard you're willing to do it. And it's no different here. The people that stay focused first, the longest. Getting focused first isn't any big task. Staying focused the longest is. And the ones that have stayed focused the longest have made the most money. Marcus Bauer is a classic example. Um, but he had the advantage of being a world-class athlete, and he knew what it was uh, to not win a gold medal. And so he has put all his aggression uh, that he uh, wasn't able to uh, come to fruition in athletics uh, and making money. And he's, he's done a hell of a job. He's done a hell of a job. Uh, what else about Mr. Ford? Yes, sir. I love how, oh, sorry. I love how he had a, a vision to put an automobile in every, well, get everyone to own an automobile. He had a vision, and I don't even think it was um, an American citizen's dream yet. It but, wasn't and so, at that time. And his vision was a reality, and he was seeing it for people even dreaming it. But not only did he do that, he enabled them to see the dream and then put in the financial means or gave them a means by which they could realize that dream. Yeah, but the, 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 the sidebar to that, and they only allude to it briefly, is he needed an extra uh, uh, force to buy his cars, an extra universe. And he had, I don't, I don't know, 40,000 employees or 20, whatever he had. Well, they made it affordable. The other thing I don't think they brought out in the film, he, he was the first one to have a payment plan. And so he allowed his, he paid him a daily wage. It was a living at that time. I think it was $5 a day. But $2 a day could go towards the payment of a car. And so he, he couldn't sell the shit. So the serendipity of it was that he, he developed, one, payment plans, and two, he, he, uh, he gave the working man uh, an ability to have a car, an automobile, uh, which was uh, new. And I mean, uh, Steve Jobs, he didn't give the working man necessarily because I think, even though I don't buy Apple stuff, I don't know how much it costs, but I'm told it's expensive. Whereas Apple, when it started, it was more expensive than the regular stuff, but it wasn't as expensive as it is now. Um, the, um, but, but these are guys uh, that um, cared about themselves first. And what it, did, it wasn't clear, and it didn't go into in the uh, Building America thing you saw last night, how uh, vicious Ford was towards his kid, uh, Etzel. And, um, the, uh, and these guys are, I mean, it's my way or the highway. And most people that come to the seminar don't live that, my way or the highway. Because you've taught to be a pussy like he alludes to, um, you, that's what you've been taught. And uh, when, I, when I went off to school, uh, and especially now, because I've told you this before, when I was growing up, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you. That was the mantra of growing up from the 50s, 60s, and early into the 70s. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Now it's flipped just the opposite. 
Now, if you call somebody ugly in Britain, it's a hate crime. It's a hate crime. If you call somebody fat in Britain, it's a hate crime. A fucking hate crime. You go to jail, big time jail. But three kids that killed a policeman drugging for a mile behind their car, a 15, 16, and 17 year old, now they're 18, 19, 20, killed the guy. His limbs came off when they were pulling him. Uh, got seven years. Seven years. Another guy in Australia, I think it was, he uh, 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 kidnapped the girl, put her in a suitcase, maybe, it might have been New Zealand, put her in a suitcase and buried her. He got 17 years. Both the seven-year sentence and the 17-year sentence uh, will probably get off uh, with a third time served because the prisons are so crowded. The prisons are so crowded. So the world is flipped. It's flipped. What else about uh, the, yes sir, in the back. I want, I want to follow up on what our Australian hatchet man said. Um, it's very interesting that in reality we probably should spend 10% of the time talking about deals and the rest of the time talking about us as a problem. Because QLA works, but in the end we spend so much time talking about deals, but we are still the, the issue. Yeah, but, well, no, well, the, the seminar is, is transformed, and uh, the mix that we are now has the highest rate of me seeing deals done. In the years gone by, deals, remember I told you we had a 12-year success and a 13-year success, and we've got dozens and dozens and dozens of 5- to 10-year successes, but I'm not interested in that. Back in those days, because I didn't think I was going to coach this long, I didn't think I'd be here 28 years later, 27 years later. Remember, it's how deep it is that you, until you find it, the you. Now, if you, if, 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 you, if you guys had been raised in different environments, remember, you're a product of your social economic milieu. You're a product of how you were raised. Ed, most things came easy to him by his own admission, right? Oh, he's not talking, but he shook his head, yeah. Okay. Uh, nothing came easy to me. Nothing. I mean nothing. Till I went into the military, and I found out, well, I'm fucking pretty tough. And I got through the program, I went through the ranger school. Fuck! Not many of us got through. And then they pinned the bars on me. You're a gentleman and an officer by the act of the fucking United States Congress of America. And that was it. That was the beginning of the beginning for me. Because instead of being in jail all the times I was and trying to kill my teacher, blah, 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 you know, and, the, uh, and that was it. You need to find that thing. And in most cases, it's your first deal. Josh Kim was just a loudmouth introvert but loudmouth kid until he did his first deal. And then the rest is history. Most are at Josh's end of the continuum, not at Marcus Bauer's end of the continuum. Most of you are closer to Josh than you are Marcus. And that's just the way it is. But I never, I, uh, you know, I, I knew guys like Ed that everything was easy. They got good grades. It didn't seem like they studied at all. Uh, they were super athletes. Blah, blah, blah. They go off to Stanford on a, on a fucking football scholarship, or they went off to Notre Dame University. On a... But that wasn't me. I was with a dunce cap. Now, just imagine if you had sat during the six years of grammar school in a corner with a dunce cap almost every day. And then they put you in a closet uh, and then waiting for your parents to pick you up, and I used to shit myself. And I just imagine, little kids are ugly, right? And they pull me out of the, and I've got feces on my cape, on the back of my pants, and urine down my legs. Just, just think of that. Now, in today's, I'd own the United, uh, uh, Los Angeles City School District. I would own them. But now that, that, that can't happen. 
Pina, you wetback Mexican. Just imagine calling. And I told you before, it's not what they say. It's how you interpret it. And my dad just, you know, he wouldn't allow me to feel sorry for myself. Whereas when you go home and you feel bad and your wife puts, well, maybe, puts your, 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 your head on, on their, her bosom and says, it's all right, honey, it's all right, it's all right. Well, that's wrong. If you want to be a tough motherfucker and shit, rip their heads off and shit down their neck, why do you think I keep emphasizing running towards the gunfire and killing everybody? Metaphorically, because I know you've never even aspired to do something like that. But you have to think that way. Like a lot of kids play video games where they're uh, not only cops and robbers, but military and they're sea, Navy SEALs and shit. Like I think all those games are wrong because that's not life. You're not getting hurt there. When you get eliminated in the game, it's not because you got a bullet in you. And that's the closest we have to um, that kind of thing. Clayton Ford, who I knew a long, long time ago, was just a nice kid who happened to be a Ford. And of course, he's, and Ford set up his company. He's one of the few that still, Ford still controls Ford because they have most of their shares, the voting shares, in the Ford Foundation Trust. And Zuckerberg is following that model. Whereas most of the other companies that were founded by these guys, they don't, you know, they don't control them anymore because they lost control. But old man Ford, who did a lot of ugly things, but all the guys did a lot of ugly things. So the real question is, how much ugliness are you willing to do? That's the real motherfucking question. How much ugliness? If you want to be a big motherfucking hitter, you want to be big multi-billionaire, how much ugliness are you willing to do? Murder, I don't recommend, but we've had them in here, believe me, okay? Uh, larceny, you don't have to do larceny. Uh, you don't have to do uh, malfeasance and steal money from the company. And uh, Okay, so we're moving down from the very end of the ugliness. Uh, how much ugliness? I've fired divisions before. Thousands and thousands of people that I put out of work, you know, some of which had to go bankrupt because the government didn't come and bail them out. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, don't, I didn't lose not one fucking hour to sleep. Some of you have never fired anybody in your life. I hope I'm wrong when I say this. Some of you will never fire anybody in your life, and if that's the case, you're going to fail at QLA because the first board is in transition. And if you can't pull the trigger on them, I don't mean literally, but figuratively, you're going to be stuck with guys and gals that take you down the toilet. They take you down. So how much ugliness are you willing to swallow? How much ugliness are your wife willing to swallow to watch you change? How much ugliness is, are your kids, if your kids mean anything to you, or with their thought process, or how they feel? Because you still want to be loved by them. Whereas Steve Jobs and I didn't even want to be liked by them. At least I admitted the kids were mine. Do you see? But you can still make 50, 100, 200 million dollars and still be liked. I don't know about loved, but you can still be liked. And it's one thing for you to say, I don't care what people say or think about me, and it's a completely different thing to act that way. When I came to Britain, how many Brits do we have in the room? Just one, okay. When I came to Britain, I said, and I was wearing a brown suit. I still remember this. I show up at a meeting, everybody's got dark gray or black suits. I'm wearing a brown, expensive suit. I'm wearing Italian shoes with a, with a point. Nobody's wearing Italian shoes with a point, brown shoes like that. And uh, somebody, a, a nice guy, uh, took me aside and says, Mr. Pena, you probably noticed that we're all wearing uh, dark suits. And I appreciate it and I thank you very much. And so my, dark, my brown suit went down. But I used to say, I'm an American, you can't hurt my feelings. Just give me the fucking money. 
1981, apparently nobody had ever said that. Probably nobody's ever said it since. And they were, they were, they were uh, confounded. I mean, they, they couldn't believe it. Uh, but I didn't care. You couldn't hurt my feelings. You still can't hurt my fucking feelings. Almost everybody in this room, at some level, they can still hurt your feelings. And some of you will be concerned about, oh, how's this going to affect my family? Most of the LinkedIn my children get, they're trying to trace me down. Most of the friends and shit like that on Facebook, they're trying to chase me down. Not them. So my kids have learned to live with it. They learned to live with it. It's like, I tell you, Bruce Whipple, God love him. Uh, he's never complained to me once, but people chase him down. And now he lives in a fucking log cabin in, fucking in, the, in the mountains of Maine. At some, level, at some level. So that's what you have to decide. I'm not telling you to go be like Carnegie and beat people with axe handles. I'm not telling you. But if I can pull you from this block to this block, and I don't know, I'm making this up as I go. Every block I can pull you towards this is 10 times more money. Maybe 100 times more money. Maybe 1,000 times more money. That's why I say 5% of my communications is you're a billionaire. But I got to pull you this way, and that's why we go back to that painting that's very apropos a Chinaman, a Mexican, and a black kid. Me, I'm going to add a Vietnamese now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guys, success leaves clues. How many fucking clues do I have to show you? But losers leave clues as well. And for the most part, not 100% of your family are losers. But vis-a-vis... Creating generational wealth, I'm pretty safe to say that almost all your relatives are losers. Because I, <laughs> unless you're lying in the paperwork, nobody in this fucking room alluded to a grandparent, a parent that had gener made a whole shitload of money. Somebody made 20 million, somebody made 5 million, but no, nobody made hundreds of millions. No one. So, I mean, um, as I say, unless your parents were Andrew Agassi and Steffi Graf, both world champion, gold medalists, many grand slams, their kids have role models. The Williams sisters, father was a fanatic, and they became world champs. Tiger Woods' father was a fanatic, and he became who he is. And then there's you and the rest of us. My dad was a fanatic, but not about that. What else about the Ford movie, if anything? Yes, sir. Maybe even more important than the car he built was coming up with the assembly line. Oh, yeah. Everybody, not everybody, I don't forget it, but almost everybody forgets that. Now, somebody would have come up with an assembly line down the road, but he did it then. I mean, that's genius. He went from uh, uh, six cars a day to 50 cars a day or something, whatever it was, where they were spending eight hours on a car and then now two hours on a car. I mean, that, that is really thinking outside the box, truly outside the box. But he was a gifted guy. But he treated his son, Edsel, like a piece of shit until he died. Nothing the kid ever did made any sense. Now, I can appreciate that because nothing my children do satisfies me. I, can, I understand that, but not that they're a piece of shit. And I told you last night, I told some of you, uh, we talked to our daughter at 6.30, and uh, she's alone in Chicago, Christmas, with her dog. And it, pull, I, it did pull a little at my heart, a little, for maybe two seconds. And I, you're a big girl, sweetheart. You're living large, and you're making the big bucks. It's part of the pay price to action. And that was the way I wiggled off the hook. 
And then she says, thank you for the, the, the money we gave her. And I said, well, if I knew you were living that large, we wouldn't have given you so much money. And uh, the, uh, so that was my way of diverting that I might say something gushy, wishy, soft. Um, but uh, the, uh, and, and she'll see this, assuming we get, we get back on YouTube, she'll see this. And uh, she'll lay in, 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 in the bushes waiting for me. To, until she can spring it on me. Because one of the things, and I tell you, when you get a no answer, by the way, at the banks, what w would I have to do, what would it take for you to consider this a credible, acceptable transaction? So when I tell them no over the years, Daddy, what, what, how do we have to change it to get it, make it yes from you? I've heard this a thousand times from the kids, our kids. But it will... Flip some financial institutions, but if it doesn't flip them, it will at least open the door again. And if it, you know, in some cases, they'll come out and tell you, you know, it's your CFO. We don't think he's CFO material. And in some cases, kids, when you open that door, it's you. You're not CEO material. So when they tell you you're not CEO material, what do you tell them? Or what do you do? What's your action? Yeah, I, I say get fucked. Yes, sir. Huh? Okay, or you can find a, a great CEO. So the door's not closed. And our job is, remember from when you walk in, you want to get them on their back foot. What's your lending credit limit? Blah, 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 blah. Secured, unsecured. All those things that are in the script. Because all we need is a little leverage, just a little leverage. But we still have to, you know, and when we, we uh, come up short, it's almost always because we haven't put out enough effort, enough volume. And then when we do, the kids make it happen. One the thing I've just read from Canada, 60-40, uh, you know, no 2% two, 2 interest. No, I mean, this kid, and I, rem I remember who the kid is, a nice enough kid, but he's still a kid. I don't know, 26, 27 years old. And um, uh, the other part of the letter is he, uh, try, uh, he tried to do it, even though the South African uh, streets are paved with gold, he couldn't make it work in, go in South Africa. He's a South African, I left that part out, and he went to Canada to make it happen. Canada accepts anybody. I mean, yeah, I mean, they accept anybody. Um, no, he's a South African, grown up, and he went from South Africa to Canada because for whatever reason, um, he, uh, he I, I, and I didn't even tell you, he didn't write me about it. He says, I was embarrassed. Uh, you know, uh, Anneli's knocking him dead. Now, this is a white South African, not a black South African, which shouldn't make any difference. Uh, the, uh, I just I went to Canada because I had to get the fucking thing done. Uh, his goal was to get it done before the year end, and, and he, he signed the shit on uh, Christmas Eve, and, uh, and that's and it's a big deal. It's a pretty big fucking deal. Twenty million in revenue pre-COVID, fourteen million in revenue this year. Sixty forty. I mean, it, 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 it looks just like the except bigger numbers, uh, and bigger and better numbers than I showed you in the illustrated example yesterday. because he wasn't willing to take no for an answer. Not dissimilar to the Belgian guy that went to the Netherlands. If you're not willing to take no for an answer, you can get a lot of shit done in life. And uh, don't confuse me with the facts. I may be wrong, but I'm never in doubt. All these things these guys feel. My, my father was a, prim uh, a primary example he, he uh, you know, the, and, uh, as I told you last night, I was raised, everybody's an asshole. And in time, they will prove it to you. you know, and part of that asshole, a thief, a crook, a man that uh, you can't trust his word. These were all part of the definition of an asshole. And he said, over time, Dan, Danny, they will prove to you that they're not worthy of your friendship. And he was right. 
fuck, he was right. And whereas you weren't. And again, part of the role model, um, because my parents didn't want me to speak English with a Mexican accent, a Spanish accent. They never spoke Spanish in the house. They made me listen to classical music since I'm three, four years old, instead of the rock and whatever they, back in the 50s. I played tennis, I played golf, and I took ballroom dancing. And you had to have a suicide fucking wish in, in, in the hood to play tennis, golf, free lessons at the park, and ballroom dancing. I mean, fortunately, I was a big kid. If I had been a little kid, I mean, I fuck, I probably got beaten to death. But so my parents, in their way, were setting it up, and then the, the coup de grace, after I tried to kill my teacher, is my mother made my father move from the hood to the valley, the San Fernando Valley, in a house we couldn't afford, because she thought it was the environment. And then when I went to the valley, in, I still got in trouble. She finally dawned on her, it's Danny. Because I didn't get quite as much trouble. Because the kids wouldn't fight in the valley. Where I come from, they fight. You, you drop a nickel and they fight for it. But in the San Fernando Valley, I was an anomaly. And they didn't, you know, they, they weren't willing to fight. So I got away with more murder. Not murder, literally. But my parents were doing their very, and it was actually my mom that pushed that. And the second one was in the Osaka, Japan. And as I said, I find it over the internet. And can you read English? Yes, sir. OK, continue. So it was the A unit, 31 unit, and B unit was 16 of them. And C, uh, C1, uh, you know, the grade of it, it was three of them. Okay, when you say, oh, you lost me, okay, what? We, we just had a fucking text. We don't have any numbers. The numbers were included in the text. To make a long story short, we just looked at how many units there are. They had A units, B units, and T, uh, C units. I think together it's up to 51, 51 or, or 49 units together. They rent the units, first of all. Second of all, they offer service. But So these are apartments? The apartments, right. Okay. Apartments in a big uh, building. So a lot of apartments, apartments uh, on the first floor. Got nothing to do with healthcare. Huh? Has nothing to do with healthcare. It has something to do with healthcare okay. because there are working uh, 25 employees and the employees are nurses more or less and they offer the service. But also you can buy some meals and they bring you meals and they clean your house and you have some additional, I don't know, um, hobby rooms and all that bullshit. But you have two amounts, uh, two sources of money. Um, if you are the, the company who owns it, you have the source of money for renting, you get the rent from the people, and you can offer the service. So, and, but we don't have any uh, big numbers. We don't have a, sh a sheet or something like that. So what we did, we um, looked at the, the revenue per rent just in the, in, in the average posi position. So. Uh, we counted um, 31 A units, 16 B units, C units, 50. So how much we have to pay for all of this uh, divided by three. So we got a more or less uh, amount per month uh, for average. average amount per month uh, for the rent, only for the rent, not for the service, $1,082 per month. Um, then we, because it's 50 units, we multiplied it by 50. So we have uh, 55. Um, you're a dollar per month, but you have some vacancy there. So we um, times uh, we, we we counted it ti uh, zero times nine percent. So we thought, okay, ten percent vacancy is more or less okay. We got an amount per month for for almost fifty k times twelve. We had a revenue from uh, five hundred thousand. 584,000 uh, revenue per year for the renting service, just for the renting service. The same kind of uh, uh, algorithm we used for the service, um, for the healthcare service they um, offer. And there we got 140K, so in total, they made a revenue, just a revenue for 720K per year, plus minus, I don't know. With no services. No service, uh, in included. The services included. 
And how much are you charging for the services? It was 70 years. Uh, they, 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 they charged for the services 140K. 140,000, and for the rent, they uh, so charged. So that's 140K for the, all the units? All the units, the services, but the average amount. So I, they, they had seven steps for services. The first service was, was 79 uh, euro, uh, dollar, and the last service, 309 dollar. We average it out, comes to 231 dollar. Yeah, but just because we don't have any, it's also just a fucking business plan. So we don't have any real idea. Um, but then we tried to figure out, okay, is it worth or is it not worth? So they had 25 employees. If you take a look at the employees, we uh, did a little research in uh, Japan. A normal nurse gets uh, $2,300 per month. Um, and there are 25 nurses. We um, counted uh, the 25 times 200, uh, 2,300, then we got 6, 9, um, 690,000, 690, but most of the time in these kind of facilities, they, it's not a full-time equivalent. So we just guessed, okay, a lot of people don't work full-time here, there, so we uh, counted it times 70%, so we got Cost for the employees, 480k. Then we subtracted 720. From 483, right? So 237 thousand dollars. So a year. A year. And they own the building. They uh, own all the facility stuff around this, but they have to pay rent and maybe will have some additional costs. So we electricity, electricity and water. Stuff. We just deducted hundred thousand dollar from hundred thousand dollar from the two hundred thirty-seven k. It comes to the estimate cost because we don't have anything on it. It was hundred thirty-seven k, and we multiply by three time EBITDA. It comes to the four hundred eleven thousand dollar. And it's the nineteen percent. It's just a guesstimate, and it comes to the nineteen percent. And it costs what? I mean, the the the, the total package is. 720. No, no, no. This is, this, these are for sale, right? The units, the 50 units. No, sir. Just for renting. Ah, uh, okay. But just for renting and we don't have the cost how much they want to sell it or whatsoever. So we just added up through the numbers that we had. We just, all of them are estimate. So we figured out the revenue is going to be 720,000 based on the numbers, and we said, okay, by the 25 nurse that we had over there is the expenses, and they're getting $2,300 a month, 25 of them. So we said it's a $690,000, their wages. I follow, I follow. And then we said, as he said, because he's in the healthcare, and we said uh, not all of them are gonna be full employees. So. We did the 7%. I got you, I got you, okay. It comes to the $483,000. Then over here, we deduct the uh, uh, $483,000 from $720,000. It comes to $237,000. Then we just said for expenses, just the expenses, electricity, and every bullshit, it's $100,000, which I didn't write it here. And estimate cost was $137,000 thousand dollar with three percent EBITDA we did four hundred eleven thousand dollars. Not three percent EBITDA. Yes, three percent, three percent EBITDA. Three, three times. times. So we would pay three to five times EBITDA for eleven K or more and um, then we uh, sub uh, uh, what they call it what they call I forgot subtract the hundred thirty seven divided hundred thirty seven by seven hundred twenty that EBITDA was nineteen percent. Just okay. I got you. Okay. Okay. So it's got well, other than applying some QLA uh, methodology, this has nothing to do with what we're doing. No. Or, or did I miss something? I mean. Uh, pervert, did I miss something? 
<laughs> oh, okay. I just, I, I had to hear that uh, twice, maybe. Whenever I, I don't hear something clearly, I, well, maybe I am getting on scent dimensions. So I'll listen to it one more time. If it's, it's the same information I got the first time, then, okay, okay, fine, sit down. Okay, what was your question? EJ, can I have a pen, please? No, no. I used to, back when I was hungry, not like you guys, you guys are flush. You're all living large. I understand that. But if you were hungry, when I was hungry, I used to, you know, because the Wall Street Journal doesn't, uh, on page four are all the deals for Dan Pena. You know, it, it, life's not that way. It's just like I found the refineries, blah, blah, blah. I used to look for shortages, uh, supply shortages. They now call it supply uh, 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 line uh, management. They didn't call it that back in the day. I'd look for where, where there's an oversupply and undersupply and who produce it. And then I used to look at it geographically. And this was based on my experience from government contracts because I knew some government agency was trying to sell shit there sometime. Okay, so the um, b back in the day, uh, municipal bonds were hot. And they were hot because the income you got from municipal bonds were tax-free, okay? And in the United States, they were tax-free not only at the federal level, uh, uh, but at uh, the uh, state level. For example, Puerto Rico is a tax-free place where bonds are tax-free. So I went where old people like tax-free income. I don't, but all, most old people like tax-free income. And, 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 and the hubs of that used to be Florida, Arizona, uh, Nevada, and a couple other states I don't recall, remember now. And I go and see their, their, um, their supply of tax-free income vis-a-vis -vis municipal bonds that came from cities, state, counties, municipalities. And I developed a product that had similar tax-free aspects to it. And we called it a tax deferred annuity. I, I went in, uh, uh, convinced an insurance company called Executive Life, a guy named Carr, C-A-R-R, -R, was a founder of it, because he was always looking for new products. And I, to uh, I told him exactly what I'm telling you. And uh, th there was an oversupply. All the municipal bonds got sold out in Arizona, every single one of them. There was never an overage. So they liked tax-free income. So the question was, would they accept tax-free income until they drew it out of the entity, because if things that grow a tax-free grow a lot faster. Okay, and uh, we developed the product, the tax-free annuity. Uh, but what you're really asking me is, I look for where there was shortages of supply across the food chain. Food chain, I don't mean by food, across the marketing chain, and where I could plug in government supplies to to uh, fill that shortage. And that's what I went after. And that's how I found uh, the oil refining business. And uh, then I, I found it in financial service business vis-a-vis -vis tax deferred annuity. But insurance companies have got little interns, MBAs from big schools looking at markets day in and day out to see where all the products got sold. Okay, before co Corona, face masks, you could buy them any place. Right? I mean, there's no big deal. Then all of a sudden, when everybody thought they had to wear one, I mean, there became a shortage of them, right? And a couple of the, my kids, QLA kids, have made a lot of money finding uh, third world suppliers. Some of the suppliers didn't perform. India didn't perform. Belarus didn't perform. Russia didn't perform. But Japan did perform in several other countries. And they covered the shortage in almost every state in the United States, almost every country in the EU, was on the market to buy face masks, okay? So they matched up the buyers or the potential buyers with the people that um, were uh, producing them. And then we looked at manufacturers. Well, who is only uh, producing a 10 or 20 or 30% of their capacity? And almost everybody that made face masks was only producing a 10 or 20 or 30% of capacity. So then you match those. And that's how a couple of my kids got to be over Corona. 
because, but you have to have a lot of them because some don't perform. And you have to do it where there are not as few middlemen as possible. Because normally in a two or three or four billion dollar contract, there's five or six or ten middlemen. In other words, I know, you know a guy, and, and so. Um, the, um, and and that's, that's one method. And so there's some guys that just have done that all their lives. And it's the easiest to do with government contracts. It's the easiest to do with government contracts. And government contracts aren't just at the federal level. They're at the EU level. They're at the, uh, however Germany's broken up into, uh, not, uh, not counties, uh, Bavaria is a what? State. Uh, Canada's got 12 provinces. Uh, uh, Toronto's got uh, uh, government contracts uh, uh, for the hospitals, for the uh, schools, for, I mean, and I mean, that's why there's 10 million contracts a day in the United States. There's a million contracts a day in the UK. I told you a couple uh, seminars ago, we had a guy get two contracts during the hardcore. He was already working on them. And he got one, uh, no, no big money, 240,000 pounds for painting lines on the M26. M26 is a freeway down south, uh, 240,000 pounds. Uh, he fucked it up. He went and hired not homeless people, but almost homeless people to draw the fucking lines and the lines look like this. And so he wound up, instead of, he, he should have made 200 grand, he made 40 grand because he had to do it twice. Then he had to go get professional line guys to do the lines on the, uh, on the M26. And it's, it's just going through and finding uh, where there's a shortage in one area, there's, there's an overage in another area, and matching them. And that's all it is, it's pretty fucking simple. Uh, I told you the story, I got st stopped in the lobby of this, by this big tall Sikh guy in the lobby of the uh, Ritz Hotel. And he said, please, 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 Mr. Penny, I brought you a gift. Blah, 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 blah. And there at the concierge desk, he opened up his laptop to UK.gov, and he showed me all the contracts he was fulfilling. He says, yeah, it made me a multimillionaire. I said, yeah, I, I, I know that game. I know that game. He says, I don't know why everybody doesn't do it. I still don't know why everybody doesn't do it. But they don't. Yeah, in America, yeah. 10 million, millions. In the old days, they only did government contracts in April and October, 40 years ago. And paperwork, this is not much of an exaggeration. So when I went to Marion Refinery that was only operating at 40% capacity, you don't want to do business with the government because nobody wanted to do the paperwork. No matter how profitable it was, how bad you want it. He was getting a salary, $185,000 a year at the time, whether it operated 100% capacity or 40% capacity. So then I went out and I knew there was a shortage of JP4 and 5, and I said, I'll do all the paperwork, which I didn't, I hired somebody to do the paperwork, right? Um, and the, uh, in the old days, you had to have a, uh, a, a registered, and if you're a minority with one eye or one tit and you're a vet and you got uh, uh, cerebral palsy and you got cancer, there's special dispensations, 8A special dispensations, and the federal government and the UK government, by law, by statute, by man mandatory statute, have to do business, 15 to 20 percent of their business has to be placed with minorities. Has to, by law. And they go unfulfilled every motherfucking year. They can't find enough black people, enough Chinamen, that will bid. I'm sure they got a deal for a new, uh, I mean, I'm positive. Fucking, if you came in with tattoos and shit all over, it'd be better. The Netherlands, I mean, by mandate by law. But it's tedious, it's a pain in the ass. But once you get on that gravy train, people that I bid against in 1982 are still sucking that milk in 2020. Because once you get on that milk, I mean, that is sweet. You never want to let go. And then they, they put a limit. You can only do $10 million now. They set up 100 companies, all doing $9 million five. As we speak today. 
I told you the mad dog guys, you know, the two guys that sold the ammunition in the Iraqi war and went to jail? They, yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that room they sat. In graduation night, they're all bragging, well, we're going to fuck the government where it breathes. I still remember. We're going to fuck them big time. We're going to make you proud, Mr. P. But they, they went a little too far, and they're in jail. And the thing about them almost getting killed in Iraq, that's all bullshit. They didn't, they didn't go with the, the guns in the truck. That's all horse shit. They paid a moron to go do that. They sat back in the fucking Sheraton Hotel, you know, and, um, but they made a whole bunch of money if they hadn't just, and then, they, then they, part of what they uh, sold, they stole. That part of the movie's true. But I, I told you, Chris Josefowitz in 1996 graduated from Har uh, Harvard, Oxford, came to the seminar. I said, you ought not go home, change your name to Christian uh, Connolly, go to Silicon Valley, and he sold, he raised a little less than a billion dollars on two deals that had failed at Oxford in their, you know, biochem shit, failed both the fraudulent deals, he raised almost a billion dollars in Silicon Valley. And, and then he bid on the government contract for in the uh, green zone, I already said this, during the Iraqi war, and, the, um, and he, he won it, he underbid everybody by six, seven, eight hundred million, and then he hired G4 to do the contract, and then he went on, I mean, so um, it, it's easy peasy. Yeah, yeah, you can go to states that don't require doctor's ownership and use this structure. You just have to have this structure where it requires doctor ownership. Because there's, there's places you don't have to have doctor ownership. Uh, is, is copious or is involved uh, is this. Uh, the, um, but so he, he's alluding, I believe, well, if I do it this way and it's, i.e., the hardest environment, then I can use the hardest environment anywhere. Right? right? Yeah. Okay. And what I would do is I wouldn't start with the hardest. You know, I want, I want the girl, the, the fourth best looking girl on the bar because I don't have time to, and there's 46 guys hustling the first three, you know, and, 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 and I've been very, very successful uh, by any, sh no matter what benchmarks you use. And so, uh, and then over time, just like the one million, one and a half million, even though it sounds like chicken shit, it works. And you, you, you've seen countless examples that it works. Uh, and then when you're a, a hundred or three hundred million dollar entity, and uh, you set up a, another holding company, a uh, subsidiary, to attack the tough guys or the tough states. Uh, I already told you, substance abuse is a son of a bitch in any state, no matter how you do it. Um, so, but it's getting your, your first deal done. Even though I, I, I tease the kid about his first deal, it's a first deal, I don't give a shit. It's a first deal. You know, the, you know, the, the rest is history. Uh, even though I started with government contracts, I've never, well, I won't say I never, I rarely have done com government contracts since that first year. I have had owned companies that did government contracts, that we did supply various things to various government entities. But it's not my bread and butter that in the beginning, it was my bread and butter. But see, I saw that as not being a difficult, whereas the industry found it difficult because of all the paperwork. Now, it's online, I mean, and there's millions of them. And uh, you know, and uh, there used to be, I don't know if this is still true, there used to be no limit on how many bids you can make. So you can bid on A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. There were no limits. And in fact, you gotta get one of them. Uh, so it's Pandora's box. But um, the, uh, and as I pointed out to you, very few kids have gone down that road, even though I've given you four or five examples where they made a lot of money because it's, it's, um, it's this kind of thing, uh, you know, the, uh, um, not on steroids, because it's not, but I mean, you, there's government compliance and there's the, the government ch uh, changes its mind and serendipity and this can happen and that can happen. 
and you really don't have any recourse unless you're willing to file a suit against the federal government, and then you're pissing in the wind. I mean, or file a suit against the British government, you're pissing in the wind. I mean, you know, even though there is a rule of law, even though there is real recourse, unless you're IBM suing the federal government, you're, I mean, you're crazy. I mean, you're, you're wasting your time for all the obvious reasons. Um, and those suits rarely are lost by the government. But the, um, this was, is too tough in my judgment for a first deal. And there's a lot easier deals. There are, there are a lot easier deals. Um, and, I, and that's why I steer, not everybody, but almost everybody to assisted living. The, the bottom third of assisted living is the most consistent that you can find. It just is. It just is. There's no, there's no comparison. Uh, I haven't had anybody do uh, uh, crematorium, that kind of roll up in a, in a while. Um, but I mean, there, there are easier deals. And you can always morph after you get your first deal or two. Meaning, morph is staying in the same vertical, slightly different. Pivot is when you go from healthcare to uh, construction. Okay, that, I mean, you're, you're getting completely out into a, a different field. And then you have board problems. Uh, rarely will your, um, your uh, uh, industry expert be, uh, you'll be able to use them. But then there's conglomerates. Now, I'm not suggesting, because conglomerates is a whole other ball of fur. Uh, you need, in my judgment, you need four or five uh, industry experts. And you need a couple of generalists of those that are generalists that have done a lot of deals. I'd be considered a generalist. Uh, and, but I mean, conglomerates, then you can go for the low hanging fruit in any industry. And in any industry, i.e. Nelly and a few others are doing that very thing. And, uh, and he's doing it very successfully as I've already pointed out. Um, but then you, Right now, in theory, you're all generalists because you don't know anything about anything, <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> you're generalists, okay? Uh, but it's, uh, but just pull, I mean, pull the trigger on something. You know, I don't, you know, when I say I don't give a fuck what it is, that's not quite accurate, but I don't really give a fuck what it is. I know that once you taste the blood, I mean, you'll never be the same. You just won't. You, I mean, I've seen, Countless guys and gals just never be the same. I mean, they, uh, you'll think that uh, Henry Ford was a nice guy. You, you'll think that uh, Andrew Carnegie and uh, the Commodore were nice guys. Once you get in the hunt, well, I can understand why he, he burned that, that, that factory to the ground, or I can, you know, you, you either close down the refineries like Rockefeller did, or you fuck around with all the employees. It's a pretty simple choice to me. Uh, he, at least he didn't burn down the refineries. He could have done that. Collected insurance. The, uh, but the, um, any other questions uh, for uh, Ed? Okay, Ed, thanks. An old mobile home partner of mine from 25 years ago emailed me because he was watching one of the YouTubes and I, I, might, I obviously mentioned mobile homes and uh, the, uh, he said uh, something to the effect, I thought you told us never to return to the scene of the crime. And I said, well, it's not me, it's one of the kids, you know. No, 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 no. Well, we, we have a Mexican lawyer in, uh, out in New Mexico. Um, and uh, we have a, um, a something, I forget, I don't think he did anything, uh, up in uh, near um, Seattle, Washington, which has turned into a war zone, so his... He hasn't done very much. The guy in New Mexico has done very well. Um, he, he said, well, he said, this is not working for 11. Paul. 
plumbing? I, 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 I haven't seen it. I know he closed. About a year ago, he closed on a mobile home, I think. Right? Well, they, that may be their uh, <clears throat> hidden desire, but um, I know the um, the lawyer wants to roll up forty or fifty and then exit. But he's, I mean, he's thirty years older than you. He, I mean, he, he wants to do it the next four or five, six years and then exit. Last time he contacted me, which is a, he was setting up a fund. And I told him I wasn't interested. But uh, a fund to roll up mobile homes. I guess he didn't do that. And he's, now he's on plumbing. Sells horses. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, if you can't do it, teach. That's the, the old adage. Um, but I threw him out of the program. All the guys, not all. Yeah, I think all, all the guys that are mini-me's out there I threw out of the program. I threw out of the, and that's when we had a mentor program. All the many me's, I threw out of the program. No, no, no. Got another email from, uh, this time a Malaysian. They all look alike anyway. Thirteen practices. They're in Corona Rona. One of which, which caught my eye. I was paid one hundred and fifty grand to take one. Take this one. See, I mean, you see. You see uh, 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 the Nazi guy doesn't believe it. He only wants to go and have people pay him to do shit. Right? Okay, last night, um, the um, Klausy Wowsy. But we're not, um, not going to talk about Klaus on YouTube. We're going to do a case, a couple cases first, and then we're going to talk about Klaus, not on YouTube. Um, any questions about anything else other than Klaus, um, the, the process, the system, etc.? So you got it down pat now. Good. Good. We still got a couple of days to go. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, you're going to get up? Or the what? Do you know what non do you know what non disclosure means? Nothing. Well then don't use the names. I mean I mean you're you're a, a thief in Dutch, you ought to be able to figure this out. Say it's amalgamated uh whatever. I, I only found out uh, a few weeks ago that we uh, uh do your laundry while you're here. And uh I was just in the kitchen which I don't normally go in in the morning, and I, I see they take your orders on a, a little pa a pad or a little pre-printed That's what you want me to do for the deals for you. Just like, that's exactly what you want. And when he says that, it's like when you're in Manhattan and they roll up their sleeve and they got nine watches on their, on their wrist. Rolex, Petit, Philippe. Go ahead. And I started my QA uh, in healthcare in the moment. And this is one of the uh, cases I got. In the healthcare, assisted living a company, holding. Twenty-five years old, he said I want to retire. He tried a management buyout, but it failed. So 
So he, he tried to sell it to his management yeah. and it failed. Yeah. Okay. And well, that's a big red flag, but anyway, go ahead. So, um, 2008, it had 21 million revenue. In 19, 24 million. In 2020, 26 million in revenue. And the, the net result, bottom line, was 800K in average. Bottom line, you mean? Pre-tax? Yeah, after tax. After tax, after okay. Tax, yeah. And the EBITDA was, was 1.7 million, 1.2 million, 1.6 million. Okay. So that's around 8% of the revenue, of total revenue. And... Okay, stop, right. I'm going to stop here. Why with such little EBITDA were you interested in this other than it's a big deal? Nothing. So I, I pass it, especially oh, okay. because I, I watched it two other companies, same size, and they made a negative EBITDA or between half and 2% EBITDA. So they, this company was really outperforming all the other companies in the Netherlands. So this is the case why I decided to get out of this industry and find something else if I wanted to do roll up with a 30% EBITDA ratio. Okay, uh, so, uh, stop. The, the, the two things that are, just for your own edification, that are red flags, number one, a management buyout that failed, okay? Uh, and number two, it has non-profit in it, okay? And the, um, uh, and it's not easy to take a non-profit and make it profit. Uh, in certain parts of the world, it's impossible because of law and statute, etc. cetera. Uh, but even when it is possible, it's, um, there's a, the, the, the structure, first of all, people that work for nonprofit, my experience, uh, have been, um, um, it's hard to hold them accountable. And if the nonprofit has people that are working there that aren't getting paid at all, they're there volunteering their time, it is absolutely a thousand percent not possible to hold them accountable. Period. Now, the Red Cross and think, big national organizations like that pay their executives. And they're still hard <laughs> to keep them accountable uh, because nobody will go in and bust the balls of the Red Cross. Nobody's going to go in and bust the balls of the Catholic Church. No one is going to go in, et cetera. And so it's very difficult. So when I tell you to stay away from nonprofits, when was the management buyout failure? Uh, last year. Okay, it was before. recent, recent. Yeah. And, well, there are two things I, I want to, to say, because what I found out that in the Netherlands, if you got these kind of companies, you have to publish every detail. The salaries of CEOs are really maxed, and every penny you want to take out, what kind of construction, you have to be fully transparent. So, well, that was also one of the reasons I want to get out, but I'm, I'm glad I did it, because if I started it, like, I started when I was here in the council in February, and I just thought, oh, oh, okay, I'm going to do this. But if I didn't, and I went home and opened my spreadsheet, I will have not started QLA. So I'm very glad. Even this whole industry was not the best. I'm really glad I, I just pulled the trigger and started. Okay. But, yeah. So I made a decision. I, I want to change. And... Okay, what will work in the Netherlands? That was so. What is that thing? Oh uh, yeah, a chill ball. Like we're in Holland, we, we make a chill ball up. Uh, oh, 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 okay, I got it. <laughs> I get it. Okay. Okay, so this is an IT business. Now your business before it was. Uh, I, I switched. No, no, no. But you come from IT. No. You come, you come from what? Uh, construction. And, That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I even didn't know where IT stands for. Uh, so this is also a reason why I picked IT. Um, this is broker deal. Uh, the, the owner wants to sell 100% of shares. It's a company which is active in three countries. Has 27 uh, full-time employees. 
a reason for motivation is that they want to go to the next stage, next stage, it needs a new owner. That's one of the most common reasons you will read in uh, broker information sheets. So this company has a revenue of 3 million in 2017, 3.8, 3.9 in, in 2019. After tax, it has 613k, 1.2 million, 1.5 million. After tax results, and his EBITDA is around the 36, 32, 38 percent. So, it looks like a good deal to me. But when I turn the page, of those 27 employees, only four are, are on payroll, including the owner. And that was for my board, the red flag to just say. So, the, how, how are they getting paid then? They, are, they were on um, contractors. So, and even like the co they're, they have, they're in three, three countries, like one, uh, the Netherlands and Brazil. And the, the employee who, ha who works in Brazil on his LinkedIn page had also other jobs next to this. So, that is why my board was, wasn't that enthusiastic about it. That was a too big a red flag. So what I did, I sent an email to the broker. I said, "Okay, he has to be really uh, the, the seller has to be evolved. So if you want to discuss this case any further, I will need to know that 75 to 120 percent seller finance is an option. Otherwise, I will pass, and I will pass." Okay. Now, did you? What happened to your first board, your uh, healthcare board? Yeah. So I got rid of them and got a new board for IT? Uh, I replaced four board members. I got a, a really IT lawyer next, uh, next to it and the industry expert, three of them I replaced. Oh. Okay. Now, um, because the Netherlands is a skeptical country, you know, they're just skeptics. They don't believe. So what was your experience building your board? They thought you were... Uh, a thief, uh, a Dutch boat, or Schaefer, what? Yeah, and I, I started with looking like uh, all bank managers, and they were so, they, they're so protective, and and, and so it, I got a lot of reactions like, "Oh, this is the American way; it doesn't work." Please don't bother me. You're the fifth QLA bot who, who's bothering me. It's <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. It, it, it was tough, but within a few weeks, I, I got my board, and, and yeah, so, and, and even for now, it's like, maybe I change board members too often, like, when I be down, like, is QLA still working, I will just find a new board member, it's so easy now, that within a week, I will get a new board member, and then I got my spirits up again, and... Okay, and, and did you primarily use LinkedIn? Yeah. And the... Um and even in LinkedIn, you know, probably 25, 20, 25% of the people listed in LinkedIn say they're interested in a charity nonprofit. Well, that means they're really interested in money, but it's more uh, sophisticated, it's more PC, it's more 21st century to say that you want to do charitable work and nonprofit work. But virtually everybody on LinkedIn, or almost everybody on LinkedIn, is not quite as broke as you. Some may even be more broke than you, but generally speaking, they're not quite as broke as you. Um, and the, um, okay, go ahead. But it, it is very hard when you got this really big investor and he just says, okay, this, not, this, this does not work. So th that was mentally quite, quite challenging uh, now, see, in, in, in the beginning. Now, see, I, after all these years and all the deals, I can handle that objection. We don't teach you how to handle that objection because we know it's better for you to just do numbers. And not because if you can't learn all the objections. There's 500 different objections you're gonna get and I know the answer to counter all of them. But for me to teach you to counter all 500, the course would be 500,000 pounds and it would take two years. And so I know from experience that you can get over it with just numbers. Okay, go ahead. So another deal. IT applications, 
uh, 15 uh, employees, uh, two shareholders. They're asking 1.3 million, which is five times EBITDA. Uh, EBITDA average in three years, 255. Um, they, for, of the revenue, 66% comes from web shops and 34% digital distribution platforms, whatever that may be. Um, so, if you look at the numbers, revenue last year is 1.4 million, 1.5 million, 1.5 million, and EBITDA of 15%, 17%, 70%. So, um, this, based on the numbers, didn't have the EBITDA we were really looking for, but, well, asking price five, five times, so it, it's within the ballpark, even it's on the edge of it. I didn't go through with this because the revenue in the past five years were stable, almost flat. And in one of the lines, because this is also a broker deal, in one of the lines, when they told something about the company, was stated like, employees are really important to us and almost each time we end up in the bar and that was for my board members who looked at it a red flag like their beer drinking bums that they this company does not have the spirit and there are hundreds of these kinds of companies in the Netherlands and and also in this company they really the board members had the feeling that the two owners were really a very big influence on the company and the company could not do without them. So also, I also sent them the email like, hey, I want to talk, but then I have to know that, you have to know that the LOI will be based on due diligence, board approval and finance. And I, I want to be, it, it has to be an option that 75 to 100 to 25% is seller finance. And they passed on that. So, that's it. And it, yeah, but I'm I, I, I wondering, like, based on the numbers, it, it's maybe okay. And my board members look very uh, quickly to more content of, of the company. Is that the thing the board members are for, like, to, to help me with that? Or yeah, but I mean, but, 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 but before you drop an LOI and telling them it's going to ha be up to 125% seller finance. I mean, did you ex talk to him about that before you set the LOI? I, 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 no, no, no. Well, that's not how the pro, it's, you discussed it with him pre-corona in person. Now, Zoom, uh, Skype, and you're talking to you, and if you, rem if you recall the way uh, uh, Thomas's webinar, and he walks him through it like selling an insurance policy, and that's okay for you, and uh, seller finance, and the wife says yes, uh, but then we, when you just drop an LOI out of the blue like that, 99% of the time they're going to say no. They're going to say no. I mean, uh, it's too much shock value. It's where we want to go, but I mean, th th these things... Uh, have to be talked to. The other question I have about all these, how come we don't have any 2020 numbers? These are all 2019, right? Uh, 2020, this is for this year. Okay, well how did, what were the, the one before, was it 2020 or 2019? Let me see. 19. Okay, yeah. okay. And if the one that has 2020 numbers, what numbers did you use in 2020? But okay, well, and I put it uh, social media, all the meatheads out there. Okay, uh, when it was uh, 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 June, July, I said you've got to have uh, the, the April through July numbers, and then you annualize them. Mm -hmm. Then when it was August, September, you had to use uh, April through September numbers, and then annualize them. And then now it's with November, it was April through November numbers, and then you annualize them. And the people that gave you, well, it's always going to come back. The, 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 the pat answer from the seller is, well, you're picking at the worst time. Well, then why? And then pull it off the market if you don't want to fucking sell it during the worst time. Of course, you don't want them to pull it off the market because you don't have 15, 20, 30 people that are waiting to sell to you. So, and this all takes time. And you can't get back time. 
you have, you know, you have to be harsh. Now that the, uh, the, the, the year end is here, and you'll be talking to people in the next few days, but probably not till the first of the year, you want April through December numbers. Well, we, don't, we haven't closed the books on December, we'll find. April through November numbers and annualize them. And with rare exception, 5% of the businesses will have been able to hold their own. 5% of the businesses might have even, if they're in healthcare, like in telemedicine, et cetera, like uh, one of my deals is in telemedicine, actually went up. But for the most part, these businesses are worth between 25 and 50% less than they were a year ago. 25 and 50. And that's before the second corona wave, which is gonna last, I don't know till when. You can't possibly be buying businesses today based on numbers from 2019. You can't. Oh, well, you can't if you're stupid. But if they acquiesce too easily, that's because you're not basing it on the right numbers. They should fight and scream. If you're not being told the numbers will get better, it's because you're basing your offer price on shit. And it doesn't matter if they get better. And we've closed, and I haven't even uh, read them to you in, in the last four or five months, I don't know, 50, 80 deals that aren't going to pan out. Meaning they're not going to work. Because they will not be able to, they're not going to go back to the numbers of 219, 218. And the bank doesn't care why. They've got your personal guarantee. And for those real stupid ones, they have cross-collateralization on your house. And for the real, real stupid ones, you've put in money. Even though the bank doesn't want to go into the IT business or the bank doesn't want to go into the assisted living business, remember, they're, they're looking for three sources of a refund. And they have all the box, just like you uh, check for breakfast, you want scrambled eggs, you want toast, you know. They have all three of the boxes checked. They have little or no risk. For the bank, it's a riskless transaction. It, now, I'm, I'm not saying that the seller's got to cry every time, but unless the seller, not physically cry, but sometimes they do cry. If the seller is not moaning, then you did something wrong. And it gets back to, you know, there are no win-wins. That's all horseshit. Okay, go ahead. So the last deal, it's also a software company. And I, let's see, the seller, it has three owners. 50% uh, is owned by a management team. And the other part is 50-50 divided by the founder and the, share, and the, and the stakeholder or shareholder. It has um, averaged three years turnover for of 1.3 million, and normalized EBITDA in that period is 44 percent. What so do you mean by normalized? I don't know. My accountant looked. Oh, it okay. says, <laughs> no, normalized EBITDA. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they correct. The my my normalized my dick size is really ten and three quarters inch, but real it's only three. <laughs> you know, am I normalized? I <laughs> So it's it's forty four percent six hundred k um, EBITDA. The um, it's through a broker, and um, what the company lacks of is a strategic sales plan. And my a few of my board members are really experienced in that, and they know a lot about this specific industry and software. And they, my board members see a lot of upward potential. Um, I have to, next stage is to go to uh, LOI stage. Uh, I would like to get an LOI on three to six times the EBITDA, due diligence, bank, uh, board approval, and finance. They already said seller finance is possible, so that's one thing I check now. The best thing that he's presented of these deals is he's interfacing with the board. The board obviously knows you know nothing about IT. Yeah. And that's a bit, I know, I keep saying it, and you, you keep looking at me, 
but that's a big hurdle for you to get over. I don't know Dick. You'll say it much more flowerly, in a flowered manner, but, and then they roll their sleeves up, if they're good, these guys sound like they're good, roll their sleeves up and they dig in and help you. But if you don't say that, you're just, you know, you're pissing in the wind. And uh, it's hard, I know it's hard. And when I, I was, I was quite flamboyant about it back many decades ago that I don't know anything. I used to tell the banks, the banks I told, I don't ha have enough knowledge vis-a-vis uh, -vis the oil and gas industry to put on the head of this pen. This is to the banks I'm getting money from. But I got the father of the North Sea. I got the former governor of New York to save uh, New York City and New York State from bankruptcy. I got the former CFO. I, and they do know. And that's, some of you have a, enough knowledge to be dangerous in some of these areas that you're uh, in, uh, going into. Now he knows more about, uh, slightly more about IT now, after going through three or four deals, but he still doesn't know anything. But the board members, and so that's, that's good, that's terrific. And the, and the board members will protect you if you pick the right ones. And if you pick the wrong ones, then you get rid of them. You get rid of them. So, okay, it's, so it's been a good, it's been a, not that I want you to go through learning experiences, I want you to do deals. But I mean, if you're not gonna, if the deals don't come to fruition, the, the worst case scenario is you gotta learn something from it. And um, the, um, the takeaway for me is the fact that he used these guys and they, they performed. They, they've they've uh, gotten back to him and told him, and, the, um, and that's good. In some cases, I won't say most cases, but in some cases the board thinks that they got free founders equity for nothing. And they're not gonna have to do anything. That's the worst case scenario. And their, their way of telling you that, they're signaling you that, or giving you that message is either late response or no response to your request. And then you, you throw them out. You throw them out. It's completely true, but... Thank you very much. I needed yeah, that validation. But I feel much better now in the holiday spirit <laughs> that he agreed with me. But the pitfall is that I totally rely on on them, and I got sometimes the feeling like they tell me we, we have to look more for a platform kind of first deal, or right? they are two way into it. Oh, yeah. yeah. So oh, platform is, is the, um, is everybody's comeback in IT. Amazon platform, all these platforms. Um, but you don't need a platform, all you need is a fucking deal. As uh, Lou Gessner, who, when he took over IBM 25 years ago, turned it around from bankruptcy, said, uh, when they were talking about strategies, the last fucking thing is we need is a new strategy. You know, uh, IBM had been around about 80 years by that time. The last fucking thing is we need a new strategy. What we need is sales. Guess was a top line sales guy. We have to have had something going on. Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. They, uh, blind pool money, like like uh, um, uh, Hungarian Forrest Gump, who's negotiating his his billion euro blind pool now, while well, he built the largest hospital network in Eastern Europe in three and a half years. So, I mean, they uh, uh, he did something, even though he had the idea of doing this, but now he's done it. So now is the time to do spreadsheeting. What if he had had 500 million or 200 million? Or what if he had bought, um, um, in, instead of just focusing in Hungary, where they only had 15 hospitals to begin with, and he bought seven of them, but all of Eastern Europe, he wants to do Eastern Europe. I mean, he would have, I mean, he would have created uh, you know, a few billion bucks, or euros, excuse me. And so he, and, but now, He's not even, I told him not to consider a SPAC, but he's, he's talking about a, uh, a blind pool. But his directors are getting, uh, uh, you know, nervous. They have never bought stuff in the other part of Eastern Europe, and they don't want to make a mistake. Um, in fact, there were five hospitals that went into receivership in Holland that I sent them, um, and I thought it was a laydown. 
but his chairman said, Holland, the Dutch are tough to deal with. I mean, you, you know all the stories, right? I mean, the Dutch never gave a fucking uh, ice away in winter. So, I mean, something's got to be wrong here. And that's, that's every, back, they back away. What's the real deal? You know, what are the Dutch trying to do? And, and there's certain ethnicities that make people nervous. And so, uh, and somebody else, uh, some other group uh, bought the hospitals out of receivership. And, um, but they want to stay close. Uh, so he's, what he's going to do is the blind pool um, is going to have a different board. And uh, I may w w very well be the chairman. Um, the, uh, but if not, uh, may there'll be somebody else that wants to venture outside of, um, of Hungary. Because they basically have now bought 60% uh, of the assets up. There's not much left. Unless they want to go into ancillary or complementary businesses, and they they've been successful with hospitals against the grain. Uh, they've done it well, not n knowing much. So we're going to stay with hospitals, and the only other place they can go is the rest of Eastern Europe, and there's a shit ton of them. But just imagine, the um, you only spend 160 million of 250 million, and you got to give the money back. That's when you make the bad investments. Huh? That's when you start well, making bad well, investments. I would have been making bad investments a long time, but because it's, it sounds easy to invest $100 million. It's not. 100 million euros. The extra 100 million. It's not. And then what they do is the people that are on the selling end make it harder for you because they, they're trying to grind the, the last euro out of you. And God forbid you try to buy some fucking Dutch assets. And I mean, they, they'll beat you to death because they know you've got to spend the money. And so I, it becomes a pissing match. Um, the, um, but he's in, a, he's in a good position. Have you ever had like somebody in Hungary run up hospitals, somebody in Germany, and then merged together? No, and the some closest massive... was Rick. He rolled up, he was the biggest hospital owner uh, in the world, but primarily uh, 70 or 80 percent of the hospitals were in the United States, um, and the rest were in, in major uh, Western countries like the UK. Australia. He didn't go to Eastern Europe. He didn't go to Eastern because that was 30 years ago. Um, but, um, and, and, you know, as Peter says, the model still works. Of course it works. I mean, you know, and uh, again, I told you, uh, it pisses me off when he calls it the Rick Scott fucking model. But anyway, that's a personal thing. But of course it still works. Nothing's changed. Except now money's cheaper. At 15% interest rates, the deals have got to be three times better. I, I mean, it, uh, it, it's simple math. Now, I mean, uh, money literally for free, you can make a lot of mistakes. Um, I'm not telling to make mistakes, mm -hmm. but uh, the pressure is not really on you to uh, perform as well as you had to perform at 15% interest rates. For, for us that have been in business, you know the difference we're paying five, six percent. Now we got to pay fifteen percent. I mean, that knocks the shit of all your modeling, for sure. Um, but there's a uh, just a shitload of opportunities, um, and there's going to be a plethora, a whole flood after the first year, because the world's been asleep the last two or three weeks, and especially in certain countries, has been dead asleep. They're in a comas. They're, but they're, they're going to be coming out of their uh, caskets like a Dracula and vampires now. Uh, and so for the, for the, you know, the first, it's like uh, people always buy gym memberships and then they use them and then they go back and they don't use them anymore. It's, it's, it's analogous to the assets are going to come on the market all over the world, all over the world. And so it's, it's, a, it's a good time. It's a good time. I've had a lot of guys be motivated since Trump is leaving, but it's coming, the whole tax bracket thing, that's the motivation for them to sell. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and yeah. He, he, he's still president of the 21st, I think, of January. He's going to do some crazy shit in the first few days. What I'm praying for is that he does away with uh, inheritance tax, death tax. I mean, Allah, you know, you took all the oil and gas away from the Jews in Israel. I, I, you know, uh, I can't really relate to that, but I can relate to no inheritance and death tax. I'll keep you in my prayers. Be, be, because <laughs> hundreds of billions, trillions, I mean, are going to be, I mean, there'll be, there'll be people, you know, celebrating 
um, it, you know, it just, it'll be unbelievable. Now, the little guy doesn't mean shit to. Okay. But um, 80% of all the money is owned by a couple thousand people anyway. So, uh, but it'll be a great thing. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. Okay. So, um, so you ready for this? Yeah, we have another one too. Okay. Okay. What's the other one? Sure. Yeah. yeah. It's a speculation bullshit, but, you know. Yeah. It's called the Core eStore case. It's a potential startup of a, of a website. And... Netscom? Yeah. <laughs> they, need, they need seed money, like $90,000. 90000 And for yeah. six months operations. And they found an investor for the seed money who takes one third of all shares already. Only a third. Only a third. Uh, risk profile. He's not Dutch. Risk profile is really high. More than one, well, only one out of four maybe survives of these kind of companies. Uh, the other, there are two founders who have the other one third of the, the shares. And they have projections that only after seven months they will have a bit more than $8,000 a month of EBITDA. And within 18 months, they will have almost 18,000 evidence. So, what are they? Uh, what are they selling online? I mean, what is the product? It's it's a it's a software that you you put in. It can basically read music off a musical score sheet. It, you can see it visually. It'll play it back to you audibly. And I think it's aimed at professional museums, so that, uh, musicians, so they can practice. Well, we'll ask our two professional uh, musicians. The uh, well, I mean, net scum projections are even less likely to happen uh, because this. But the uh, ninety grand is nothing, so I mean, they, they should be able to fund that. They weren't able to. They weren't. No, they only made well, seventy five grand or some shit. Oh, I mean, they, they these guys must have been piss poor salesmen. I mean, but yeah. they they make big projections because they say okay, within seven months, so the first month after the you know, trial period. We will have a company valued at 1.5 million, 15 times the EBITDA, uh, and in 18 months it will be worth three, more than 3 million. And one of our conclusions was that this is why QLA is about de risk businesses. Could, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 genius, what genius said that? That's and good. you give the one third of shares, talking to good board members instead of one. Uh, person who gives jump chains to force money. Okay, now that's the kind of deal that uh, I would take money from board members. Uh, I mean, instead of beating the you know gums trying to sell it, you know, uh, each board member put up uh, or six board members put up fifteen grand each. I mean, this is uh, I wouldn't chase around, but um, most of these deals, it's not one in third, uh, one in ten of these works out. Not one uh, out of three, uh, but when they work out, uh, the, the 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 value that they put on it is just you know they pulled it out of their ear. There's no uh, there's no um, basis for that. But I'm I'm sure there must be ten thousand of these being sold, uh, or they're trying to sell to somebody. Very very smart um, and very under the radar. His father said the minute that you. you public profiles the minute you start to fall. Um, he meets um, Guy Dolay or Guy Dolay um, at uh, a dinner party and, um, and suggests that it uh, would be exciting for Excel, uh, the European um, stronghold um, of still still uh, production to, to merge with his company. And, uh, you know, the French classist, racist um, um, CEO um, says, um, Yes, but eighty uh, percent of um, mergers uh, fail due to cultural differences. Correct. And um, so our anti-hero and our underdog Mattel um, uses the platform of a public um, bid uh, display that it presents the bid. Uh, I'll just take over at this point. Um, he has a conversation at this dinner, <clears throat> trying to be collaborative, saying, "Hey, you're the number two producer. I just grew to the number one. We just talked about a merger. This guy makes some." Pretty off the wall comments. He gets aggressive about the cultural differences. 
Mattel then goes to making public statements. So the French people. guy says about the racist stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The French the, guy says that happens all the time. All the time. Um, at which point the insults um, got to the point where, <laughs> where the, 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 the French um, uh, French company would rather accept a hastily put together Russian deal. Um, they must have been desperate to yeah, get Russian deal. He'd rather take that deal um, because he was a pure European, um, and so we've got we've got the, the 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 scene is set for a hostile takeover, and, and Mattel is more leverage. Uh, we looked at it. We were wondering if he was one of your pure A bots because he was highly leveraged, uh, ran a, an efficient shop. You know, this is is he's in India and in the emerging markets. He keeps more of the profits. Um, he has a lot. Uh, I think five times more debt. Than the conservative Europeans, and um, is now going up to ten percent of the global market, and that almost sounded uh, just just like what you say. Well, you know, the Northeast healthcare is worth um, you know fifteen billion. If we can get one percent of that over the next five years, that's our goal. It sounds like Mittal wanted ten percent of the global market, and that's exactly what he did, and that's what brought him to the point of being the third richest man in the world. Because that we didn't know about. This to me, I you know, I kind of read this as a modern Cardini story. It's happened in two thousand and five, two thousand six, when the deal was closed. But Mattel grew up through acquisitions, which a QA, QLA style. The only difference is, you know, he would buy things during a recession at low prices, but he seemed to turn them around. He would buy them when they were unprofitable and then turn them to be profitable. He got into the business at the age of twenty one, um, and through family-owned business and bidding for other contracts. By the time he was fifty five. In 2005, when he finished his last acquisition before this whole thing happened, he grew into the number one steel manufacturer, or steel producer in the world. Guy, do you want to just run through a couple of numbers for Mr. Pena, just so he gets an idea of the, uh, the prices and the values of these companies? On the other page. Yeah. It's also interesting that Mittal, at one point, through another company, paid himself a one billion pound dividend. Did he? That's how you do it? Yeah. As CEO, as, 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 yeah. as he, yeah, uh, as he, Mr. Pena, who's uh, the one who broke the uh, glass ceiling for you years before. So yeah, we're wondering if uh, Mattel is one of your, your one of your mentees because it's basically pure QLA as far as we can see. But um, in terms of the the, the businesses, actually, our our solo was was. Um, the revenue was much higher, but didn't produce as much steel, and was less less efficient in terms of the margins. Um, obviously, the markets were quite interested; could see the future potential in in metal steel because it, the PE ratio was was higher. Um, so, from metal's perspective, it makes a- absolute sense. It's the only way. I mean, when you're already the largest producer. Of, of steel in the world, how are you gonna you gonna do, go incrementally, or are you gonna go for exponential growth? And the only way to do that was to buy the number two. And the number two, just to add to that, is Arcelor. They grew into the number two position through three mergers, uh, just like about four years prior, three years prior. So it's pretty aggressive. You know, number one, number two, getting well, and the other deal. The guy, the Indian guy, although uh, he didn't come here, he had he read my book. So this guy, I don't, I don't, I don't know him. But a lot of guys, when we used to sell the book, a lot of guys uh, went to the website. Uh, and um, uh, for example, the uh, the Qatar guys in Qatar uh, were at the um, Beverly Hills Hotel a year or two ago. And the head of security came up to me in the gym and said, Mr. Pena, well, we know you, blah, blah, blah. You, know, you know, we play your uh, uh, old cassettes and the new stuff uh, in the um, uh, the Qatar family uses it as a training. They, got, they, they stopped trying to bleep out fuck and shit. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> because it, it kind of ruins the rhythm. But, um, sure. and so there's a lot of people that uh, use this um, and the um, that I've never, you know, uh, met in person. Once in a while, I get a, a thank you note. You know, I just made nine billion dollars and that, 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 that. But the metal guys, for sure. Uh, I don't know about these guys, but you'll see a lot. You'll see a lot uh, of people 
that fall back to the same methodology that uh, Mr. Carnegie uh, used you know, 100 years prior, prior to this. Because it works. The, I, as, as Margot Klein, God lover, the French cunt, said, the funny thing about it is it works. I don't know what's so fucking funny about it, but the funny thing is it works, and it does work. It just works. And again, you guys can be, be doing this for 25 years, and you won't run other than other guys that have come through here or the occasional guy that uh, gets it from the book or um, uh, on, the, on my website. You won't run into hardly anybody because they're influenced by conventional wisdom who's writing the equity check. They just, I mean, 99%, I mean, who's writing the equity check? And the investment banks are the same way. And it's just, I don't know if it's criminal, but it, it, it's good for us. It's good for us. And when in the, um, but you know, as, as I would say, we, they had stopped worrying about it 15, 20 years ago because they're just not, it, it should have happened by now, but it hasn't. Yeah. So he, he made very well. Um, I've gotten it. And the, uh, and, and a lot of uh, the better successful deals. Uh, are uh, based on the QLA model. Uh, a lot of deals that fa falter, it's because uh, they get driven up because of fees, and that's the only reason they get done. Um, the um, and, and in this particular juncture, the, the only fees would be advisory fees. And more than 80%, not just 80% of the deals uh, fail because of uh, cultural differences. I mean, uh, more than 90%. And that when you see an acquisition and then uh, six to 36 months later, they're hiving off assets. They're selling all kinds of assets off. They're, what they're doing is they're selling off divisions where the cultural battles are the worst. Mm -hmm. And they, there's no way to assimilate them in, you know. And they bring in these human resource experts and all these assholes and uh, to sit down and have uh, focus groups. I mean, uh, uh, Zeman's love focus groups. Anyway, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, what you can see with your own eye in five minutes, uh, it takes some, a six-month focus group. And, uh, but uh, it does work, and that's... Uh, in terms of the, the Russian interest there that made a token bid, Savastal, I believe the name is, um, last night you mentioned something about the split up of the oligarchy. Uh, or, uh, Correct. And... Um, who were the major players in that? In that room? Well, I mean, uh, the um, well, there used to be eight, and now, now I think it's fourteen or fifteen because those eight guys have had sons. But originally, there was arguably six to eight when uh, uh, Putin's henchmen, so to speak, like Hitler's henchmen, and they split up the assets. I wasn't in the room, but they split up the assets and they said okay, and they went by birthright. You were born in uh, Ukraine, so your birthright is this. You were born in Moscow, your birthright is this. You were born in the black, near the Black Sea, and that's originally how it got split up. But then they found out that certain of the places had infinitely more money and assets than others. So then after two or three years, some uh, smart ass uh, who had a son at Harvard or something, or Stanford, well, fuck, I mean, Dad, you know, we got uh, billions, but, you know, uh, Harry over here got 46 billion because he's got all the mining. And so then they had some reallocation, um, but uh, it was originally uh, where Putin's buddies came from. And then those guys had kids, uh, and uh, nothing worse than a young Stanford MBA to come and tell his daddy fucked up. Now, everybody was rich and happy. No conflict whatsoever until they started analyzing it and the second generation of them uh, started at, uh, 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 arguing. And the wives. That was oh, we go, man, that, that, I mean, they got, they, they got a 300-foot yacht and ours is only 240 feet. And, and that caused a, a big fucking riff. Uh, and then the girlfriends of the guys... Because all these guys have three to five mistresses, all of them, okay? And then her house is 82 rooms, and my house is only 61 rooms. And so then, and some of the guys uh, disappeared, as it can happen in Russia. It just, you know, 
Uh, but now it's pretty calmed down. Last 10 or 15 years, it's pretty calmed down. Uh, the, uh, but like they, they catch uh, food poisoning people. and but I mean, it happens all the time. Except if it happens in Russia, it never gets out. Now, you notice when they have kidnappings in Russia and the stormtroopers come in, everybody gets killed. The, the people that were kidnapped get killed and, because there's no witnesses, as my dad taught. Okay, what's well, a clean shoot? No witnesses. Oh, okay, and by some miracle, miraculously, everybody dies in those when they save everybody. Um, but you have to be insane to kidnap somebody in Russia. I mean, fuck. Because you're going to wind up dead. You're going to wind up dead. Have you had um, uh, young mentees that have gone into these sort of prime industries, for example, mining, graphite, or cobalt? Um, or Not cobalt, steel? but mining, yes. Um, yeah, I'm supposed to be a mining expert, which I'm not, but um, whenever you make a lot of money and stuff, they think you're an expert. And even and now they, they believe me less that I don't know anything about a lot of these industries. But of all the things that I'm considered to be an expert, mining is the one I know the least about, even today. But, I, you know, I, I know it's all about reserves, and the only reserves that are worth anything are proved producing reserves. Proved reserves that are producing... It's a, a fig newton of somebody's imagination, some fucking geologist, or uh, it's, the, it's producing. And, and the depth, uh, the quality of the reserves are measured in depths. And in mining, it's how many feet of coal do you have? And, and, and less, uh, you know, how long is the vein, the gold vein? Right. Uh, and um, the, um, but um, we were the third or fourth largest uh, independent coal producer in the United States. We had 17 coal mines, and uh, we, uh, it's, it, it's a great business. It just, oh, it's fine? Okay, we're going to get back in the room. It shits money. It shits money. Okay, so uh, uh, those are two good cases. Yeah. This, this was interesting, too, because this was a really big international consolidation to the point that not only did it piss off people between the, the cultures, different governments had to get involved. Yeah, yeah. The UK government actually stepped in to try to help you know, navigate some of the waters and make the deal more effective for the company. Yeah, well, I mean, when the, the, they, they send some guy from uh, the government here in the UK, with rare exception, they're all pussies. I mean, they're, they're not going to convince or let alone force anybody to do anything because they, you know, uh, they want to be liked. And uh, Neville Chamberlain, during uh, when he acquiesced and capitulated to Hitler is a classic example of somebody wanting to be liked rather than be affected. This is a music deal, guys, for our two musicians in the back. Yeah, so um, it's, it's not a Dutch deal, is it? No, sir. Uh, I just said it's a load of shit for sure if it was from the Netherlands, but okay, give us the uh, background. Well, it's a, co it's a company, or a company to be, called Score eStore. It's a potential startup. Um, two, two guys who are looking for some seed money, $90,000 for the first six months of operation. And they found an investor after a while who takes one third of the shares. And the two other two owners own the rest. Well, these kinds of companies are rated with a very high risk factor. Um, it's very hard to make it profitable and successful, but if it is, it will be a financial success probably. And well, so we we'll just think, what does it do about what the company does? So this particular product is software that the developers are going to offer through a website and offer monthly web uh, membership. Basically what you do is you scan in any musical score and it'll play it back to you visually as well as audibly and it'll play the music and run the musical score along as you're listening to the music and it's got the ability to print music out as well. It's aimed at professional musicians so you can grab any piece of music, put it in, up it comes, here's the sound, practice along. So, huh? <laughs> Can I ask why not?
What about if a buddy musician is reading uh, music? It might, it might be psych. Like, can you, can you give me psych music? Oh. <laughs> well, according to the projections, it's a really great idea because they expect that in the first month after operation, yeah, this is the fuck, this is really awesome. They already have an EBITDA of more than $8,000 uh, a month, and within after 18 months, they have approximately $18,000 EBITDA a month, and they know for, for sure that it, it, the company's worth 15.1 times EBITDA. So uh, just in the first month after the six months of operations, the company's worth one and a half million, and in 18 months, it will be worth 350 to 25 million. So, based on the, this, is really a great deal. It's 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 just money, really. First, first red flag is that it's a MBA student who's producing it. There are a lot of red flags, and I think I'd rather take ninety thousand dollars and put it on red, <laughs> and go to Vegas and put it on red. Musicians don't have money to invest in software. No, it's, it's you. You pay for the monthly membership. Yeah. <laughs> Four musicians. Well, musicians, musicians. Musicians don't yes. invest. Yeah, that's it. This is for, this is for hobbyists, or well, uh, hobbyists needs to learn. So why would they invest? It's, it's like it's well, and, market and it, is not. Yeah, but that's why if you compare it to the QLA model, they it's hard for them to find the seed money. They have to give already one third away for one person who's an investor, and maybe some good can give some advice. But QLA is about de risk business. And it's not like that's the, that's the intended audience, the clientele, but they're not looking for 90 grand from you, though. They will never get it. And in and, 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 and three of the four pages with text, they're only arguing about okay, if we will make money, how will we can get shares back and get control back in the organization, all those kinds of yeah, bullshit. Which Thank you. <laughs> if that technology actually, if there's a w I just don't know how it's possible, but if that technology can read a piece of music and create every instrument that's in that no, no. score, Not like every in layered of instruments, that would change the world. It but has I so much potential. Think Thank you. That. I didn't yeah, even think about every extra instrument. Money, but we come a bit short, so. After the session, maybe we can talk and... Is, is, the mu is, is music for uh, a piano the same as music for a trumpet? The same notes? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Different sound. Yeah. This is a derivative 
uh, Makulis gave jobs in Wozniak $84,000 or $86,000 for a third. And, and uh, whenever the, uh, Apple started, and a whole jillion of wannabes for about 20, 25 years thought uh, 90 grand for a third, okay? Uh, the, um, and um, he gave 90 grand or 84 grand or 86 grand, whatever it was. Uh, he had no rhyme or reason. I think he was closing out his fund and so he had 80 grand left over, so that's why the, he only took a third. Normally, a private equity, this isn't a private equity kind of deal, but he is and he was and he still is a private equity guy. He, you would put up the money and take and leave each one of the, the guys with five or 10%, you wouldn't take a, a third. Uh, the, um, but be that as it may, uh, the, um, the, the idea behind it and the reason why they didn't raise the money uh, is it's, you know, again, 20 years ago, as you pointed out, it's, you know, it, it's, it sounds far-fetched. The other side of it is, why would anybody want that? That's you know the question that I always ask when I look at things. Now I don't like apps, and I was wrong about apps. Why would anybody want the, an app? Now I know you know five six years later why, but why would anybody want that um, other than possibly musicians? And musicians obviously don't think much of it. They sit in the back, uh, and somebody's tr trying to learn how to play the guitar. Um, but uh, is that a market? How big is the universe? You start off, you know, how big is the universe for this kind of thing? Uh, is it, it's not millions, uh, maybe not tens of thousands, it maybe, you know, it's not enough to impact for, and these, these, these um, estimates of the money they're gonna make down the road are just smoke. You have, you know, there, there's, there's no basis. Um, but I, the, this, you know, even you guys, a few seconds, a minute, two minutes, well, next. Uh, and when you, when, you, when you get more comfortable with the short-term thumbnail analysis that I gave you on deals, deals in healthcare, you'll be able to make a decision with the same speed, with the same speed. But the thing you need and must and have to get over first is your ability to ascertain if the fucker's really motivated. Because a really, truly motivated seller will bend and turn, and I mean, j just to help you make the right decision to buy him. It's like a, like a, a motive, uh, it's like a grateful woman, you know? And you guys are still, by your own admission, because you've gone through various uh, trials and tribulations with people that are, certainly aren't motivated. Certainly aren't motivated or not motivated enough. Remember the difference between a, a prospect and a suspect. You want uh, somebody that will sell to you at a reasonable price vis-a-vis -vis the QLA model. Remember, it's not your job to have to convince them. They either absorb and, and, and agree with the idea of seller finance or they don't. And remember the example that has worked very effective for me for decades. You know, have you heard of house flipping? Uh, 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 buy, no money down houses. Yeah, almost everybody on the planet has heard of that. No money down. This is exactly the same thing, except it's for companies. And once you get them over that threshold, and they are motivated, then you know it's 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 fairly simple. Because almost everybody has heard. I mean, it's hard to, uh, to, uh, to, to live in the free world and not have heard of no money down house purchases. And that's what this is. This is no money down company. But because of the, the background they come from, they never thought that you could buy a company for no money down. Because rightly or wrongly, they, you know, somebody's got to put up the money. Somebody's got to put it up, so they think. And it's, it's, it's not true. It's not true. Uh, but, you know, if they, if, they can, if they can't live with it, like in my neighborhood, when people paid off their mortgages, 
you had 20 year mortgages after the Korean War and after the Second World War, 20, 25 years, the houses paid off. So they used to have mortgage burning parties where you take your mortgage and the, the, the neighborhood would get around and you have a barbecue. And then the only paper that indicated they owned the fucking house, they burned in a barbecue pit. Now this is the height of motherfucking stupidity. When I'm 13, 14 years old, uh, and uh, I said, you know, uh, where's dad? Well, he came and uh, they're having a party at the barbecue and I go down and uh, I, 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 I figure uh, out what they're doing. Mortgage burning, mortgage. And I figured out what a mortgage was. I asked somebody. And then it dawned right then when I'm 13, 14 years old. You mean the proof that they paid the house off? They're burning? And that, that's what they did in my neighborhood. And nobody re ever refinanced. Even though interest rates were high, they never refinanced. Nobody would ever refinance anything because they didn't want to go to the bank because they were afraid of the bank. Um, but now, in the last 30, 40 years, there is a, a whole universe of people that understand buying things for no money down. Our daughter's last car that we got her on her 30th birthday I wanted her to go through the process, so she went to the dealership, and um, they, they were having zero interest, five years, zero interest. Yeah, and she, she got the car, and uh, she's just getting ready to pay it off. Uh, we pay, bought the car, but the, the, I wanted her to go through the process. And she says, Daddy, why am I going to, when you're just going to write a check? I said, because I want you to, you know, I'm not always going to be here to write the fucking checks. Uh, so, and she understood and my, uh, she went to good schools and didn't understand zero interest. Well, when, but she does understand no money down houses because some of her classmates have bought houses for no money down. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a phenomenon that almost everybody understands. So uh, your fallback to, to, to show them what it is, is the no money down uh, house purchase. And, uh, but this, this is, you know, just some kids coming up with a screwball idea. Uh, but uh, and it really doesn't matter if it works, because I and I'm not a musician and I don't know anything much about that. But I uh, I don't believe that there's enough people to buy it, even if it did work. Even if it did work. The uh, but you you saw that fairly quickly. Fairly quickly, and even though uh, they you know uh, gave a Winston gave an attempt to convince you know the. Uh, Was this based on the tr on the child? Yeah, well, I mean, there's kids even younger. Yeah. There's a uh, young, uh, well, he's not young now, but when he was, uh, he played the cello, I think he's Chinese, a uh, famous kid, when he was one or two or three, uh, and he, now he's at the Carnegie Hall, I think he's 25, he's old now, not old, but I mean, um, but the, the, those kids, we don't have any Michelangelo's in the room. Uh, Okay, um, the, uh, do, do the, uh, well, well, since you're hot, do the next one. Since you're in the sales mode, do the next one. Most of the questions they were asking me were, uh, how do you steal money out of SPACs? Yeah, and you can guess which one of them uh, had the most interest in how to take money out of SPACs. <laughs> and then when I told them, uh, a $250 million SPAC, the guy invests $150 million, he's got 100 to go, and uh, he didn't get it invested, and so he had to give the other money back plus expenses. And he could not believe me that they could not spend 100 million bucks down at the, uh, to the goal line, right? You didn't believe that. Yeah, you still can't believe it, but I've seen it because the, um, the uh, things just get tougher when you have to spend the money, i.e., Andrew Carnegie, when he's trying to spend his 450 million bucks, he only spent 350 million of it. And he had years to get rid of it. He invested, in the famous story, he invested in something in New York City and they decided to extend Grand Central Station and a $4 million investment. The city bought him out for 80 million. So now he's got 76 more million than he had to begin with. And then he, uh, there's all kinds of examples like that. The same thing happened to Rockefeller. And um, the, uh, and you've got the pressure that if you don't get the money, they used to say in the ground, um, I mean, you gotta give it back. Plus, all the money you, because I know you, all the expense money you sucked out of it, 
Yeah, well, uh, yeah, uh, you, you know, you got to come up with the, the money. But uh, whereas with a, a blind pool, um, you, you, there's no pressure to spend the money. And if you spend money expenses, you don't have to give it back. It's considered cost of doing business. So in my judgment, the, you know, but the difference is a SPAC is public and you have liquidity and most people get lured into the Venus flytrap of a SPAC because, well, now I've got 40% uh, of $250 million of a public entity. Okay, shoot. Um, okay, so basically this, this one's called um, Impress Northwestern Printing. It's, it's in essence, it's basically a cautionary tale. Um, they were looking to buy businesses uh, four to five times EBITDA. The first business they were looking for uh, looking at was a $2 million top line revenue, 16% EBITDA, 76% um, bank finance, 12.5% uh, was coming from the investor, the investors, 8.5% founders investment. Um, to sum it up, and, and you can elaborate on it, but they basically went through 34 acquisitions over two years. Um, and? They did fucking analysis after analysis and ultimately bought nothing. And they thought they did well. And they had a CPM, private sector money earnings. They had raised $350 million in equity at this point. I mean, they could not buy shit. They couldn't even buy one. And I've seen it dozens of times. And they had a, pay, a PPM, which is a private placement memorandum, is less expensive than an IPO, a public offering. But it's still expensive. On that size, uh, I would guess, uh, Two million in fees. Two million in fees, and then they didn't spend any of the money. I don't. I don't get that part. That that's so beyond me. Uh, you know, I die getting the money in uh, the drilling budgets. For example, Texas and the states have uh, state drilling budgets, um, and I mean, you you be drilling on freeways before you give the money back. You'll be drilling in schoolyards of kindergarten schools before you give the fucking money back. You'll be drilling, I mean, the first rule of taking government money is you never, ever give it back. And I never, ever, ever give it back. And uh, we, we saw, and uh, a buddy of mine, God rest his soul, Tommy Littlepage, an Indian, uh, American Indian, you know, uh, he, um, he was uh, uh, drilling engine money as you used to call it, and an area that had 82 million uh, wells already, uh, exaggeration, and he discovered a new platform at uh, 7,000 feet under the ground, and well, I mean, you couldn't walk from here to here, the little pump jacks, you know, the little nodding donkeys, you could hardly get a drilling rig in to drill the motherfucking hole. And he, did, and he uh, we were driving down the highway, and he threw a rock from his pickup truck. Wherever it lands, we're going to drill. And that's exactly where we drilled, and he made a discovery. But it was the last 300 grand from a government grant, an Indian government grant. And he said, God damn. And he's the guy, his wife um, used to read the Bible all the time. She was a, a Bible thumper. And we go to a fancy restaurant in, in Beverly Hills. And, um, the, um, and you had to wear a suit. He, he wore a green iridescent um, polyester suit, green iridescent. And it wasn't, uh, 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 what do you call it, St. Patrick's Day. And he had a green sparkly shirt, but you had to wear a tie. So we went by my house, uh, although they had ties there, but I knew they weren't going to have a tie to match this shit. So we went by my house, and, and uh, in those days I had a spiral three-story Staircase. I lived in a Frank Lloyd Wright, not Frank Lloyd Wright personal, but one of his guys' house. And my closet, dressing closet, was spiral staircase. And anyway, and so he went up, and we, I went up the top, and I got in my uh, my my green tie, and we go into the restaurant. And uh, it's the first roll up I attempted in the uh, in the UK, 1981, which failed. It was a 13 company roll up, and we go to this fancy restaurant, and the. Um, um, and, uh, you know, white gloves, tails, the whole, the whole nine yards. And so he says, uh, he ordered a drink, and he asked his wife permission, because according to him, to his wife, he didn't drink, which was a lie. And so she's reading the Bible there, and, and so uh, uh, 
his wife says, uh, Dan, could you order for Tommy? So I look over, he's got the menu upside down because he can't read. We all know he couldn't read. He signed literally with an X. Actually a T, big T. Um, and so I ordered, and for whatever reason, I ordered a scargo. I don't know why I did it. I didn't do it to be an asshole. I didn't do it to embarrass him. I didn't do it to make him fun of him. And you know the little plier things that you hold the, uh, the snail shell with, and then you have a little teeny fork, and you, he squeezed it wrong, and in the, in, in the shell flipped out into the middle of her Bible. <laughs> and the grease and all the shit is running down, and so I, I ordered for my, my, my end of the table. And so we had a guy who ordered Jack Daniels. And the Edward of them comes by and gives him a Jack Daniels on the rocks. And he pulls the guy by the tails of his tuxedo. I'm in a bottle of Jack Daniels. And so the mayor D comes over to me and said, Mr. Benya, yeah, you're a valuable uh, customer, and, uh, but uh, you got to control these guys because everybody's looking at us. You, I'll take care of it. I didn't do anything. I just let them do whatever the fuck they want. And uh, the, uh, uh, the roll-up failed in, uh, in London and um, had delayed fees, success fees, but I didn't discover them until after the deal failed. I had come up with 650,000 pounds in fees because none of the other guys would pay their fees. They said, this is your deal, Pena. You were going to make most of the money. You pay the fees. It took me three years to pay off. It was about a million and a half dollars in American money. Uh, and then that's when I came back in 84. I couldn't afford to come back because I had to pay off the motherfucking fees. And so the, the, the investment bankers at, at all said, well, you know, if you had had success fees, Dan, we would have rolled them into the next deal. And I said, could you say that again slow? <laughs> Uh, and that's how I discovered success fees. And then I try to convince them, well, I'm coming back with another deal. Can't we roll them into the next deal? Well, no, that's not the agreement we had. Uh, but these guys, uh, the, uh, but I, was, I can close my eyes and I still see that escargot shell rotating, dripping butter as it ro rolled and right into the middle of her Bible. The, uh, but he threw a rock from his pickup truck and made a discovery. Um, but uh, you never give back money. So, but I've seen this happen where you can't invest because the board then doesn't want to make a bad investment because they know if you want to do a deal bad enough, you'll, you'll make a bad deal. And none of these guys in the zenith of their career want to be associated with a shit deal that they invested a hundred million, except you. <laughs> Okay. Just yeah, well, and they won't. And so I've seen that happen many times. Now, when you're on your own and it's just your money, that's one thing. But when you've got the reputation, the cumulative reputation, because a board's reputation can work against you. If, 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 the, if they think the deal's not right, they won't sign off on it. And in this particular, I've seen that happen many times. And in this case, nobody, no, they didn't invest the money. And how many deals did they look at? So their, their filter for looking at deals was wrong. That's what it tells me. Their filter was wrong. Over two years. Okay, continue. Go. That's it? No, no. I mean, you're going to see when you get out there, virtually other than other guys that have come through the program or are trying to follow it from the website or trying to follow it from my book, uh, virtually everybody is doing it the old-fashioned way. The old-fashioned way, which is the non-QLA way. Okay, Max, you ready? All right, so this deal is a, a, a Stanford case study. Um, and what this is revolved around is the global consolidation of steel. The, the deal actually occurred in 2006, pretty recent kind of give a, a quick profile of the players in the game. Lakshmi Maital, who ultimately wound up becoming the number three richest person in the world, which I didn't know about his name until this case study. Uh, basically, is mini Carnate. At 21 years old, he got into the steel industry through some family-owned businesses and effectively used a QLA model through acquisitions, buying during recessions, buying at really low price, 
He eventually, over the course of 34 years, grew in 2005 to the number one steel producer in the world. Um, the only slight difference, what we can tell from the case study, is he didn't just do pure QLA. He was actually a turnaround guy. So when he would buy the, the other steel mills throughout, you know, the, um, throughout the world, he would then turn them around, make them more profitable, which is a good thing. Second player in the world, let me see. Second player in the world is uh, Arxelor. In 2002, they actually grew to be the number two player in steel production through their own mergers. They merged three different companies throughout the world. Um, the CEO of this organization was a guy named Guy Dolly. I'm probably butchering his last name. The story is really interesting, kind of how this came about. So background again, in 2005, Mitel grew to the number one steel producer. Uh, in 2002, this organization grew to the number two steel producer. And then in 2005 at a dinner, the CEO, Mitel, approached the CEO of the number two organization and started having a conversation around, hey, maybe we should kind of talk about merging together. This is where things became interesting. There's some racist comments, some cultural differences. Racist comments, I mean, I can't believe it. And, and effectively, you know, there's some, some nationalistic comments in there as well. And the uh, guy Dolly wound up telling Mr. Mitel, um, 75 to 80% of mergers fail due to cultural differences. Two weeks later, Mitel, wanting to be kind of a, uh, the number one player in the world, decided that out of the 1.1 billion dollar, uh, 1.1 billion metric ton of global steel production throughout the world, he wanted to own 10% of that. Okay, so I'm going to provide you guys with the actual press conference, uh, so you can see Mr. Mittal um, after he's made the bid. So, in terms of uh, Mittal's approach to business, um, has to has been to remain uh, an anti-hero or an underdog to stay below the profile as he consolidated emerging markets. Um, as my colleague has mentioned, um, he's bought up distressed steel manufacturing uh, plants that have perhaps been nationalized in places like Trinidad and Tobago, Ukraine um, and India, uh, perhaps scrap metal. Perhaps less the, the quality. Maybe it's um, cutting up um, trade ships or, or, or um, cruise liners at uh, at scrap metal prices. Um, he's probably doing that right now. Um, whilst um, he's been um, very very shrewd in, and um, and and very uh, quite leveraged in his in his consolidation to get him to to the point before making this bid for a large European steel manufacturing company. As he approaches uh, to make that bid, uh, the response from the classist, French, racist, um, European doesn't want to deal with this Indian guy. So even though you know this gentleman has, has become preeminently successful in his own right as a son of a, a steel merchant, obviously very intelligent. I think Bill Gates recently did a study showing that in the south of India uh, there's the highest concentration of individuals with the highest IQ in the world. Um, he still has to deal with this. And so um, he gets his vengeance. Um, let me uh, pass over to uh, Voldemort, uh, um, perhaps to go through some of the figures um, to get to the nuts and bolts of the deal. Yeah, what, what, I think was, what I think was important in that little scene was, um, uh, firstly, Lakshmi Mittal, he bought, built his, his uh, business buying in recession. Quite relevant for us. He bought state-owned steel operations during recession, and as was mentioned, he turned them around. So his, his team, he and his team were very, very experienced in making acquisitions, <clears throat> sometimes hostile, sometimes not. So he knew how to handle that situation, and his team knew how to handle that situation. And it's getting the shareholders on side, on his side, on board. So that what he was, he avoided um, calling his his uh, offer a hostile 
takeover offer. He was said it was unsolicited, um, and uh, he also was very clear that um, uh, you know he was going to maintain the operations and not uh, nobody was going to lose their jobs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which was important for, for for the shareholders because until they've got the money in front of them, you know they're they're thinking about their responsibilities. Um, you know, a bit broader, you know, outside of their own sort of financial gain. Um, so he's very experienced, and I think um, um, he knew what he was doing. So in terms of the, the, the way those, the, the size of those two businesses, Mittal was obviously the, the leading producer of steel in the world, so how are they able to grow market share? Um, other than just growing organically, they had to make an acquisition, and so who else to buy the number two? On, on the face of it, um, Arkilor, they look like they're a larger company, um, 32, uh, well, almost 33 uh, billion in revenue annually, and uh, Mittal's only 24 billion in revenue. But Mittal runs more efficiently, 13.5% margin uh, as opposed to the 117 And interestingly, um, the, the PE ratio, which um, is a measure of consumer or, or let's say shareholders <coughs> or the stock market's um, uh, belief in the future of the business is higher, 5.5 there as opposed to 3.3. So, um, the stock market favoured Mittal and thought it was a much more valuable business going forward. And they were right. They were right. Uh, ultimately, um, Mittal's bids came at um, 23 billion in January, rejected, because uh, Guy Dolay was offended that, you know, uh, such a big deal, such a, an important. Uh, um, potential uh, merger could be discussed so glibly over aperitifs. I think that was the summary of his of his mindset. Um, he upped the up the offer to thirty two billion uh, in May. Rejected again. In in between that, there was another offer come come from Russia, which was lower. But I think they they you know they were opportunistic there and thought perhaps we could get in. Um, from one of the Russian, well, the largest Russian uh, steel manufacturer, that was rejected, and it turns out ultimately that the um, the shareholders of Arcelor basically saw the sense in going back to Mittal and saying, "Okay, what's your real offer?" Which ultimately was fifty-one billion. Um, and um, that was the deal. That was the deal. I, I, can, say, I can say a few things about uh, how, how, I see how these uh, businesses were led or approached in a little different way. So I think if you look at the, at the Arcelor business, um, it feels like they were really proud, I guess, that they were able to, um, to combine these three businesses from three uh, European countries was Spain, France, and Luxembourg. So they consolidated this in 2002 and they thought, okay, wow, now we have a really great business, which is all European and we can make a lot of money there. But uh, if you look at it from the Indian perspective, uh, he was saying, okay, well, there's someone who is now number two, roughly the size of me. Well, yeah, nice that you combined yourself already. Well, I take all of you, right? So, and he knew that he would cause a lot of trouble in, in Europe. Yeah, because, okay, well, the Europeans said, okay, it's nice that we have this company, but we don't want to sell it to someone else outside somewhere. So it was, they were rallying and trying to get the Russians in. And what, what did they say about the Russians? It was really because the Russians had a very messy and, and, and disrespectful offer, um, and it wasn't, it wasn't organized. But I, I think it was just a little jab uh, for our Indian friend, because uh, I think the quote was that uh, they were real or pure Europeans. Uh, they're actually considering such a, 
filtered off it from them, and that just riled up our anti-hero young and young crowd. Yeah, so, so you see how, how desperate these people were, and what, what, what the size of their vision was. They thought, okay, well, it's nice that we have this small European business here now, but the size of the Indians was just, was just bigger. And uh, of course he's trouble. He's saying, okay, no, we will create a company, you don't lose jobs and stuff. Of course you lose jobs, yeah. So I think it was uh, under Hollande, when Hollande was the president of France, um, there was some closings and there was, I think one closing was uh, 600 people lost their jobs. So he accused Mittal, yeah, what's going on there? We're losing all this money in shops. And well, Mittal, 600 jobs lost because some thing is closed. That was nothing, right? Yeah, so one thing which wasn't clear is it was a hostile takeover, but it didn't buy all the shares. So how does that work? Because now it seems like both companies coexist under one umbrella. And yeah, but he, he, he did buy control. Yes. Ah, okay. So yeah, he, he bought control, yeah. Yes. And, 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 and I don't know, I forget which stock exchanges they're public on, in addition to the Indian. But there's a, called a thing called supermajority. You don't need to know this. But uh, if you take more than 75%, you can force the, other, the rest. Uh, in, in this country, in the UK, if you bid for more than 29, if you own and or bid for more than 29.9%, you have to bid for everybody. Uh, in other words, the other 70%. And uh, in, in my particular case, the Kuwaiti government owned 299 and they never went above that. If they had gone above it, they would have to bid for the whole deal, and they didn't want the whole deal. Uh, but as a sidebar, because I remembered this deal, and that uh, and, and no Frenchman walking the street would ever consider Russia part of Europe. That's a load of shit. I mean, first of all, it's not part of Europe. I mean, geographically speaking, you know, uh, and they would never, ever. So that was the French guy insulting back uh, the Indian. Uh, and I, I know the Mattel family. They have your first hundred million book. Uh, but the Russians then saw when they were, thought they might be in the game, uh, they started stirring the shit like the Russians know how to do. And uh, the, uh, the Mattel guys are smart. They're really smart. Uh, the, uh, but and racism is alive and well. They're still Indians. And uh, the French, who, even though they aren't at the top of the pecking order of Europe, they still think Napoleon's running around. And that's, huh? I know, I know, but they still think that Napoleon's running around. And so uh, they act that way. And uh, if you've been in business with the French, and I have, uh, and Margot, my mentee right now, who is a, is a, uh, a Parisian, which are the worst or the most arrogant of them, she says, and the funniest thing, uh, Mr. Pena, is it worked. You know, so if we went on a fucking Zoom call, I would have choked her. But anyway, the, uh, and that's, and, and, and the, the way he answered, uh, my French is still good enough to understand what he said, he, he was talking down. The whole conversation was talking down uh, to the uh, Mattel Indian guys. And the, um, but I mean, uh, money talks and bullshit walks. The deepest pockets almost always win. Or the, the deepest pockets combined with access to capital. Not always, but almost always win. Uh, and the, um, and when, 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 when you see these things, um, the, uh, and it's a derivative of the QLA. It's uh, the, um, and, uh, and happened to be in the steel business, which, you know, obviously Mr. Carney, uh, more or less founded or began or initiated uh, maybe about 100 years before, not 100, 60 or 70 years before. No, about 100 years before. Uh, but the model has been around, and the irony is when you get out there and you talk to your directors and the banks, they're going to look at you like they never heard of it. And they may even go so far as to think you're a dipshit. But m much of the reasoning is because there's no real fees in a debt-driven deal. And that is the crux, the honest to goodness. There's no big fees. 
uh, and the fee, big fees are associated with uh, not debt, but equity. And that's why hardly anybody, you know, even if they intellectually understand it, they will advise you against it because that's where the fees are. And right now, uh, back then, probably the bank's fees were probably only 40 percent uh, investment advisory fees based on deck uh, equity. And now probably investment advisory fees, as they call them, are 60 percent of the uh, revenues of the big banks now. And so they're always going to steer you that way. But if you push hard, you push back. You know, they, they say, well, you push back. Well, I mean, you got to push back. Otherwise, you're never going to get these, uh, these, uh, these deals done. And the bigger the deal, the harder they push. I mean, the bigger the deal, the harder they push. Because the bigger the deal, the more equity that would be involved, the more fees that would be involved. And those are fees that you're not getting. The bank's getting, and, and uh, nothing wrong with the bank making money, but they make money at a lesser amount uh, on our model. And uh, they still make money. But I mean, the, this deal was, was high profile, was in the newspapers. Uh, you saw all the camera guys there, uh, but I remember it from 20 years ago. And Mattel is a, a, a sharp guy. Uh, he was 21 when he started 34 years ago. So he was 55 then, and now it's 20 years later. He's about my age now. Uh, but um, they have uh, my book, have had for a long time, since the 90s. And, the, um, uh, and a lot of the big deals uh, based on when the wall came down, as I told you, a lot of the, the Russians and the oligarchs, et cetera, uh, have um, access to our information. Any questions about uh, this deal? From anybody? And they always get even. Absolutely. Always. All these, they always get even. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and that's how it is. But they always get even. And so don't you know, when you're up there with the icons, remember they always get even. 
and it's normally, um, uh, and, and some people like to make a show of it, like in this instance. You know, uh, I don't need to make a show, I just like to get even. You know, I just want to make sure the knife's in the back. Uh, well, I like to stab them in the front, I don't like to do it in the back. News right now are they're uh, accusing Dr. Fauci, who's the head immunologist, blah, 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 of America, of being lying. Uh, and what did I tell you? The first rule of crisis management lie. And now he says the worst is yet to come. Uh, there is going to be little or no herd immunity anytime soon. And what was the third thing he said? Anyway, yet meatheads like you, just like you, minus intellects, Pollyannas, they just, they're going to ride him out on a rail with punji sticks in his fucking eyes. Yet Dan Pena said in March, and yet, I got a bunch of more emails, but uh, I, I didn't bring them in to read you, but the, uh, it's like um, overkill. You can only beat a, de uh, a rented mule so much before it falls on the ground, you know? They have commercials here on TV about uh, adopt a, a mule and adopt a lion and adopt a fucking elephant and adopt a rhinoceros that got his uh, fucking tusk. I didn't know they lived after the tusk got cut off on a rhino. And uh, you must be not be the uh, leader of the pack when you get your tusk cut off uh, in a rhino pack. You must fall to the bottom of, of the pack. But um, people just can't take the truth. And guys, you're no different. You're no different. Uh, it's just, you know, there's degrees of meatheadness. That's not a word, but there's degrees of meatheadness. And uh, the, uh, most of the people, the, the random public, are at the, at the bottom rung of the, of the meathead ladder. Um, the, um, it just, it, I still, at 75 years old, I just can't believe the shit that I read and the, the, the stupidity of, of the people that... Uh, uh, it's just like I told you, you know, I look at your Facebooks and you should just all close them down. And I asked you, I think, the first day, why do you put shit like this on Facebook? Some of you are guilty of it in this room. Why? Does anybody want to tell me why? Okay, self-sabotaging activity, and you want to be liked by the other. Do you know how incredibly asinine that is? How incredibly asinine. It just, it just, it, it, it just, It'd be, it, it's beyond befuddling to me. It's beyond exasperating to me. Uh, the, uh, and it's getting worse, which means it's easier for us during this era. If you pull the trigger, I should have um, a uh, sign here. I, I, I took, um, was it physics that I failed or might have been chemistry? I forget which. Whether, there, was a, uh, like, there was an answer, and he had a, a, like a, a flip chart here. And whenever uh, it was answered, he'd point at it. And the class would go, eh, like, self-sabotaging activity. And I can't remember what it is. I got an F. But, the, the, uh, but I had a lot of Fs. Uh, the one thing I do remember, we uh, did an experiment in chemistry. Um, does exercise promote urine? More pee. And there was a good-looking girl, and I volunteered with her to uh, to exercise. Now, I thought, it, I was hoping it was the other kind of exercise, but it wasn't. And uh, so when we got back to the lab, and, uh, and you do, exercise promotes pee. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, it's, whether you drink water or not, the body produces like two ounces of ur urine, as they say in this country, whether you drink any water or not. It's a byproduct of a bunch of other stuff, which I didn't understand now, then, and I'm sure shit don't care about it now. Um, but I just go corona or self-sabotaging because it's good for us. Um, although I get, uh, fair, not hate mail, it would be an exaggeration, but I get a, a fair amount of uh, people, you know, 
have an unkind thing to say about me, that I'm coaching or teaching people how to um, um, take advantage of um, the, uh, the Pollyannas during this period of corona. And really, we're not taking advantage of that. We're taking advantage of the economics and um, that are promoted by fear. Because most of the economics that they have in their heads, for those of you that have talked to the people during corona and follow the scripts, you know that they're afraid. Um, and now, as I said at the beginning of the week, they're pulling their heads out of the sand uh, where their, their management style was ostriches in the sand, head in the sand. And now they're pulling it out and they're seeing that things aren't any better and in many cases they're even worse. And so they're accelerating their thought process. And a lot of the kids, maybe some of you included, uh, are getting callbacks from call, cold calls or calls that you made three, six, uh, seven months ago. And now they're, you know, uh, they're interested uh, because the realization that this isn't going to go away anytime soon is upon them. And then this thing about uh, Fauci telling, oh, I mean, the worst is we haven't even seen the shit yet. And he's even still downplaying it. In 1918, 1919, there were approximately 1.5 billion people on the planet. 500 million got infected. 500 million. A third of the planet. Now, where are we now? Not even close, right? Now, hopefully because of modern medicine, etc., it won't be that bad. But there was some form of the 1918, and in those days they called it Spanish flu or influenza or whatever. Um, it was around three or four or five years. Three or four or five years. And um, uh, many of the guys uh, that uh, went to war, we, we, got, we joined the war late, America did, in World War I. Um, it's not sure what they died from, whether they died from the Spanish flu during wartime, because during wartime you don't, they don't do autopsies and that kind of thing. And, um, but it, it, it's good for us. I mean, I, I'm licking my chops, um, as um, you should be. But again, I should have a sign there if you pull the fucking trigger. Because if you don't pull the fucking trigger, then it was nice having you here. Uh, and. Uh, having to turn up the heat cut into my margin. But other than that, you know, fuck you. Strong letter to follow. But it's, it, it's so apparent that people still, they think that 2021, how did some newscaster say something on the, um, it was Al Jazeera, the, the Arabic station, uh, and he was talking to somebody in the newscaster, well, we're glad to see 2020 behind us. Well, in six days or whenever it is, or three days, it's not going to change. Nothing's going to change. And I heard from a, a, rep, a reputable source that um, after the first of the year, the UK may go on total lockdown. 100% total through March. Now, wouldn't that be a kick in the ass? Wouldn't that be a motherfucker? I don't know whether, I'm so happy, I don't know whether the shit will go blind. So we've gone from a full Christmas up here to one day Christmas, and they're sorry they gave us one day, uh, till, uh, Everything's going to get better in the new year until maybe they're going to total lockdown. Just think of how many businesses are going to go down now. I'm going to have to, uh, I'm actually going to think about it before. How do I revise my numbers from 20 to 40 percent of the uh, zombie companies not coming back? Do I say 40 to 70 percent? Now just, let's, let's just focus for a second on 50 percent. Don't come back. Some of those are you. So you'll be in a hurry to go back and turn the key now. 
<laughs> and you'd be hurried to get your business sold now. But if it's 50%, that means not one in every two people are going to be affected because every business has four employees, two employees, eight employees, 12 employees, 200 employees. Uh, every family's got uh, 2.4 people, uh, 1.6 dogs, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I haven't heard anybody crying about global warming lately. Huh? Yeah, I mean, and so because the, the new is our war against corona, our war against corona. Um, the um, Last night, uh, you saw uh, my Gestapo guy, but before we get there, some in this room and most of the people on uh, YouTube, and many of the QLA mentees aren't quite ready, and they had to do more spreadsheeting, or they do this, or they do that. Um, but that my, my experience of, for 50 years in business and 75 years being on the planet is that uh, waiting for the rest of their lives. You have parents, you have guys and gals that you know that it's uh, just not quite perfect, and so they're restudying. And, re and what I call, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, we were talking about Lotus la last night, Lotus 1 through 3, and now uh, spreadsheeting, and they'll spreadsheet it forever. And you've heard me say a gazillion times that unless the cha it's, it's uh, gar garbage in, garbage out, if you don't change the information, you can hit the, se hit the send button a jillion times, it's going to be the same answer. The same answer. In our particular case, the same answer is motivated seller, motivated seller, motivated seller, and if you don't have a motivated seller, you've got nothing. And if Corona really does go into uh, producing more lockdowns, they're going to be more uh, out, of, out of business. Right now, they say closed because of Corona. The signs now are going to say out of business. And some of them are going to say, sorry, out of business. I don't know what they're so sorry about, but anyway. Um, and it's going to get worse and worse. And, uh, and I, I'm not a, a, a doomsday. I said a couple of days ago, uh, let's go get uh, canned goods and dig a hole in the ground and get a bunker. I'm not, that's not me. Uh, the, uh, and eventually, uh, we can't, I told you, we can't buy businesses unseen, although some of the kids are. I, I'm going to be uh, uh, masked up and gassed up like a spacesuit going out and look at the businesses. Because I, I will not buy a business that I don't see where I'm boots on the ground. It's just, there's a plethora of things that can be wrong, and unless you're there, uh, you have no idea. Um, but you're never quite ready. You're never quite ready. The, 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 the Bobbies are arresting the guys at the Last Supper because it's an illegal uh, you know, uh, meeting. And uh, the, uh, we're about there now. We're about there. Uh, and, and I mean, it's on the face of it, people are dying and, and people are getting sick. And I, I know a couple of people uh, that have gotten it, uh, Corona, uh, and the, uh, it's the worst thing that they ever had. And uh, it really does have uh, devastating effects. But most of the people that the worst, worst thing that ever happened to them is, are older. I know one guy in his mid-30s that almost died from it, a mentee, uh, a Brit, uh, that um, he said that, uh, you know, after uh, two weeks, he wanted to die. That's how bad he felt. Now, they can do a lot of shit to me, but that's that never, never going to happen to me that I want to die. You know, I'd want to stay alive just to piss him off. Uh, the, uh, but this, this kid, and he's, and he's a nice enough English proper, wouldn't say shit in his mouth, which is obviously not me. And even for some of the guys in, in here, the, the pretend tough guys, I call you pretenders. Um, the, um, but so far, the, the sweetest people that I know are the people, you could also say the weakest people that I know, are the people that are suffering the most. No, 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 uh, uh, none of, uh, no, I'm going to be sarcastic. None of the six-pack, 5% body fat guys are getting it. I don't know that for a fact. I'm just making it up.
but because I don't know closely any 6% body fat uh, six pack guys myself, only by accident through guys that come to the seminar that might have uh, a six pack. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's the survival of the fittest. And even though this is, you know, uh, 40,000 years ago when survival of the fittest really meant survival of the fittest, this is survival of the fittest vis-a-vis -vis QLA. It is. The, the, the tough guys are, are, are going to be the last men standing, yes. By the way, Winston didn't pee or poo in his, uh, uh, for the 10th day in a row, did not pee or poo in his uh, cage at night. And so, uh, S Sally, you'd think that we won the motherfucking lottery. I mean, he's dancing around. And uh, so I don't know if it's, but not tonight, graduation night, but maybe tomorrow night we're going to not put him in his cage. He's, he's going to have just the basket without the cage. And him and his big sister Lola will. Although they, they both, uh, he wants to tear down the, the Christmas tree in my office. Uh, so we'll have to uh, pin that up. Okay, Winston, what do you, what do you want? So, um, uh, I'm oh, gonna... oh, one more thing. It is now Corona's on all seven continents. The, um, in Antarctica, South Pole, where Sally and I was at that scientific center, uh, uh, 26 out of 36 have it. 26 out of 36. Fuck. That means it's been there a while. And so uh, the, uh, it doesn't surprise me uh, because I, I haven't, well, there are different guys now, it's 10 years later, but those fucking scientists, they, they, they fuck. They're, they're not kind of social distance. And when we were down there, and unfortunately we didn't take a lot of pictures other than of ourselves, they running around 40 below zero in Bermuda shorts, boxer shorts, flip-flops on their feet, and they, they, some of them hadn't had a haircut in three, four years. Look, they look like Einstein, and they're all they're a little goofy. They're all a little goofy. And they're, some have been down there so long they've inbred. They've, you know, they've married each other, supposedly, and, and they're all like this. Okay, now Winston. Speaking of that, here's Winston. <laughs> So um, New Zealand has um, said, I can't go home till March 15th. Do you recommend... Is that because they know you? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Do they know you bit that guy's nose off? Is that, is that why you can't go home or is it just you no. can't go home? No. Um, it's our whole system. It's easier to travel out than to get back home. Uh-huh. Do you suggest I try and set up remotely or perhaps... Well, well, uh, well uh, uh, is it going to be healthcare? You're not sure? Yeah. Okay, well, it would be, be dependent on which of the avenues you go down. Um, uh, one of the reasons healthcare is even hotter than it was is because Corona. All of a sudden, people are health conscious. They, nobody gave a fuck before, you know? Um, but I mean, you could uh, set up remotely. Uh, now, didn't we discuss that you thought doing it in Australia? That was, that was the plan, but... Um I, I, I thought I had a plan to Australia that's changed. Australia locked down, America's locked down, and okay, well, I'm, I'm going to be here. Well, uh, well, <laughs> uh, well uh, Australia's probably, um, um, especially with the accent you have, although it's not like an Aussie accent, I understand that, but it's kind of like that, you know. Uh, I would probably pick Australia, and I would pick uh, healthcare. And uh, not, notwithstanding, we have several guys being successful there. The, uh, but, I mean, it's... I won't say it's wide open, but it's, it's wide open. Because even if we have 100 guys in Australia, which we don't, I know of maybe 10, uh, but they don't see each other. They don't bump into each other. A couple of them would like to bump into the, the girl that's down there, but the, uh, and you'd be, you'd be surprised. I mean, once in a while, somebody tries to uh, uh, not poach because they don't know that the, the chairman that you want is also the chairman of this other company. But that's about the, the most that we see. Uh, and it's normally at the chairman and CEO level that they cross paths. Because there's so many industry experts. There's so many fucking accountants. There's so many fucking lawyers. But um, the, uh, the guys and the gals that are CEO and chairman, uh, uh, potential chairmen and CEOs, are fewer, and so the kids, you, once in a while, 
bump into each other. But I mean, if the other guy is chairman of, uh, three months ago, it's doubtful that he's going to leave. Now, something uh, one of the mentees said um, on YouTube, uh, and I, I didn't cut it out like I should have. He says you can't be chairman more than uh, one company. What he meant to say is you can't be two more than one assisted living. But you, uh, we have guys. We've got one guy who's a chairman, three different deals, QLA. One's assisted living, one's conglomerate, and um, the other one is uh, pharmaceuticals. And he has, in his 35, 38-year career, he has experience in all three of those areas. And towards the end of his career, he was a chairman of a big uh, private equity fund. And, uh, and as I've warned during the seminar, you have to be careful when you bring ex-private equity guys that they're truly ex-former because almost all of them still have some sort of uh, ties to it, and it's no normally through ownership in companies, uh, and it may be their uh, pension plan. But I would, um, I would say Healthcare Australia. Oh, sorry. I was thinking maybe I should just pivot and try and set up here United Kingdom. Yeah. Oh, well, you, well, no, the United Kingdom, well, you're already here. I mean, uh, and they accept almost anybody uh, the, um, as, as witnessed. Uh, by um, the people that are doing bombs and shit, you know, that uh, uh, it always amazes me. And I, I, I go back to my back on being around my dad. Uh, he's been under investigation 19 months. Uh, MI6 is aware of him. MI5 is aware of him. Uh, the police is aware of him. But he set the bomb. Because under current law, you know, you have to actually be caught doing something now. Just because you say you're going to do it, Etc. Although that you may get a warning, uh, this last guy uh, uh, that was involved with a bomb in the UK uh, had been into the police and invest, uh, been, uh, interviewed seven times. And even though he talked radical shit to the cops, he didn't uh, ostensibly he didn't do any radical shit. And that see in the old days, you know. Uh, you know, they would, would have taken care of that person. And so, uh, and uh, human rights is a big deal, and, and um, I'm not a, a proponent. I'm a proponent of the human rights when they're uh, kidnapping kids in Ethiopia and shit like that. I'm a proponent of stopping that. But some of the other human rights, I don't consider inalienable, as they said, in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, you have to earn your human rights. Uh, and, of course, I, my opinion is not very popular, I might add. Um, but I, UK, I mean, and healthcare again. There's, and uh, I don't think Boris is going to national or uh, sell off uh, national health service like they've been threatening for 20, 25 years. But if they privatize national health service in the UK, every QLA bot that I ever produced in 28 years can come here and get rich. Every single fucking one. There are so many assets. Mismanaged, misrun. It's beyond your comprehension. I mean, you just, everybody can come here. Because they have tens and tens and tens and tens of billions of opportunities here. And every other Tory administration threatens to go back to the privatization that Mrs. Thatcher started. And it's just, I don't, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. When I first started coaching 27 and a half years ago, you know, I thought it might happen. Oh, fuck, we're just going to make hay here. But it never happened. But even without that, uh, there's still tons and tons of opportunities. That's a long-winded answer, um, Winston. The... Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, he said his uh, closing ratio was 60%. Because the, the techie guys realize, you know, and especially now, because this information is six, seven weeks old, that I'm telling you about Thomas, the, the Corona Rona 2 is coming, and then Corona Rona 3, and Dr. Fauci now, oh... He didn't say I lied, but, uh, you know, I forget how he put it. I shaved the truth. I, I forget. But he said it was for your own good because you can't take the truth. 
First rule of crisis management, lie. And when I said that in March, I mean, I took so much shit about it. But remember, the average age of the kids that are managing money is less than 87% of the money on the planet are managed by kids less than 30 years old. Now, can you imagine this fucking uh, Persian monkey, guys like him managing the trillions of dollars on the planet? Does that give you any se sense of safety? Are you fucking nuts? I don't care, he's the smartest 25-year-old that ever walked since Christ. He's still only 25, and the frontal lobe of his fucking brain isn't fully developed. And 87% of the fucking money on the planet is managed by monkeys like him. We're fucked. We're just absolutely fucked. And as Vinica would say, not in a good way. <laughs> Anything, uh, question? Yes, sir. Well, no, no. He said, in, uh, well, no, I'm telling you, he didn't say. No, no, but what I, what I, well, I, I say, he, he softens it a little. I said, you know, and uh, I expect a response in 72 hours. And then I used to say, is there any reason that that doesn't make sense to you, 72 hours? And then if they, they don't say anything, then in your email, remember? Uh, that was another thing, you know, uh, that we agreed upon, 72 hours. And 72, they probably get it to you in four days. 72 hours is three days. But nobody on the planet, almost 14 billion people, no, almost nobody's held accountable. Not 14, seven, seven and a half billion, actually, 14 billion years. So nobody is held accountable. You know yourself, other than me, who holds you accountable? Nobody. It's accountability, I mean. And uh, Elon and uh, uh, Mr. Gates have one thing in common. They, 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 uh, they restrict their diaries, their, their planners, to five, six minutes a meeting. Five, that's it. That means in an hour they're going to have 10, 12 meetings. And you either got to sell them or next. And I learned that, that uh, management style and as a young army officer, and I was blessed. I reported to two hard-ass fucking general officers. Roy Atterbury, may God rest his soul, and uh, Woodrow Vaughn, may God rest his soul. And they, they weren't interested that I had a hangover. They weren't interested I had diarrhea. They weren't interested I had the fucking flu. They weren't interested that um, my car broke down. They, they weren't interested that my driver uh, had a driver. Uh, uh, his wife had a baby. Uh, they, they, they didn't give a fuck. All they know is it's 800 hours. Where the fuck's Pina? That sorry fucking Mexican trash. One second after eight. So I would, you, but it, it's, it's, it's the bullet points. Um, and... They need to be reminded. And some of the older sellers that really do have early stage onset dementia or uh, variations of it, you have to remind. Now, you've got grandparents or great grandparents, and they forget. And they do forget. I don't forget anything. But I mean, I, I'm sure when I get old uh, or older, I'll forget as well. But I mean, and so I can't relate to when they, some guy uh, more or less my age forget something. He wanted to forget. And I know a lot of older people that use that as an excuse for not doing shit. Now, you had your hand up, Ed? Yeah. Go ahead. No, 60% that are interested to sell. He has an 80% on LOIs. That and because I told him you ought to close every motherfucker you talk to. Just as that old pervert told me, Kelly Norwood. Even though I make a lot of fun of the old bastard, he's dead a long time. But I mean, he, he was a much better salesman than he was a lawyer. 
And uh, if he hadn't said that, you know, young man like you, Pina, ought to close every motherfucker that comes through the door. And I didn't know any better. And the frontal lobe of my brain had, I was 24, going to grad school, waiting to go to law school on a scholarship. I was a selling motherfucker, boy. And, but then I saw well, how much money. You know, I told you of the benchmarks. I said, God damn. And when I got out of the military as a second, a first lieutenant, I was making $302 a month. $302 bucks a month. And then I made forty grand. I go, fuck. This could be all right, you know. And I could buy a lot of drinks. More than one. I bought the whole fuck. Everybody in the bar, the drinks are on me. 300 people. Did that influence pussy? You have no idea. I could barely go to the toilet by myself. Well, uh, yeah, but uh, I could barely. I don't need any bodyguards. Uh, uh, the, you know how the bouncers at the bar? Fuck, no, don't be knocking the girls. I, uh, it's, I can handle this. This I can handle. <laughs> I used to be good for business in places. There was a place in San Diego where we had an office. Uh, Fridays from 5 o'clock on, uh, pictures of margaritas for, I don't know, three bucks or some shit. And all the chips and salsa and all, you know, that kind of shit. I mean, fuck, I don't know how many pictures of margaritas I used to buy. Um, and that's when I got my first rolls when I was 25. And I've been driving them ever since. Ever since. So my comfort zone, if you will, is, is, is that kind of car. And of course, you look outside and I, it hasn't changed much. Um, was, there another, was there another hand? Anything else uh, about Josh? They, uh, you're going to get the webinar. Is there anything, anything else about any of the guys that you either, we've either talked about this time or that you saw uh, during um, the... Um, regular seminar, because everybody virtually in this room is from uh, this year, uh, either at the beginning of the year or more recently, as, as soon as just a few weeks ago. And uh, as soon as I said that, I knew Wellington uh, was going to raise his hand. Okay, Maximus, whatever the hell your name was or is. You understand. Is this by fact, a rumor, or legend? Okay, go ahead. From the airport, correct. Uh, well, his lifestyle when he lived at home, is his lifestyle lived at home, was one of nine kids. His mom had a child during, you know, a year or so later, and had her tenth kid. And they, the, uh, they teased because the... Um, the van that they had only can carry 12, 10 plus the parents. I didn't know that you could have vans that carried 12. I don't, you know, I don't know what kind of van they had. Um, the, he lived at home and had a 15-speed bicycle. And he, wasn't, he hadn't hit majority yet, so he couldn't guarantee shit until he turned 18. And then, but I mean, an 18-year-old with a 15-speed uh, bike. Uh, then he, then, then, then he uh, flew from um, uh, D.C., uh, I believe, to San Francisco and uh, got a job. I don't know, uh, went to B&B &B or what, one of those things you can rent a, a room at a house. Yeah, and, um, the, uh, and uh, interviewed with, I, don't, I forget if it was Google or Facebook, interviewed, um, and he never wrote a, a line of code. And it was a three-day weekend, and he learned how to code over three days, and uh, interviewed for the position, five, six interviews, and he got the job. I have a disdain for coders. It's a, it's a hand job. The, uh, he learned it in three days. Ah, oh, he's Michelangelo. Only Michelangelo could learn it. That's horseshit. Brain surgery, Panama. Mm. You wait. And I'll do one of your brains for free. I won't even charge it. You know? 
You got a twitch and you want to get rid of it? Come to me. Come see me in Panama. Uh, uh, um, Kim is uh, in Thelma uh, and Vinica are lining up my appointments. That you know, I, I'll fix your twitch. Uh, for, for, pardon? Uh, yeah. Um, for for free. And so then he went there and he um, um, got a job and he worked 60 hours a week in that job at that that uh, tech company and 60 60 hours a week in um, in QLA. Um, of course, he's 18 years old. I mean. I'm not suggesting that you don't need any sleep when you're 18, but I'm saying you don't need any sleep when you're 18, for those of you that remember back. Um, and your, your recovery time is like this. I mean, uh, and as we all know, and I'm the oldest by a lot, a lot of years, your recovery time when you drink now, you pay the price for action vis-a-vis uh, -vis hangovers. But when you're 18, fuck. Uh, normally you uh, get, uh, uh, what is it, a bit of the dog, the bitch, or what's it called? Yeah, yeah, and you bite more, or you drink more, and you just keep rolling. Um, and so he did that, and the, uh, of course he worked on the big deal that didn't come to fruition, and after seven or eight months he said, this is bullshit, and you know, where are the, where are the, where are the chimpanzees, Mr. Pena? Home health, uh, low end of assisted living. And here we have, you know, where are the chimpanzees? And they're still, you know, four years later. And the market's better now than it was then. No, no, he stayed there until, uh, I believe, it's for uh, acquisition. Uh, so it's about a year because we remember we wasted six, seven months. Uh, six, seven months in the... Um, and I, I, if I remember correctly, he moved to Chicago first because that was his first deal. And then his subsequent uh, deals were uh, near Vegas or near uh, in Nevada. And so he split his time between um, uh, Chicago and uh, Las Vegas. And I remember having dinner with him. And, uh, Sally and I were in Vegas. And uh, he's about he's 19 or 20 now. And um, I have a very dear friend I've known almost all my life, and he joined us for dinner, and, and Josh went to pay, I believe, the bill, uh, as, he, as he does. And uh, Howard said, fuck, where'd you, where'd you find this kid? This kid is super sharp. I said, I know. And I lied. I said, I got, I got a zillion of them. I lied. I, I got a zillion of them. He says, God damn, Dan. Uh, do you remember how we were in 1819? And I said, haven't been arrested with him two, three days. Yeah, I remember Howard, and uh, he's, he's not like we were. He's not like we were. And, but then Howard said, is this the current generation now? I, no, 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 this is not the current generation. This, this kid's a phenom. I never called him a phenom. Because I don't, you know, uh, enough people blew smoke up his ass. Enough. But... Uh, and I mean, you know, when you look at it, it, I thought it would inspire, well, fuck, if that kid that looks 10 years old can do it, I can do it. But we had just as many people saying, well, fuck, he's Michelangelo, Pena's a fraud, I mean, he hired this kid from Caltech or MIT, and I, well, I heard all kinds of shit, all of which was not true. But if, if, if you want to come up with a reason not to do it, or not to believe, you, we all know we can come up with a reason. We can come up with a reason. And, um, but the new, uh, not child prodigy, but the new phenom is, uh, is Tom Thomas. And again, he doesn't look Asian. Now, some people say there's a reason in gene pool. They're Asian, but they don't look Asian. Now, how the fuck do they come up with that shit? You know, where does Pena find these? Asians, but they're not Asian. And then we have some, can you prove that he's really Korean? Can you prove, like I have to, can you prove he's really Chinese? Other than I've seen their parents, I mean, other than that, unless they're pretend and they're not real, maybe Josh hired his Korean dad, you know, to pretend as he, because they can't believe that these kids can do this and they are not able to do it. And, and these kids are 15, well, uh, Thomas isn't, Thomas is only two or three years younger than when I did it. But, I mean, Josh is clearly 15, 16, 17 years younger than when I did it. 
And that's why I went to the house and I wanted to see with my own eyes. And Sally and I came back. Said, we don't believe it. It's just, these are fucking aliens. They're not Michelangelo. These are fucking aliens because nobody lives like this. And compared to our lives, you know, the, um, yeah, well, somebody had their hand. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He, um, he was looking for, what did he call it? Uh, um, not a game plan, uh, but a building block system. Look, thank you. That's exactly what he called it. I, I, I've been looking for a blueprint all my life. Now, how can a 17-year-old be looking for something all their life? I've been looking for a blueprint. I think he told Sally that uh, graduation dinner. I've been looking for a blueprint all my life, and I found it. All his fucking life, you know. Oh. Of course, we were significantly older than 17, 18. Realize that even the 25-year-old, I mean, at 17, you don't know shit. Um, but he found the blueprint, and he just went to work. The other side is he had no baggage, little or no baggage. His baggage, I don't know, he was very religious. Uh, but... Um, he used that. Um, he used that to, uh, and he was homeschooled. Um, and his father is a West Point officer, and his mom's a psychologist, who just by serendipity, uh, part of her graduate school thesis, etc., was based on uh, Dr. Spock's book, the book I tell you guys to get. Fuck. What are the odds of that happening? Didn't happen to us, did it? No. One in ten million, or one in ten billion, or but it doesn't matter. It's a hundred percent, and um, the uh, and then I mean it's it, it's quite remarkable. But the system, like he would tell you, the system just works, and you don't have to know anything. Anything else about uh, Josh or any other um, questions? Uh, you're going to hear the seven foot Dutchman when you get the webinars. Uh, who, I mean, now, now he is not ruthless. That's not the right terminology. But I mean, he's he get, he makes one offer. That's it. You have three days. Yes or no. That's it. There is no. He goes, makes the offer in person. Of course, now I mean, Corona. He makes the offer in person. Here it is, three days, yes or no. And there's no, if you remember correctly, he made the, the first three or four acquisitions were 100% owner finance. Then he went back to a bank and got them financed for 200% of what the purchase price was. So he doubled his money. He took out double his money. And, uh, but he believed that it, unlike Margot and laughing, he believed if Pena says it, normally you don't get 200%, normally you get 120%, 130 But I told him, ask for 200 and, and then he says, well, shit, I should ask for 300 And um, And so now he's, uh, he's, he's away. Now he's got three regional managers because he can't, you know, he can't manage all those things. And, uh, and like he said for the Dutch people in the room, the Dutch are lazy and stupid, so the, um, the, um, when you push them against the wall and you don't give them any wiggle room, uh, they, 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 they'll, they'll accept. Now, and I told him when I first met him, I mean, you put a three-piece suit on, you're going to own them. And he said, uh, and he had always been taught to be gentle with people because he's such a big guy. And he walks in, and he, I mean, he's a commanding presence. So now the reason he's done it is he's seven foot nine, or because we got Michelangelo on the one end, and we've got uh, the uh, we got uh, Bruce Lee kung fu with Thomas, and now we got uh, uh, the seven foot giant, because you know it's just that they 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 they, they took the program and they uh, focused on it and stayed with it. I've, I've reduced my uh, my exposure vis-a-vis -vis chairmanships and things like that, and. Uh, but I, I plan on having seminars this year, or not this year, next year. Um, but uh, not until things calm down. And uh, Sally, to her credit, uh, you know, 
fought off the opposition so we could stay open. And all the things Sally was worried about, I wasn't, came true. She was right and I was wrong. I just, you know, they wouldn't do that. I would, fuck, I was wrong. Uh, because there's a lot, of, a lot of animosity out there about you guys being here. I think it borders on hatred. You're here and they're not. That's tough shit, you know? Uh, but I never thought that it would go to the lengths that it's gone. The lengths that it's gone. But if, if I was British, I'd come in here and piss and moan every day. And, oh, my God, I'm going to go to court. I'm going to go to jail. But uh, we didn't. And we're almost at the end. And come tomorrow, the, um, the YouTube is going to go back online. But apparently the YouTube antagonized a lot of people. Pissed a lot of people off. Uh, I, I personally think Wellington pissed them off myself. In my humble opinion, they look like, he looks like an arrogant fuck back there, doesn't he? And I mean, I'm, I, I believe, I, yeah, I believe, I believe he, I believe he pissed everybody off, and he turned the uh, YouTube public against us. I believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the uh, tonight um, uh, graduation. Um, and uh, we'll have a festive time vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, social distancing. And the, um, uh, you'll, um, I know that uh, some of you have already gone out trying to get your uh, corona shots. And uh, the test, not shots, excuse me, test. Thank you for, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you for correcting me. Um, and, uh, but I mean, this is the, uh, I'm sorry to say, this is the future. And again, not just because Fauci says it, because I've been saying it since March, it's only going to get worse, which means it's better for us. You know, few times are you on the side of destiny, so to speak, where uh, you're able to benefit. And if, you, if it's important to you to use the line, you're helping people, you know, I'm sure you are, but uh, at the end of the day, you're helping yourself. You're helping your family and uh, the various things that uh, are important to you uh, to create generational wealth. And now I'm, uh, I'm changing it three to seven years, I say, right? Now general, uh, generational wealth, one to four years. That's the quantum of how it's been squeezed, the timeline. One to four. One to four. Um, and... Um, I've been right so far, and I, as I said in one of my social media posts, I don't like being right when, when, it's, when, when lives are at stake, okay? Uh, but I am right, and uh, there's other guys out there that have as much experience as I do uh, that are keeping their mouth shut for a lot of obvious reasons. Uh, I'm surprised uh, that uh, Fauci has now opened up uh, the... Um, I wouldn't be surprised if... Uh, Trump can't fire him, though, because if he could, I think Trump would fire him now. Um, but he, he's just telling the truth. And um, even though a few weeks ago I said that uh, um, there's stats coming out, MIT came out with stats that were uh, much worse uh, than Johns Hopkins, which is a fine institution, then MIT is also a fine institution, that the results could be as much as 12 12 times worse, 12 times worse. And even though I only listened to a little bit of news this morning, I mean, um, the people are getting on the bandwagon, the victim bandwagon. And I wish that we could just get a, a telephone list of the victims that own healthcare uh, so we could needle in, zero in, and, and just call those guys and gals. And they're, they're, they're certainly there. Um, and, uh, and some of you, uh, you know, the, you can't go home until March. I, I, I personally think, uh, Winston, it's because of you. I think it's got a, not a goddamn thing to do with uh, your, where you're from in the world. Uh, now, if they said that about Wellington, I'd believe it in a heartbeat. I mean, uh, they're not letting Wellington because he's Wellington. And as you well know, or if I, if I heard it about him, I'd even pay money to support, you know, keeping him, and he's in his dream world there, you know, he's playing, uh, 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 porn. porn, he's porn, okay, 
Huh? Is, is there Persian porn? Oh, timer. How's the Persian porn? Huh? Oh, Lord. The, uh, uh, but I, I told you, I remember when the, the French uh, Legionnaires guy said, and they came to me the third day, uh, Mr. Pena, is there, you know, uh, is there anything that you'd like us to do about the, the guys that are the disruptors? No, 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 no. That's, that's part of the uh, democratic way. And he says, but in, in the Legion, we, we wouldn't allow that. It would be considered um, disloyal. Hmm. Well, let me think about it tonight, and I'll, and I'll tell you tomorrow whether I want you to follow through. Um, the, uh, now, if we had you guys sleeping up in the wall garden, uh, we could have taken more. Yeah, yeah, that's right, the doofus test. And, but I mean, I know they had to break the ice on the water, that fountain, to get cleaned up in, in the mornings. <sighs> Oof. Uh, the, um, and they came through, I mean, they looked sharp. Uh, the, uh, um, any any uh, uh, final questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Is this a, uh, how do I rob a bank? How do I pull the dump truck up? And, uh, no, go ahead. Legitimate statement. Mentally stuck with finding my chairman. I was putting out way too, much, too little volume and lost my momentum and the energy from the first seminar. So I was shifting towards my regular business again. And you mean selling th things to people they don't need? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I know the model. I, I know the model. <laughs> um, but now after the hardcore seminar, I think I finally got it. I got it through Simon, through Amir, and through Guy. Amir? Yeah, because Fuck. yeah, the way they did it, that finally made, well, I mean, made uh, it come to my they, they didn't do it by any fucking magic. I mean, they followed, uh, generally speaking, the steps. And we have a um, extraordinary uh, results. I, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned, uh, for whatever reason, the hardcore guys and gals, guys in this case, come out and uh, they, they do six, seven, eight times what the people that do out of the regular seminar. Um, and part of it is what you just alluded to, because uh, although this wasn't a, a highly leveraged with a lot of deals uh, group, there's a, enough guys that are a, a far enough down the line where it's pretty fucking obvious it works. Uh, and uh, the, a German will always relate to another German. Uh, I don't want to even go there. I, I don't want to fucking go there. But there's a reason why, I mean, millions of people march down the street. There, are, there just is. But I mean, uh, we have ter terrific results out of the hardcore. Um, and Sally's already saying, to, because the next hardcore is supposedly in June, but if we don't have any seminars in January, February, March, depending on the lockdowns, I mean, uh, whether uh, we'll have to uh, not have it in June because I'm not going to have it unless we have at least as many people. And I told you five people in London couldn't come here uh, because of the uh, uh, Gestapo lockdown they got in London down there. Uh, so uh, we may not have another one until late in the year. But they're very effective. They're extremely effective. Um, and uh, uh, seeing Klaus and seeing Marcus uh, and, uh, and seeing the last guy to do a, a deal uh, the Belgian guy is pretty powerful. It's pretty fucking powerful, especially when he's he's not some big giant salesperson, and he and he, and he tells it how it is, which relates uh, to most of the kids that attend the seminar. Uh, we haven't had anybody ever uh, attend the seminar that's like me. I'm waiting. It's not likely that I'm, we're ever going to find anybody like me. But the um, we have we have released the monsters in you kids over the years, and even though I don't like the webinars and I don't like all the bullshit, they, it works. It works, and uh, we will continue. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to adding some of you, uh, if you'll do it, uh, to the webinars. Uh, but you may uh, do deals and then disappear off into the sunset like some of them do. So I, I'm used to that as well. 
I have a feeling that Wellington won't be one of those people because he can't keep his mouth shut and, and he wants to be on camera. So, I mean, so there's a few, uh, but um, I mean, the stuff is, uh, is uh, if I do say so myself, it works admirably and it works more admirably in this um, diverse, chaotic period. And from chaos comes order. And, and God knows we've got chaos. God knows. And you guys, uh, and I don't give too many compliments, as you well know, should be complimented because you're here. And uh, the, um, even though Winston can it's, it's like um, there was a, a movie, Man Without a Country, many years ago. And it was about uh, a, um, a British officer that uh, uh, did something, and the Brits wouldn't let him into the country, and the Americans, even though he helped during the Revolutionary War, wouldn't let him in the country. And he spent his entire life at sea. And he, could, he, he, he docked in Boston, but he couldn't get off. He docked in Liverpool uh, uh, or wherever, and he couldn't get off. He docked in Australia, he couldn't get off. So for 40 or 50 or 60 years, and they show through the movie, and he's old, craggly, uh, he was a young uh, officer, and then uh, finally, finally, uh, President, uh, I don't know, uh, the fourth, uh, not Jefferson, but the fourth or fifth president of the United States, finally, and so I can just see Winston, you know, stumble off the gang plant. They finally let him back into a country. Uh, but uh, hopefully that's not going to be you, Winston, man without a country. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, unfortunately for him, it, it's a pay price to action. They won't let him back because of the, uh, the corona. And the, uh, but now he's got uh, other opportunities, and we've talked about other places for him to do it. And so he'll just man up and he'll do it someplace else. The good thing, with one or two or three exceptions, you can do this anywhere. And those exceptions are it's harder in Russia, it's, it's harder in uh, Ukraine, and there's two or three out of the African continent. It's not impossible, but Nigeria and places like that, Ethiopia, it's fucking hard. Uh, not impossible, but hard. So uh, I'd rather most of you are in countries that you can do it. Uh, in fact, all of you are in countries that can do it. In certain other countries, are the, you know dead simple, Germany, Canada, the United States, the UK, etc. Is, is, is dead fucking simple. Um, the uh, um, and again, where there's a rule of law. Uh, the um, and uh, but you can even do it in South Africa, as, as I pointed out, uh, that we have success stories. But you got to pull the fucking trigger, um, and you know you got to take control of your life. And make yourself accountable. And you, you know, even though I don't, uh, uh, a lot of guys send me reports. I rarely comment. Uh, the, uh, but when you get down to, you know, you, you, you haven't, you've fallen, and you've fallen a foot short of the goal line. You know, I, 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 I normally respond. Uh, the uh, as I did with uh, uh, one person that I alluded to during the seminar that they were down there, and I told them to go, tell them the SBA to go fuck themselves. Um, the um, and apparently uh, it closed today. So the but you got to keep pulling the trigger. You got to keep pulling the trigger, and no matter how many times you got to keep pulling the trigger, you can't ever stop pulling the trigger. And it's um, you got to pull the trigger until your finger wears out. Either the trigger falls off or your finger falls off. One of the two, but not before. Uh, and the um, um, and as you were saying about the building, you, it got boring, you know. And uh, the uh, uh, I would say you're not making enough money if, it, if you got bored, uh, which is part of it. And but here, uh, when you get it right, not dissimilar to the German example, uh, and it just creates a shit machine that everything you do shits money. Um, and uh, when you're at that stage. And that's where Marcus is, you know. The uh, uh, he's looking for uh, greater horizons, more more challenging horizons, which means bigger money, okay. And um, and it's fun, as Sally would say. Um, and uh, Sally and I were discussing uh, last night after we left you guys uh, to watch Marcus that the growth that we've seen in fuck a lot of people. Uh, and uh, she's talking about personal growth. You know, psychological growth, and I'm talking about bank account growth. My wife, my lovely wife, the psychologist, and I look at 
success slightly differently. Uh, and uh, but uh, the, when these guys, and like when I was hearing you earlier, it's like a symphony to me. Fuck, you know. And uh, when I hear the you, the rest of you that have made made it work, um, it's like a symphony. Uh, and then when that symphony turns into cash, euros, rub, not rubles, that's Russian, shekels, uh, even in Israel, dollars, pounds. Uh, I mean, it is. And then it becomes a symphony to you. And uh, as I said, um, I've never seen a significant other, assuming you stay together, that's a big assumption, I've never seen a significant other that didn't get used to spending more money. I've been doing this tw almost 28 years. Never. I haven't found one that didn't get, you know, uh, wasn't happy uh, being a richer rather than poor. You know, uh, I've never seen one. And so uh, I leave you with, uh, I'll see you, uh, you're going to be all uh, duded up in your, in your duck suits later on this evening. And the, uh, I'll make a couple of speeches during uh, the ceremony. And, uh, but anyway, guys, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd be disingenuous if I didn't tell you I'm happy to see you go. <laughs> uh, but um, more than anything, so you can get out there and get amongst them as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, I was reading emails earlier when I left you guys, and uh, <clears throat> they, we've got some deals closing in the, the last minutes of this year, and uh, as, as normal, and they're pushing them. And this year, they're pushing them harder than normal. Um, the, uh, the UK, uh, Scotland's locked down to the 18th of this next month. <clears throat> Some of you can or cannot get back to uh, your homelands, uh, um, and but uh, because we're doing it via Skype and uh, uh, etc., uh, Zoom, it uh, shouldn't slow you down. And in, in fact, uh, the fact that uh, they'll be able to take more calls <clears throat> than the norm for sure. Um, in year end, virtually nobody takes calls, as you well know, almost nobody and almost nobody forces the calls other than kids like us and me decades ago. Um, I'm not gonna beat it to death, I've already said. <clears throat> the, uh, normally at the end of the seminar, like now, I'm starting to lose my voice. Uh, by tomorrow, I, I, I w might have lost my voice, by, but I still have uh, plenty of strength to talk now. The, uh, it's been a, a remarkable week for you. It's life-changing. Uh, a couple of you have already commented during our our last hour, hour and a half today, uh, how, um, I don't know if seeing the light is the right terminology, but seeing the light is, 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 is probably is the right terminology. Um, if you don't pull the fucking trigger, uh, it's for naught. Uh, forget the money that you've spent. Uh, forget the time you've spent. For, for, for most of you, you've been quarantined. Uh, so it's, it's that, been that more, more much more expensive because you can't get that time back. The, the seminar is, uh, is remarkable, if I say so myself, because we show you step by step, and at the hardcore, we show you examples, uh, and you hear yourself. <clears throat> and uh, not all of you are that articulate, but uh, a few of you showed examples, and that's why we go through your own cases or the cases that you found out on the internet. Uh, it's music to my ears. It's like Wagner to Hitler when I hear uh, you guys talk about cold call. Well, how did you get it? Cold call. How did you get it? Cold call. I feel like um, when uh, Hitler uh, rolled through Poland uh, and they're playing Wagner in the background, or when Hitler rolled through Austria and they didn't fire a, a shot. It's like fucking Wagner to me. Uh, and Wagner happens to be one of my favorites. The... Um, uh, and regular guys here, no extraordinary salespersons, um, but they had the will to push it forward. Uh, you, you heard of the uh, analogy of uh, uh, pinching themselves or whipping their arm, etc., uh, which was not dissimilar to I used to burn cigarettes into my arm to uh, get my juices flowing. Uh, before I made personal presentations, and uh, I take a 20 story building and I cold called everybody in the building, I, as I'm going up the elevator, I'd be slapping myself to get blood rushing, and then I had to wait. Look, most of the elevators had mirrors in them. I had to wait till the 
blood subsided, so it didn't look like somebody was punching me in the face. Um, but I understand that because I've been there. You know, I, uh, you know, I, I developed into a cold calling uh, son of a son of a gun because I made a lot of cold calls. And you don't get good at making cold calls unless you make a lot of cold calls. And um, every once in a while, the um, as we talk to at least one of you about, when you get momentum going, you don't want the day to end. You just want to keep calling. And I, I know what that feeling's like. Um, but it's, it's it's mostly cold calls, but you got to follow the steps. And you've heard, again, uh, the, the shortened version of uh, uh, requesting, uh, you know, have you ever uh, thought about selling your business? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, your tax returns, the financials, etc. And it all sounds easy peasy until you have to do it. For those of you that have tried it, you know, uh, talk's cheap. It takes money to buy whiskey. And it's not, it's not as easy as it sounds when you hear somebody talking about it. But it's not impossible either. It's not impossible either. And a lot of people have been successful. A lot of people, an inordinate amount of people. And uh, during this corona period, you heard about the 9, 8, 7, 6, 11, 16 deals. And uh, the contrary to what some of the YouTube fucking morons think, um, I could get better central casting actors than you. I guarantee fucking tea it, I could. The, uh, um, and that uh, could actually sell on the phone. Um, but you know, it, it's not central casting, and this is for real. And not just in time, but in money, it's, it's, in today's terms, uh, it's, it's fairly expensive. It's not the end of the world. But if you think about every time you hesitate to pull the trigger, for those of you that have kids, they're gonna put a gun in the mouth of your little shithead daughter, your little shithead son, they're gonna blow the fucking brains out. And you're gonna have new wallpaper in your shitty apartment and it's the brains of your kids. I mean, that should be motivation. Of course, some of you are sorry, after you've heard me, sorry you had the fucking kids, but that's a whole other story. Um, I used to make the analogy about blowing your wife's or significant other's brains out, but nobody really much gave a shit about that. So I changed it to your kids. I changed it to your kids. But uh, guys, it's, um, it's, uh, I've said it ad nauseum, so everybody gets sick, including myself. This is our fucking time. I mean, it, it, it's so obvious to me that it's our fucking time. And you've heard the kids, they don't say it's our fucking time, but they say it's, I don't want to say it's easy, but it is easy. And those are the words from, not necessarily babes, but these are the, the words from the um, QLA bots that are out there in the field. So I want, I want to wish you uh, luck and we're going to have the graduation ceremony. But it's beyond luck. It's, it, it's beyond perseverance. Those who stay focused first the longest will win. To your quantum leap, I want you to go out there and rip their fucking heads off and shit down their neck. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, to Sally's credit and all the paperwork and all the horse shit and all the approvals she got from the council and the and uh, all this horse shit um, I thought was just a, w a waste of time because um, I didn't think it would come to that, but I was wrong. Again, not dissimilar to apps, I was dead fucking wrong. And if we hadn't had all those things, I mean, um, I mean, there's a probability, high, probably a high probability that they would have stopped us. Not dissimilar to the people that were here in March when they stopped us last time. The, um, the, uh, but that, again, is good for us because there's a lot of small-minded people out there. And you, you, you will not um, be surprised by the small-mindedness. And I figured out a long time ago, the, mostly it's based on jealousy. Not all. It's based on jealousy and ignorance. And when, when I was the uh, most successful Hispanic uh, businessman, uh, in 1981 in the United States. Um, and I, I, I candidly commented that we're the best we got, I mean, we're fucked. And then when the article in 1983 in the LA Times, the new wealthy Latina, but if I'm the best we got, we're fucked. And I, well, now I'm not, the, clearly there's, you know, eight or 10 guys in the United States that are Hispanic that have made more money than I have. Um, all of which are m mostly, um, uh, high-tech guys but <clears throat> the um, there's a lot of jealousy there just is 
<clears throat> some of you haven't experienced it yet, most of you haven't, because, you know, as you attain more success and you attain more notoriety, I mean, they crawl out of the walls. But there, you know, in, for everybody in this room, there's somebody that would like you not to be successful, at least one, if not more. And um, over the 27 and a half years, I've experienced kids like yourself. Uh, that's why that, there's only about 20% of the kids up there. Because they, you know, they, I haven't found anybody that doesn't want the money. Maybe one exception. But they sure as fuck don't want the notoriety. Now, Sally, and you've heard me say this before, contends that um, it's uh, a lot of guys don't pay taxes. And a lot of guys don't pay taxes. No question about that. Um, but that's not my, my challenge. That's your challenge. We pay taxes. I pay taxes in the UK, and I pay taxes in the US. And there used to be 25, 30 years ago, there was some favorable tax treaties that maybe I, I made 3% or 5%, but those, those treaties are gone. So I don't, there's no benefit for me. Uh, I just pay the taxes. In the infamous words of uh, Bunker Hunt, if you're worried about paying taxes, Danny, you're not making enough fucking money. And uh, I really believe that. So I don't worry about the taxes. Uh, and I try not to worry about the expenses. You, you dropped something there on the floor. I try not to worry about the expenses of the estate because they're astronomical. Um, and, the, uh, and I just um, uh, keep motoring on. Now, um, we're not sure when the next seminar is going to be. Um, depends. The lockdown here in Scotland ends the 18th of January. So we'll see. And um, But I predict that the next wave, and, and we may be, as was alluded to, uh, by Dr. Fauci, we may be in lockdown all next year. Now just think about what that's going to do to business. For us, I mean, the motivated sellers are going to be chasing you, well, to, to the extent they can get out of the lockdown, they're going to be chasing you down the street. But the uh, devastation it's going to do to the worldwide economy is pretty horrific. But don't focus on that. Just focus how, you know, it's going to benefit you. And, and it will. But the worse things get, the more jealousy there's going to be. The worse things get. Yes, sir. Well, I mean, uh, they only have to miss, miss one tax payment. No, you can there will be um, different counties, different states, different countries handle it differently. But you can um, uh, go to where the, uh, the tax registrar is and, they, they, and uh, where they, they show uh, people that are def defaulted on taxes. And I mean, you can go straight to the county, straight to the municipality, and um, um, they, in some places they have auctions where you can go uh, pay for the taxes. I mean, it's, it's not difficult. It's not difficult. And vis-a-vis -vis what's happening with corona, there's going to be tons and tons and tons of people that don't pay taxes. There are going to be more people that don't pay taxes than are in arrears and the rents. I mean, by a multiple. I mean, uh, you know, because the taxing authority isn't on your ass in 30 days. The taxing authority isn't on your, on your ass in 60, 90 days. I mean, it could be a year, two years. And uh, whereas the, um, the, the building you're in wants to fucking rent now, they, they, they don't wait a year to, to notify you. Pardon? Well, there's, there's city taxes, state taxes, there's different kind of taxes. Pro well, property tax, I don't, uh, I, I think they do at the end of the year. But, uh, but, but they're going to be late in notifying people. 
because right now you're not supposed to foreclose in certain areas. You're not supposed to do a lot of things. But I mean, as soon as that deadline's over, they're gonna be on you like stink on shit. Uh, no, no, I understand. No, no, I understand. It. But a seller that has got two years of arrears in taxes is going to be double motivated to sell. It's not, it's not the fact that we're flipping anything. But not only has half of the people in his, uh, again, but cash flow has got to cover debt service, half the people uh, in his um, assisted living are dead. Uh, and he hasn't paid taxes. And so he's going to be that much more motivated. And to the extent that, um, you know, the, um, that's not everybody's cup of tea. It just isn't. But if it is your cup of tea, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. It wasn't my cup of tea. I didn't go around, uh, because there were so many opportunities other than that. But I certainly know how to do it, and I certainly have mentees that have gotten rich doing it. Because it's the, the um, but it's the, uh, it's the bottom feeder mentality. The bottom feeder mentality. But there's nothing against the law about being a bottom feeder. There's nothing against the law. You may not, uh, it may not bode well with you on a moral basis, admit it, but um, it's certainly not against the law. And there's certainly countless people that have done it. There's countless people who have done it. But, but just because countless people have done it doesn't make it right. I'm not saying that. But the point is that you certainly won't be held in uh, low esteem by the bank. You may be counted as low esteem by your wife or, or, your, you know, or your mother, but uh, not by the bank. Oh, well, 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 okay. Talk sheep, we'll see, we'll see. The, uh, and I, the, the Graham and Leanne, uh, uh, the, the Scottish people that are on their way to superstardom here locally, just neighbors of mine, they have, uh, as I posted on uh, uh, social media, when I was on their TV program, Sky, Property, Sky, Prop, Sky TV Property, or whatever it's called, they have, you know, against the odds, stayed together and become very successful. Uh, and they're soon to be up there. Uh, and they bought a, you know, 84 million pound deal four miles from me. They're, they bought two things that are neighbors of mine and they're manufacturing, one's a manufacturing, actually they're both manufacturing. Uh, one's a construction, one's a manufacturing company that uh, fell on hard times. And they uh, bought it, one uh, he bought for a pound, and the other one 100% uh, set of finance. And as Graham would say if he was sitting here, in his thick Scottish accent, you know, I, you know when I came here to the hardcore, uh, I, I, I didn't know what the fuck uh, set of finance was. I had no idea, and I had no idea that you could buy companies for no money. Not set up for that where you give him a pound and just take it off their hands. He hasn't yet got one that where they paid him. That's his new goal, you know. Um, but to a Scotsman, to have somebody pay you to take the business is, is like the antithesis of Braveheart. I mean, they just, they can't get it. I mean, how is that fucking possible? But um, Graham and Leanne are working their balls off. And I was, I was happy and proud to be there on their TV show, their first interview, um, which took place in the uh, drawing room. But when they were here for uh, Hardcore, uh, we had it in the, uh, they were in the uh, chapel, and there was no heat then. And uh, <laughs> it was broken or whatever, like something breaks all the fucking time. And I mean, they were wearing top coats, and the steam was coming out of their fucking mouth, and I was, and the uh, and the um, cookies and, uh, and and coffee and shit, the coffee couldn't stay warm. As soon, you know, it was cold right away, and the cookies were like frozen. I mean, uh, but um, but I mean, they're, they're you know, and by Scottish standards and by UK standards, they're super heavyweights now. Um, 
but they, they work like dogs. They're a married couple that together, they work like dogs. If they weren't both on, on board, they'd be fucked. They'd be fucked. Of course, they, they yeah, let them sleep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, uh, make sure your father gets home. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and but I mean the uh, and of course that's music to my ears, and uh, and there are neighbors. They're already neighbors, and the uh, and they're just you know, uh, they're just up the road. And they um, and when I told them to climb the Matterhorn, not the Matterhorn. Uh, when I just came off of a, uh, fuck, in uh, Kathmandu. Ever, excuse me, uh, they, they climbed it. And when all these things, they just, you know, but then they're not poor. So they have money to do all this shit. Because um, most of the stuff I tell you to do, like uh, the Orient Express, is fucking expensive. It's super expensive. Um, and there's only three suites on the Orient Express. And there's only one grand suite sound, and I had the grand suite. But I mean, it's not grand grand. I mean, uh, because uh, the, the, normally, um, and uh, six cabins share a bathroom. I said, I ain't doing that. And this is before Corona, so there's only three rooms that have a bathroom, and there's only one grand suite. And so um, we, we, we got, had that. But I mean, uh, they've gone and done these things and experienced these things. And he has a fear of heights. And so when he jumped um, in Las Vegas, that thing I jumped off, 895 feet or whatever it was, he went um, and uh, it scared the shit out of him. But um, and so, so, so now, and he bought a roll, I, I posted that on social media. And not because he can't afford it, because he's cheap. And uh, not similar to Dutchman, he's cheap. And uh, the story is uh, how, did, how copper wire was discovered uh, Scott and the Dutchman fought over uh, a penny. That's how copper wire was invest, uh, invented, or found, or initiated. And there's a lot of truth in that. Sally likes the story better that a, a Dutchman and a Yorkshireman fought over a penny. And uh, as Sally would say, if she was sitting here, there's, there's nothing uh, wrong about being frugal. Uh, you know, I call it cheap, she calls it frugal. Uh, Vinica calls it... Uh, What's the word for frugal in Dutch? Yeah, something like that, anyway. Uh, but, um, but I mean, it, it's like I've got, I'm on my second generation of kids now because uh, uh, the guys that I, I trained up in the 90s, their kids are coming to the seminar. And it's, 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 very, it's very gratifying. I'm looking forward and I, I, I tell our children, uh, I've got, we've got two grandkids, that um, I'm not, and they're only one and a half and four and a half. And it's not likely uh, I'm gonna be coaching when the one and a half one is uh, 18 or 20. But um, as you saw on social media, he had, had a, uh, he wears a little t-shirt around, uh, future um, icon, uh, and, uh, and he doesn't know what that means, but his four and a half, five year old sister kinda does. And, his four and a half sister, uh, old sister is uh, reading Art of War for babies. And guys, I'm telling you, self-esteem is built the first seven or eight years. It just is. And um, the, um, and, you know, uh, Art of War for, and I think it's for dummies, uh, Art of War for dummies, I think it was called. And the, um, and you can't start too early. And Baron Trump, I've never met, uh, but I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine that he won't be a high performance group. Now, some of the kids get on drugs, die, overdose, and shit like that. But, and I've had some friends, unfortunately, that lost their kids to that. But it's, it, it's, it's, it's not likely, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to think that, um, Baron Trump will be anything but a, a super high performance. And even though you might not like the Trump kids, they're all high performance kids. They're all high performance. Whether they deserve to be executive vice presidents in the Trump organization is another story. I don't know. 
but they're all pretty sharp. They're all pretty sharp. Um, are they Elon Musk's? Are they Jeff's? Are they Bill Gates? I don't know. I don't know. But they're all pretty goddamn sharp. Whereas most of the kids uh, that elk aren't that sharp. Um, and of course it is a, it is a benefit uh, to uh, be raised in that organization. Whereas our kids, we've given them no money. And when they got out of school, it took uh, our daughter six months to get a job on her own. And it took our son, youngest son, nine months. And I didn't pick up a phone. I didn't make one call for them. They had to get their jobs on their own. Uh, and although I, if Derek, you're watching this, after about six and a half months, I started to get a little weak need that I was gonna help him out, but I didn't. And he got the job on his own because it's their job. And they got it without daddy's, you know, assistance. And that's, that's super important that they do it on their own. Just as I talk about the Hungarian uh, Forrest Gump, his and these various other kids, they've done it on their own. And that's really important because to build your self-confidence, I don't need, you know, I, I won't say I don't need any more self-confidence, but I certainly don't need um, to uh, any more experience vis-a-vis -vis that. And, and that's why I, I make sure, especially when I'm chairman, the, um, I, and I was saying that I'm chairman, I'm certainly not helping them any more than the regular kids go through the seminar. Question. Yes, sir, in the back. Well, I mean, if they don't, if they haven't paid their taxes, they're not going to pay you to take over the company. It's got to be something else than that. Uh, the uh, and uh, the them paying you happens one in fifty times, one in a hundred times. It's not the uh, people that have tried to make a model of getting paid have almost all failed because the universe of that isn't that big. Because on an emotional basis, they'll just say, fuck you, I'd rather go bankrupt. Or, in some cases, they use Jewish lightning, they burn their business down. That's happened to me 10 or 15 times in my career. No, 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 no. The, why would they do that? No, yeah, well, well you're unknown. Uh, now, when you're Sam Zell, yes. When you're, you know, you or virtually anybody in this room, probably other than me, what's the upside for them? There is no upside. It's better to go BK, BK, bankrupt. And there are benefits of going bankrupt. The bankruptcy laws are pretty liberal. Uh, and they vary from country to country. But I mean, and Rightly or wrongly, the bankruptcy laws are there to protect the you, not the creditors. Which I think is ass backwards, but anyway, that's just me. I mean, they're there to protect the kid that's gone bankrupt. And, uh, the, uh, and then in seven years, you can do it again. In most countries, the average is seven years, and then you clean the slate, and you can do it again. But the... Uh, Pardon? Yeah, and the, the, well, but I mean, if they have no alternative, normally if they're up against the wall, they have no money to pay you anyway. They have no money to pay you anyway. And the, um, and, and, and many people, businessmen, oh, well, fuck, I would rather t take the thing down the toilet. And it's hard. By that time, they've already drawn their letter of credit down, line on the line of credit. By that time, they've already uh, drained their working capital. By that time, they've already had second and third liens on, on the assets they have. And there's nothing to 
pay you for with the, I've been paid by rich guys that had an asset that, but I mean, they were rich. They weren't up against the wall like that. They, they there was a tax benefit or some kind of benefit where they, <clears throat> and they're not gonna do it for 15, 20, 50 grand, hundreds of thousands of dollars, <clears throat> in a couple of cases, millions of dollars, uh, but they had money. They weren't up against the wall. But the guys that you're hanging with have no fucking money. The guys you're chilling with, your mates, other than calling you on New Year's Eve to pay, bail them out of jail, you're not going to get those calls. And then again, you are who you hang around with. And, I, you know, if the, if the seminar does anything for anybody that's ever come to it, especially the hardcore, you are the average of the five dipshits that are your mates. And in some cases, unfortunately, it's some of your relatives, which are real dipshits. I mean, I'm not gonna do it, but just think of the five guys you spend most of your time with. It's embarrassing. It's, you know, it's embarrassing. The worse the worldwide economy gets, the better it is for us. The worse. The worse. And unfortunately, the more people that die, the better for us. It's a shitty thing to say. Correct. Now, when, whenever, I don't know who's gonna be, have the balls enough to pop the bubble, but when the deficit in America, somebody bellies up to the bar and wants to rectify that, I mean, it, you, know, you know that thing I have on my website where the guy's grabbing onto the toilet seat because he's drowning and he's going down, the, that's what it's gonna be like. Well, 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 if nobody decides to do it, ultimately, uh, then we're gonna have hyperinflation like they did in Germany and shit like that. I don't know if it's gonna be 50 years, 70 years. Someday. Someday, if you continue to print money endlessly, it becomes worthless. I mean, several economies over the centuries have proven that. The debt will be worth less. The, the debt, the, the payment you're making is with less dollars than you borrowed from. It's perfect for us. We don't give a fuck. That's a shitty thing to say, but hyperinflation's good. For the world, it's not. Well, right now, the U.S. government, through the Federal Reserve, controls interest rates indirectly or directly worldwide, because we're the basis. Not what I mean, the U.S. is the basis. And uh, I mean, but interest rates for us have to go up. And this model works at 15% interest rates, because I did it. But the deals have to be better. It means you pay less. But we're gonna pay back, for those of you that are young kids, 15, 20 years from now, you're gonna be paying back with 20 cent dollars or 15 cent dollars or 40 cent dollars. So we're really in a no-lose position. Now, I don't sell that because it's, it's you know, anti-American and shit like that, but if the whole system goes to shit, we're in like Flynn, literally. It's like uh, Mr. Nassar said, borrow and borrow big. The other side of it is, when you really get into the bank shorts, they don't foreclose on you. Trump's a classic example. It's only the little guy that, you know, they come and chase. The big guys, fuck you, I'm not paying. Fine, foreclose. Now, you, uh, I have trouble imagining that, but it's true. Borrow and borrow big. But that's not going to happen with uh, the low interest rates. But hyperinflation, well, Siemens and all the big wealthy families in Germany got richer after hyperinflation. They didn't get poor, they got richer. 
because they were too big. It's like the movie, Too Big to Fail. They were too big for the banks, Deutsche and those banks, to foreclose on. And they just borrowed more money. They just borrowed more money. And the, um, and again, it's a shitty, the little guy gets fucked. I see no, and I'm a pretty smart guy, and I know a lot of smart people. I see no scenario that has any reasonable possibility of happening where the little guy doesn't get fucked. Zero. And I see no scenario where the people that borrow big don't prosper. But you gotta stay away from foreclosures and stuff like that. But remember, in the lower quadrant that we're going for in healthcare, two and three and four times debt service cash flow covers it. The world has really got, I mean, a, a 40 unit healthcare deal has gotta go down to six or eight occupancies with 32 empty. And that could happen. But what are the odds of that happening? Not too great. Not too great. And uh, you know, and the uh, and again, because I, you know, when I've been at the, these prestigious universities, the kids, you know, and these are for the most part business schools. Uh, they don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, you know. But again, when I ask the kids, how many want your kids to be like you? Nobody raises their hand. How many kids do you want to be like a parent? Nobody would. I mean, they know the system's fucked. And the system is fucked. You know, if I went to Oxford or I went to Harvard and I had a legitimate degree that I sat in the room and I couldn't get a fucking job, I'd go blow the brains out of my fucking dean of the School of Business. I'd be in prison. Because if you can't get a job going to those schools, fuck. I mean, there's something not right. And the kids understand that. And that's why the risk, uh, wealth, risk, reward, not, that talk I used to give at the university, the kids understood it instantly. Why is the system so fucked, Mr. Pena? I said, why don't you ask your legislatures and, and government? The, 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 kid, the guys that are running for the government, I mean, are no different. They just want to get reelected. They don't want to make waves. It's the same in the Netherlands, Germany, nothing's changed, right? The U.S. They just want to get reelected, and it's been like that since, uh, you know, Second World War. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Thank God, because, you know, they're never going to do what it takes to fix the problem. But even if they fix the problem, it's good for us. Borrow and borrow big. I mean. Uh, there's a movie a special that was done here a couple of months ago about Donald Trump and how he buffaloed and bullied the big banks when they tried to take him down in 2004 and 5 because he was clearly bankrupt. And he said, no. You know, do you want one of the most iconic names in real estate development to go down the toilet? Which was Trump, the name, the brand. And the bank said, well, no. How much do you need? I said, I need... I, I need uh, I need four or five hundred thousand dollars a month personal expenses, and I blah, blah, blah. well, when you get big and you and you're living large, you'll see that four or five hundred thousand dollars a month is, is a lot of money. You can go through that like shit through a goose. The uh, and I know, fuck, what would I? Uh, you know, I can see spending fifty, eighty, hundred grand, but how can I spend five hundred thousand dollars? Fuck, you can. Trust me, you can. And then if you marry the right gal, or you're living with the right gal, she'll teach you. She'll help you learn how to spend, you know, 500,000 a month, easy. Sally could give a class, easy peasy. Now, I'm not being braggadocious, but Sally, uh, this was supposed to be my Valentine's gift, these graph uh, ruby and diamond cufflinks. And uh, I was gonna wear some other, I have plenty of diamond cufflinks. You're wearing red tonight, right? So she goes in the vault. Which I don't have the combination of. And she comes up with a little thing. She says, 
That's a little early, but this was for Valentine's. Oh, go save it. Don't give it to me now. No, no, but you're wearing red. I said, okay. Thank you, dear. No problem. You can, you can spend the money. Trust me. You can spend the fucking money. No, easy peasy. It's like the rolls she gave me with my name and all that bullshit. And I didn't want to go down to the fat. Fuck, I don't have time to go down to the fat. Plus, it was Corona Rona. But I went down. Now, I'm glad I went down. And I, I liked them when they were stamping the trillion dollar man in, in the little thing in the, in where you walk in. And the, when they're making the QLA headrest and shit like that. Yeah, I like that. And then we went to the Bentley with the, the Bentley. The, uh, but a plane's coming on the horizon. I know it is. I, uh, I, I can smell it in the air. Well, uh, at your age, Dan, I mean, I love you. You shouldn't have to stand in lines and shit like this. And it's, yes, sir. Thank you. Now, why? Yeah. why? Thank you. Thank you. Because the greatest, the greatest of all time, you haven't just done it for us. This is the A part for. You've been doing this for 27, 28 years. Correct. You're one of those few people who sacrificed their life for me. You've done it for fucking like 28 years. And like, I'm, I'm just so grateful that like I'm here. I want to take this opportunity. I want to tell you, I want to tell the world. I'm sitting on behalf of all 16 of us, right? But we, we truly, we, we travel from all over the world because we truly do believe you. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank it. Much. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I have respect for you because you're here because of the uh, lockdown and that kind of shit. You, you made sacrifice. And I know that. And a lot of people didn't. And the, um, but uh, it will pay back a thousand, thousand times. A thousand thousand times, and and, and the um, uh, and uh, the guys like Kleist Clownfed, uh, Kleist Clownfed uh, the uh, Marcus Bauer, and these guys, and we've got a lot of them that have made. And money's not everything; it happens to be the only thing anybody keeps track of. Uh, but I mean, we've created a lot of fucking money, but we've changed a lot of lives. And the you guys, you know, if you believe the pundits. Uh, uh, like Dan Locke and Brian Rose and and Bruce Whipple, uh, who are closer to humanity than I am, uh, that have changed uh, millions of lives. And and unfor unfortunately, the the main way to change lives is through money. Through money and what you do with it. And fortunately, I have a lot of mentees that have done a lot of super things with their money. I've got a few pricks that have stolen the money. They're not all Dutch. But uh, you know, uh, some of the leaders of the crooks are Dutch. But uh, the, um, for the most part, the kids have done a superb job in uh, sharing the wealth. And you know, I couldn't be happier. I couldn't be happier. And it's one of the reasons I'm happy to continue to do this. And I'm going to do it for a few more years. And uh, Corona has given me a second life, if you will, because I, I, I just could never quit uh, with uh, the opportunities that are around. I just couldn't, I'd be fucking, I'd, I'd, I'd regret and kick myself in the ass uh, a million times. And when I hear some of the guys that shared their stories today, uh, and like I was telling, you know, uh, when uh, the, the, the German nurse was up there, and uh, it was like, I heard Wagner, I'm telling you. I swear to you, on my, my children's lives, I, oh, I mean, I was just, I mean, I was in euphoria. Uh, because 
I mean, when, uh, you know, four or five or ten months ago, when he, before he ever heard of me, and now he's doing this, which is the antithesis of what he used to do. Uh, and I see other people do this. And, and when I see um, David belly up to the bar and uh, buy, going to buy a castle that's uh, be my neighbor, I mean, uh, I mean, it's, it's like I'm, I'm in the fucking twilight zone. And I, I, I can't begin to tell you how happy it makes me. Uh, and it's not that easy to make me happy, as Sally would tell you, and uh, the, your other guys in different degrees uh, uh, of, uh, of happiness, uh, and your happiness uh, and uh, creating a new life for yourself and a very different life than you've been used to is just, you know, it's euphoria to me. I mean, it just, it's just, it, it makes me feel good, and not that much makes me feel good at my age, but I mean, it's given me a second maybe a third life uh, and you know I'm here for a few more years but guys this is the 80s on steroids now most of you some of you weren't even born then and you certainly weren't in business then a couple of you were in business then uh, but not necessarily making gobs of money but I was making gobs of money uh, you know uh, ripping the belly out of the the world economy and uh, and I felt good about it, but I feel better about this, and because I know you guys are going to rip the belly out of the, you know, the, the new decade that we're just going into in a few days. And uh, the most important thing is stay focused, pull the trigger, and you want to be effective, not liked. You want to be effective, not liked. Now, uh, Mr. Wellington, are you going to say something? Okay, fine, I'm listening. Okay. Gents, Mr. Pena, uh, what a wonderful week. What, a, what an incredible week. And uh, perhaps what an incredible feat of achievement that we're actually here. Granted that uh, We've had uh, visits from the authorities trying to shut us, <laughs> shut us down, and uh, that wouldn't have been possible without uh, the the great efforts behind the scenes. And uh, you know who they are, and we know who they are. Um, but perhaps most most wonderful is that uh, is that uh, Winston uh, this week has not peed or pooed in the bed or in the house for seven days. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, it's, been a, it's just been a marvel. It's just been a marvel to see the, the, the different personalities from the sophistication of the bed, uh, the determination of the Germans, and, and and the calmness of Ebby over the last couple of days, as we can see. <laughs> <laughs> to be, but to be truthful, just to be truthful, it's been good to see him enjoy yeah. his nightly nap in front of the homework, a little nighty night for, for our friend. I, um, I can't imagine a more important person uh, at the moment in our lives than Dan. You know, can, can, you know I, I, I really can't. And, uh, I, I, and I also I can't find a more truthful person these days than Dan. And truth is a, a very strange and funny thing that, that I, I guess perhaps some of you know who Dr. Peterson is. He's very lucky to have survived a severe case of of addiction and um, uh, went through a rehab in Russia and is a, is a gem, an intellectual gem, particularly because this is an all-male group. Um, he's highlighted the, the lack of fatherhood and uh, we ask ourselves what does fatherhood mean to us as gents? And, um, and we also talk about and we also, we also note what does, does manhood mean? And we've been losing a battle for, for a long time. And it's been interesting, it's quite ironic that, we've, that 
Mr. Pena has had the courage to be able to 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 sometimes heavy words are required, violence is required, sometimes volume is required. And there's a kind of dark humour. I remember a, a Billy Connolly joke uh, from years ago. Some of you may know Billy Connolly, uh, a native of Scotland, a great comedian. And he says a story, and he's always, he has wonderful stories to tell. He's a really wonderful storyteller. And he, he says a story about a, a young, young boy who, who was unfortunately uh, in a wheelchair, and his father came up to, to Billy. Now, you can imagine Billy's famous, and doesn't want to talk to people too much outside of outside of uh, when he's doing his shows. And, and this old man comes up to him and says, it was on a pier, he's on a pier on the seaside, and he's just trying to get a bit of alone time. And he says, Mr. Connolly, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry, but my, and he says, yeah, no, no, it's all right, what's it? He says, oh, well, my, my son, my son's a big fan, my, my son's a big fan. He, he thinks you're great. He says, oh, okay, well, you know, uh, thanks, you know. And he says, oh, well, uh, oh, look, uh, would you mind, Mr. Connolly, look, my son's asking me, you know, he's, he's, he's not well, you know, he's not well. Uh, would you mind, uh, he's asked me, would you, would, you, would you mind telling him to fuck off? Yeah, no, no problem, no, I'll tell him to fuck off, you know. And, and and so he brings the boy up with the wheelchair, and so he comes up to Billy Connolly, and Billy Connolly says, "Yeah, all right, fuck off." And he and he and and, and the kids are, "Oh yeah, it's great." And it's interesting being insulted by Dan, and and it's in and we and and it's put a little bit of meaning to to those 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 we understand what we understand what he means. You know the words. If we were all at war, we'd be dead, right? And and we are all right. And so, but we understand that. And and it's it's part of a wisdom. It's a part of an old wisdom. It's a part of a, a code. It's not PC, and it's it's not accepted over the last fifty odd years. And so. Um, You know, when I when I look at the that when I look at Dan, Dan's seventy five, uh, COVID uh, is is uh, is not is not uh, is not off our minds, and um, but Dan's life has been instructive. And he's taught us how to grow with honor and bravery and tenacity. Um, here we, we, we find ourselves standing on a land which is owned by a, a clan, which is fittingly, uh, its motto is, is Sto Pro Verite, which translates to I stand for truth. Correct. And um, it's quite touching because the, to come to the hardcore assumes that we'll all be very successful. You, 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 it's very difficult not to be successful now. You can't. You can run, but you can't hide. But what I would I would say what is so important and a part of the QLA method and a part of the QLA uh, lifestyle and access is is that there's an element of wisdom uh, that that we have amongst us. If we're at war. Yes, perhaps we'd be all dead, granted our previous actions. But if we are at war, we should, we should be so lucky to have a captain, a skipper, a sergeant major like Dan. We're in the right. We are so bloody lucky. Thank you. And so, um, <clears throat> so, um, so, um, so granted there'll be obstacles that, that, that we should, we, we, we shall meet with, with courage. That I would like to wish Dan many more years of lusty health. And may the strength of an ox and the tongue of the gods protect him and, and his family. And that many more years of QLA mentorship. And may, may he reign 
as the best in the world. And I'm gr granted, we all have our goals. But I, I, I do look forward to, to seeing Mr. Pena being appointed as the second American Prime Minister of the UK. Yeah. On Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You better watch out for your father here. <laughs> well, we have an extremely high uh, success rate out of the hardcore. That's not how we sell it, but the uh, um, we just do. We have a lot of guys. Um, this time, uh, rightly or wrongly, we don't have any gals here, but um, the, um, the we just do. And as um, uh, as has already been mentioned, I mean, <clears throat> normally the connection with one or two or three of the other participants is what's uh, needed, not often, but many times, to flip um, or drop the shoe or whatever the, the right terminology is. And the, uh, but that's not what the hardcore was initiated for. I didn't think that it would have that kind of uh, uh, COVID uh, infection, uh, but I mean it has, and you know we've had. I think this is the seventh, sixth or seventh hardcore, the first Corona hardcore, and the guys and gals have been fucking phenomenally successful. The, uh, the Marcus Bauer was successful before the fucking hardcore, but after the uh, last hardcore, I mean, he just he went bananas. I think he went bananas because uh, people were catching him. Now I don't know that for a fact. But knowing the competitiveness of uh, Marcus, he saw that people were catching up, and he wasn't, you know, leaving people in the dust anymore. It doesn't. I don't give a fuck why the shoe drops or what, what clicks. It really doesn't. I just am, am um, wanting, desiring the uh, that something clicks. And we designed it different for this hardcore. This hardcore is not like the last hardcore. Uh, we don't normally show Klaus. We don't normally show um, uh, Marcus. We normally show Marcus to the regular seminar for inspiration. But since we had uh, several uh, Germanic people here, uh, and the um, and two of my superstars have been, it's not like I make this shit up like the people on YouTube think. I didn't hire Klaus Kleinfeld. I didn't hire Marcus Bauer. I didn't hire, uh, uh, you know, uh, Andreas, I, I, you know, it was, I could hire better looking guys than those guys. Uh, the, um, but they, they come true, they come through. And so far, they're, they, you know, they're still, um, I don't want to use the word beholding to me, but they're still gratified and they want to help me. Uh, and I, I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, the, uh, and as uh, we'll, we'll see, you know, I, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, when you guys uh, become successful, that you don't disappear into the fucking sunset. You know, the, uh, uh, I understand if you're gonna go rob ING Bank, you'll disappear in the sunset. I understand if you're gonna go rob Deutsche Bank, you'll disappear in the sunset because Interpol will be waiting for you here. But I mean, but other than that, um, you know, uh, I enjoy seeing you guys and Sally enjoys seeing you and the, uh, and I, you heard uh, Sally talk very favorably about Marcus, Bavarian and Bob uh, and Klaus. Uh, because we, you know we've known these kids a long time, and we've seen them grow and uh, mature and uh, make a lot of fucking money. Again, money's not everything. I understand that, but it's the only thing anybody keeps track of. And you guys, when you make a lot of fucking money, you go out and let you save the world, you know. And so vicariously, I live, even though I, I don't give a shit about that. Uh, one, I don't believe in global warming and all that stuff, you, you already realize, but you go and save the world, and you know, I'll, I'll get indirectly credit, probably that I'm not due, uh, but 
guys, I'm proud of you. And I know more than anything, I know what you're capable of. I've seen it with my own eyes. The, the, the mouse from Hungary, you know. If some of these guys that you, you've seen in the regular seminar and you've heard about, I mean, they're just regular guys. And even though I don't think 50, 80, 150 million dollars or euros isn't any money, uh, for most people it is. For, I hope it's not for you, but for most people it is. And you know, the uh, you put a multiple on these um, EBITDA numbers and you know, we have tons and tons of people that are making shitloads of money. And more importantly, the shitloads of money they're making, they're changing their lives. And to the extent that you care about your families, I would not care about your extended families. That's a personal uh, preference on my, but to the extent that you care about your kids and your, your, your wife and maybe your mom or something like that, there's no better formula. You don't need any fucking money. I don't know any game in town that you don't need, other than being a hooker. But I mean, you, you don't need any money and you need no product knowledge. And even though some of you still don't believe that you don't need any product knowledge. I mean, the webinars that you're having access to starting, I think, tomorrow, you're going to see, they don't know, LOI, they call it LOA. Uh, Josh Kim calls it uh, uh, after-tax profits when it's cash flow. Nobody knows what the fuck they're talking about, but they're still rich. And it's because the, um, they have not got caught up in the details. The kids that success comes more slowly, or God forbid, not at all, it's because they get caught up in the details and they overanalyze it and they spreadsheet it to fucking death. And the, uh, when uh, Wellington was talking about uh, Winston, and, I'm thinking, and then he said, didn't poo, I mean, I almost pissed myself. Uh, because, and he didn't, and I mean, Sally is happy as fucking Larry uh, because uh, the, uh, uh, he's gotten through it. I don't know how long they it took you uh, to potty train you out in the bush, but I mean, the uh, 10 days is pretty fucking fast, and I doubt if you got potty trained that quickly. The, uh, uh, but guys, I, I really appreciate it, and uh, thank you very much.